Chapter 1 His phone rang as he pulled up to the parking lot on his motorcycle. Drew Colburn Ramsley grabbed it and answered the call. Harley here. They're moving up the demolition, Miguel said. They're worried about protesters wanting to put it on some historical list or something, so they're trying to get it demolished before the protesters get organized and it becomes a media circus. I thought you should know. You're kidding. When? Drew kept his voice low. He didn't need anyone overhearing him, especially right now. Everything is all in place. They're coming to the party. The party is being cancelled. Two days from now, Party Central is going to be rubble. Miguel, this is not good. Drew scanned the parking lot. There was a truck there that he was unfamiliar with. It had a logo for the demolition company. Not good at all. You need to get the boss to get on this. The drugs, the players, they're all there or nearby. You don't hit them now. It's all going to be in the wind. We won't get this opportunity back. The boss feels there is enough time to do it right. Too risky, Miguel responded. He sighed. You should pull back a little. Pull back, Drew snorted. This is past my neck. Get the boss and tell him to get on this. Right now. I've got an uninvited guest to deal with. Who? Miguel asked, a little alarmed. Someone from the demo crew is here, Drew explained curtly. I'm hoping he hasn't stumbled onto anything important and I can get him out without any issues. Good luck, brother. Miguel didn't sound too confident. Call me if you need some backup. Get the boss on it, Drew replied. I'll try to convince him. They both knew it was a long shot. Drew ended the call and put the phone back in his pocket. He pulled on a hidden compartment in the Harley he was riding and retrieved his Glock. Putting the trusted gun in the back of his waistband, Drew replaced the compartment cover and casually walked over to the building. This was probably not going to go well. If he was lucky, the guy was already dead, or hadn't been in the building long enough to stumble on anyone and Drew would be able to get him out. If Drew was really unlucky, the guy was alive and had been found by members of this criminal gang. Then Drew would probably be witness to a murder. That was something his conscience wouldn't live with very well. The lock had been cut on the door. Drew pulled it open and went in. He listened and looked around each corner as he slowly approached the loading dock area of the condemned building. Luck was not with him. There was a man talking to three members of the gang, Red, Knuckles, and Sam. Look, guys, the city just sent me to make sure the building is clear. I don't want any trouble. Tomorrow, all the big equipment will be coming in, we'll be blocking off the street, and then early next morning we set the explosives and the whole thing comes down. You guys need to move out. He had obviously seen the bricks of heroin sitting on the pallets. Drew would give the guy guts for trying to talk his way out of a no-win situation. Sam spotted Drew. Hey, you should get a load of this guy, Harley. Drew walked up casually to the group. Who is this? I thought there were no other players in this operation. The demolition guy looked at him, and Drew nearly broke stride in surprise. Max Ramsley. He couldn't believe it. Max Ramsley had stumbled on this drug operation. What were the odds? You ever seen this guy before? Knuckles asked, motioning to Max. Sure, Drew said grimly. Every morning in the mirror except he ain't got the scar in the tats. Max and Drew looked startlingly alike. Drew's hair was shorter. He weighed maybe twenty pounds less, had black tattoos running up his arms and a scar through his eyebrow. Otherwise, they could be twins. I've always heard everyone has a doppelganger, but I'd never thought I'd meet mine. Max stared in fascination. We gotta get rid of him, Red commented. Whoa! Max threw up his hands in surrender. I'm just doing my job. I got a wife and kids at home. I would like to go back to them tonight. Shame we're going to have to make her a widow. Drew pulled out his gun. He decided to take the initiative before one of the others did. Maybe there was a way he could salvage this situation and get Max out alive. Turn around. Please don't do this. The charm was gone, replaced by fear. Turn around, nice and slow, Drew repeated. Sam, I'm going to need your car. Why? Sam was surprised by the request. 
Drew pressed the Glock into the base of Max's head. He laid a hand on his shoulder firmly. He hoped the guy wouldn't try to be heroic. Drew really didn't want to have to hurt him. We can't leave him out back to be found, and it's not like I'm going to put his body on the Harley and drive it all around town. Sam grimaced. You know blood's hard to get out of the carpet in the trunk. I'll use a tarp. I think there was even one outside, Drew improvised. I got a better idea. He must have come in a car or something. Why not use his? Sam asked. You got keys, demo dude? Max answered cautiously. I have keys. There's a truck outside. Really, though, I can pretend that I didn't see anything. You guys move everything out by end of day to day, and we can say this whole meeting never happened. We'll use your truck, Drew said. Start walking. You need any help with him? Knuckles asked. Nah, I got this. Drew pushed the gun hard into Max's shoulder, making him stumble forward. I think I'll join you. You're going to need help putting him in that truck, Red invited himself. Drew wished he wouldn't come, but it wasn't like he could refuse Red's help without making it look suspicious. Keep walking. Drew kept up the pressure on Max. Look, there's no reason for anyone to go to prison over this. You really don't want to be up on murder charges, do you? Max asked, rattled. Been to prison? Not a big deal, Drew replied. He kept his voice casual and calm. Drew hoped it would keep Max calm as well. He hoped Max wouldn't try to fight or run. If he did, then Drew would have no choice but to shoot him. He would try to make sure it wasn't a lethal shot, but at this close of range, if he missed, Drew would look stupid to Red. Drew needed to maintain his cover. Open the door. Max slowly complied, trying to buy time. We look so much alike. Funny, right? I mean, I could be your cousin or something. You wouldn't want to kill your cousin now, would you? Fine by me. Drew poked him again. Keep walking. They're in the side parking lot. There was a grassy area that was tucked behind the buildings. Hopefully no one would see them as they walked towards it. Have you heard of Ramsley Pharmaceuticals or Ramsley Insurance? Big business. My family owns them. They are rich. You could ransom me, Max threw out the idea. I would be worth a lot of money. We're in the drug business, Drew said dryly. What's sitting in the basement of this building is worth more than you. Look, I have my cell in my pocket. I'd like to record a last message from my wife and sons, Max pleaded. I promise I'm not trying anything. I just want to let them know how much I love them. As if I believe you wouldn't try something. Please, don't try anything, Drew thought a little desperately. Please, I'd just like to leave a message for my wife, Max persisted. He was starting to panic a little at the thought he might not make it out of this alive. Surely you can understand that. Just shut up, Drew hissed. They were at the grass. There was a puddle and a muddy area. It would have to do. He looked back to see Red standing near the building, having a smoke. He stepped in close to Max and could feel the man's muscles tighten. Don't do anything stupid if you want to stay alive. Max stilled, listening intently. I'm going to shoot the gun. You stiffen, you fall down in the mud. Roll over once so that you're wet on both sides. Hopefully, you'll be so dirty, Red will never know there's no blood or bullet hole. You don't move, you don't twitch, you don't so much as breathe when we roll you up in that tarp over there. Stay relaxed, not stiff. You go stiff, you give the game away. After we load you in the truck, Red goes to help the boys pack up. If not, I'll try to convince him of a decent place to dump you where you won't die. After that, you're on your own. Why are you doing this? Max whispered. Not that I'm not grateful. Just do him already! Red shouted from beside the building as he started to walk their way. I'm giving him his last rites! Drew yelled back. My ma raised me Catholic. They could hear Red curse, and suddenly there was a gunshot. Max stiffened in surprised terror, but didn't feel any pain. Fall, you idiot! Drew hissed in desperation. Max fell face forward into the mud. He rolled over onto his back. He jumped in surprise as another gunshot went off, but played dead, not even opening an eye. His very life depended on it. Why'd you have to put him in the mud like that? I'm gonna get all dirty. You could have done him on the pavement. 
Red said in disgust as he walked up. And have blood for the cops to go find when the wife calls that he's missing? Drew snorted. Get the tarp already. They rolled Max up in the tarp, tying it with some bungee cords that they found in the truck. Red took the legs, and Drew grunted as they heaved Max into the back. I'm going to help the guys pack up. Looks like we got to move fast, Red observed. Any idea where to? Drew asked. Red shook his head. Sam will figure it out. I'm going to dump him and burn the truck, Drew said, flipping the keys. He watched Red head for the building, then quickly started the truck driving out of the parking lot. Drew grabbed his cell phone and called Miguel. Hello, brother, Miguel said as he picked up the call. Three of them are packing up the goods right now. Sam, Red, and Knuckles. I don't know if the rest are going to come early and help or if that's all we can get. Drew turned a corner and tried not to speed too much. He didn't need to get pulled over with a body all wrapped up in the back of his truck. The boss needs to move on this. Where are you? Miguel asked. I'm coming to the station. I figured if you can't convince him, then I'm going to have to come in and talk to him, Drew explained. I saw at least twelve pallets in there. We've got to get that off the street. Anybody sees you come in and your cover is blown, Harley, Miguel used his undercover name. When Max Ramsley doesn't show up dead, my cover will be blown anyways, Drew said as he pulled him around a little old lady doing two miles an hour. Who? The demolition guy that crashed the party. Drew finally came into the parking lot. Come outside. I brought a present. He found a spot and turned off the truck. It was a nice truck, but not new or too fancy. He wondered why Maxwell Ramsley was working for a demolition company and not in the family business. Drew got out, slammed the door shut, and waited for Miguel to come out. It took a few moments for Miguel to find him. Boss is not going to be happy. I'm not happy. Drew popped the tailgate open and began to undo the bungee cords. Did you just bring us a dead body? Miguel demanded. Nope, he's alive. He's the demolition guy I was talking about, Drew explained. Sure enough, once the cords were loosened, Max helped them to remove the tarp and sat on the tailgate of the truck. Max took a look at the sunny sky, breathed a deep breath, and smiled. It feels good to be alive. Miguel looked at the muddy Max and then Drew. You got a brother you didn't tell me about? Drew looked grimly at Max. I got three. You're kidding. Miguel did a double take, looking at Max again. Drew motioned to Max. Nope. Jana never said anything. Miguel looked at Max. Yeah, well, I might not have told her. Drew walked away, heading for the police station entry. Hey, would you like to explain that? You're a cop, aren't you? Undercover? Max followed like an eager puppy. Man, I would like to thank you for saving my life. You're welcome, Drew said tersely, wishing he would just go away. I just lost a serious bust because of you. What do you mean you never told Jana? Miguel asked as he followed. She is going to be really angry. Could you imagine telling her that our father couldn't be bothered to marry our wacko mother because he had a legitimate family, a wife and three kids? Drew laughed without any humor. You tell her. Whoa, not me. Miguel held out his hands in surrender. He knew just how well Jana enjoyed surprises, which meant she didn't enjoy them at all. What are you guys talking about? Max questioned as he matched their strides. Your dad was married already? I don't understand what this has to do with anything. Are you going to go after those guys at the building? Drew stopped and put a hand on Max's shoulder. You should go home, rich boy. Hug that wife of yours and your kids. Let us handle this. Miguel looked at both of them with some fascination. They looked so much alike. He doesn't know. How can he not know? Know what? Max asked, looking from one man to the next. Drew blew out a frustrated breath. Miguel, if you leave it alone, maybe it will go away. Look at you two, Miguel motioned at them. I don't think this is going anywhere. Besides, you should probably take his statement. He is a witness. What? Max insisted. He didn't like that they kept talking in circles around him. What are you talking about? What's not going anywhere? Dude, he's your brother from another mother, Miguel enlightened Max. Max looked at Drew in surprise. No. 
Drew shook his head in disgust. David Michael Ramsley, father of the year. No, Max repeated. He didn't. He did. Congratulations, Maxwell. You've got two half-brothers and a half-sister. Drew turned his back on him and marched into the police station. Max looked on in some confusion. The girl put out a hand. I guess that makes me your half-brother-in-law. Welcome to the family. Serious? Max automatically shook Miguel's hand. I mean, we look a lot alike, but I'm not sure my dad. That would mean he had an affair. I hate to be the one to break it to you, Miguel said. That's exactly what your old man did. Max shook his head and looked at Miguel in amazement. Wow. Yeah, wow. Miguel repeated with some amusement. We should go inside. Sure. Max let Miguel lead him into the station. You're married to... Jana. We've got three kids, Miguel said proudly. She's on maternity leave right now, but she's a cop as well. Really? Max looked at Miguel in surprise. Three cops in the family. That's cool. You got kids? Miguel asked. Yeah, two boys, Max grinned. Morgan and Ryder. I've got two brothers, Noah and Michael. I guess that means you've got two more brothers-in-law and more nieces and nephews since they both have kids. Family just doubled, Miguel said with interest. It did not just double because they are not family, Drew waited impatiently for them. And because the old man decided to have an affair on your mom doesn't make us family. Don't mind him, Miguel said. He's got issues. I've noticed, Max agreed readily. Colburn, a voice said sharply as a man walked by. In my office. Great, Drew muttered. He gave Max a sharp look. You're one of my issues, so you get to come and meet the boss. Okay. Max was cool with that. He really wanted to know more about his brother and what Drew did. Max followed Drew into the office. Meet Captain Oswald Green, otherwise known as the boss, Drew said. Boss, this is Maxwell Ramsley, the guy who caked my cover. Sit down, Green scowled at them and pointed to the chair as across from his desk. Miguel comes to me with some story about a demo guy walking in on your territory and that you want to move on the building right away. It's probably too late to move now, Drew sighed as he took a seat. Everyone will be leaving. You might be able to catch the boys in the act, but there's only three at the building right now. Sam, Knuckles, and Red are there. The other players aren't. Do you think they'll let you know when they're going to ship the stuff? Green asked. Drew snorted. I'm not that big of a fish. I asked. Red told me Sam would figure it out. It means that no one knows yet. Besides, my cover is going to be blown by tomorrow or the next day at the latest. How do you figure? Green popped a piece of chewing gum. He was trying to kick the smoking habit. The whole thing made him irritable, which meant he was harder than usual on the team. He didn't like it when things didn't go to plan, so he glared at Drew now. Drew jerked a finger at Max. When he doesn't show up missing or dead... The guys are going to wonder why. I take your twin here is the demo guy. Green frowned even more if that were possible. That's me, Max smiled unrepentantly. Very glad to be alive. If it weren't for... I'm sorry I didn't quite catch your name in all the excitement. Andrew Colburn. Call me Drew. He left off the Ramsley that was attached to the back of his name. Drew didn't like using it. Other than DNA, he wasn't attached to the Ramsleys at all. Right, Max continued. If it wasn't for Drew, I would be dead today. I owe him my life. That's nice, Green said dryly. So what are we going to do about this? I can't launch an operation on this group on this short amount of time. I need details. That means I need you back under cover, Colburn. I know it, but one of them is going to look up Max and wonder why there's no outcry when I supposedly dumped his body. Drew sighed in frustration. They'll get suspicious. Red doesn't particularly like me as it is. Millions of people go missing every day, and only a percentage of them hits the news, Green shrugged. Who cares if he goes missing? The entire media circus? Drew enlightened his boss. He's a Ramsley? Think money, power, and fame. We're not quite that bad, Max tried to downplay it. You guys make the tabloids on a regular basis, Drew said in disgust. He knew it because every time they did, people mistook Drew for Max and asked him all sorts of annoying questions. 
not always in the most flattering light. Max sighed. Sometimes things get blown out of proportion. Green nodded, thinking of the big picture. What if he were to go missing? What if they found his body in a few days? Excuse me? Max looked at the two of them in surprise. What are we talking about? I can get the press involved, put out a missing persons alert, keep him in custody, and release a few details to stir the pot and keep your cover intact, Green said shrewdly. If you contact the Barracuda, she'd love it. Drew raised an eyebrow as he mentioned a notorious tabloid writer by her nickname. She covers the Ramsleys all the time. You would have to give her an exclusive afterward. Green shuddered. If I have to. I'd rather not be in the press, Max interrupted the two men. They don't have a habit of always telling the truth. Look, Mr. Ramsley, Green gave Max his full attention. You would be doing us a great service if you would cooperate with us in this investigation. I'd like to leak it to the press that you are a missing person. We'll have to get your wife to file a report. We'll have a press conference, find the truck abandoned, whatever. In the meanwhile, you'll remain out of sight until we can wrap up our operation on this group of criminals. It shouldn't take long. How long? Max wondered. Maybe a week or two, Green said. Drew privately wondered exactly how long it might be. Green's estimate was optimistic. Until we can arrest the leaders of this crew and find out more about who is supplying the heroin. You would have no contact with anyone. Be like a mini vacation away from work, family, friends. Green shrugged. You'd sit around and watch television all day. Or read. Whichever you fancy. What about my wife? Max frowned. What about her? Green asked. Most people like a vacation from the missus. She would know where I am, right? Max looked a little concerned. She needs to know the whole deal, and I'd have to be able to phone her each day. Generally, that wouldn't happen, Green responded. We need her reaction to be genuine. Then I can't do it. Max shook his head and folded his arms stubbornly. I'm already on two strikes with her for admitting things when I first met her. I promised to tell her the truth up front, and I am not going to break that promise. I won't lose her. Great. He was ruled by the wife, Drew thought darkly. Is she any good at lying? Can she act? Green asked. Otherwise, we'll just have to say she's too upset to go in front of the press. You have any other relatives who might be able to read a statement to the press? I have two brothers and their families. Max frowned. I suppose you wouldn't let them know about it. Nope, Green said firmly. If we let your wife in on it, that will be enough. If you have any kids, they can't know that you're not missing. I'd hate for this entire operation to go bust just because Timmy lets something slip at daycare. Fine. Only Paget will know, Max responded. He didn't like keeping his family in the dark about this, but he also wanted these guys caught. It wouldn't be right to just let these men walk free when they could be behind bars if Max cooperated with the police. How do we do this? Is there anything that I can do that will help the investigation? Stay out of the way, stay bored, and keep your wife from spilling the beans, Drew stated dryly. He nodded to Green while pointing a finger at Max. Where are you going to house our co-conspirator? I figure he can board with you, Green smiled a little maliciously. It looks like you, and if any of your neighbors see him, they'll just think it is you. Drew wasn't amused. He really wished the commanding officer would go back to smoking. He was a lot easier to deal with and didn't come up with ideas like making Max Drew's new roommate. And when I'm gone and working, who looks after him? I'll put the rookie on babysitting duty. Green leaned back. It'll help polish his skills. Drew sighed. Great. It's just for a few days, Green assured them both. There was no real way to tell just exactly how long this would really be for, but he wasn't about to let Max know that now he had the man's cooperation. Colburn, you'd better get back out there and find out where those drugs are going and who the supplier is. Once we know what the next drop is, we can move. Yes, sir. Drew got up and would have left except the boss stopped him. He'll need a key to your apartment, Green said. Miguel has one, Drew responded before he left. He would have to get a cab to go back to the building to see if Red and the gang had gotten everything cleaned up. If they had, Drew hoped that they would contact him. As a newer member of their gang, he had no way of getting hold of them. It was a simple security measure they used. It was also effective. 
If they dropped him now, Drew would have no means of contacting them or finding out what they were up to. Drew grabbed a tarp out of the supply closet to throw over Max's truck. He didn't want anyone to see it sitting in the police lot. He would drive in further to the impound area, cover it, and give Miguel the keys before going back to the abandoned building. Drew sure hoped Max and his wife would make this work. If she wasn't convincing, if something slipped out and everyone learned that Max Ramsley was alive, it was Drew's life on the line. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this chapter, please look for the next chapter of Love and Lies. Also, please subscribe to the channel to enjoy other audiobooks, helpful videos, and insights into writing. This is free for you and would really help me grow my audience with the algorithms. Thank you. Chapter 2 How have you been feeling? Bethany tossed the question over in her mind before replying. She gave an involuntary shiver. Confused. Why is that? She struggled to explain. Things have been more in focus, more intense. It has been difficult to deal with all these new feelings that I have not experienced before. Bethany? But Dr. Holly Urshman looked at her in sympathy. We can assume that before the trauma you experienced as a child, that you had these emotions before. They were just dimmed from the regime of medication you were on. Now that we are focusing your medications on strengthening your memory, your emotions will return to what is normal. Shall we discuss some coping strategies? Please, nodded Bethany. She realized she was pulling on her purse strap, fraying the leather. This was another habit Bethany picked up since changing her doctor and her medications. Fidgeting was new. Bethany was not sure she was comfortable with the new her, especially since the new her was destroying a Gucci bag. Sometimes it was overwhelming. All these emotions and reactions that she could not recall ever having experienced before. There were times when she wished for the numbness induced by her previous psychiatrist. However, Bethany wanted answers more. How have the nightmares been? inquired Holly. Frustrating, sighed Bethany. They are always the same. I cannot seem to see any further to remember what happened. Let's go over it again. Holly jotted something down on her notepad. Bethany took a deep breath. I am in a tiny bathroom. It is old because everything is almond-colored. The tiny tub, the toilet. There is water in the tub. He has his big hand on my face, and he, he keeps pushing me under the water. Holly waited patiently as Bethany trembled at the memory of her nightmare. He keeps saying that I never saw anything, heard anything, that I was never there. I am choking on the water, and I cannot get away because he's so much bigger than me. Bethany frowned angrily. I know who it is. I know his voice. It is so familiar. I just cannot place it. Anything else? No. She shook her head regretfully. I just wake up choking each time. Holly assessed Bethany with a look. Have you thought more about our discussion of trying to trigger the memory? Bethany clenched her hands so hard her manicured nails were biting into her skin. She gave a sharp nod. I'm going to do it. Are you certain? gently asked Holly. Yes, I need to know, Bethany said stoutly. She ignored the frisson of terror that danced down her spine. Then I will set it up, Holly smiled. I'm glad you are going to take this route in your treatment. Sometimes it is important to confront our fears. Bethany nodded with some trepidation. They discussed a few minor details, then the time was up for the session. Holly scheduled Bethany in again for her normal time and promised to get in contact with her when she'd get a slot in at the local pool. Bethany agreed even as her stomach rebelled against the idea. She debated purchasing a new purse but decided against it. There was no point in destroying another handbag. Maybe, if she could manage to get her emotions under control, to find out the mystery of her past, she would be able to stop fidgeting. Bethany certainly hoped so. Since there was some time to spend, Bethany chose to walk to the downtown dance studio where she volunteered to teach inner-city kids ballet. She enjoyed the discipline and exercise ballet gave her. For a long time, that was all she enjoyed out of it. Now, Bethany was starting to love dance as an art form. That was a new development since she had changed psychiatrists and medications. Bethany wondered if she might be able to go professional if she had changed things when she was very young. Her teachers had always said she had a natural talent, but was far too prone to keep everything very technical. 
Bethany could give a flawless performance, but there was no warmth to it, no emotion, nothing that engaged the audience. She had been passed over multiple times for that particular flaw. This was something that also haunted her musical career. The orchestra depended on her for her accuracy, but it was true she gave no emotion, no art to the performance. Her notes were played flawlessly with the violin, but there was always something missing. The orchestra paid a pittance per year to employ her talent. Now that she was finally experiencing emotions, they felt overexposed, raw and aching. Her music had become a refuge and painful at the same time. Bethany could now put art into the music, but sometimes it carried her away and she had a hard time continuing. If this kept up and she could not get her emotions under control, Bethany might lose her place in the orchestra. Thankfully, she could live off the income her father gave her. Otherwise, her condo, spending money, medical treatments, and lifestyle would be all impossible. She still wanted to keep her job. It gave meaning to her life being able to share her talent and help others enjoy music. Reaching the studio, she let herself in and watched a small class doing a modern dance routine. Sometimes, Bethany wondered if she should mix modern dance into the ballet that she taught her students. But Bethany had been classically trained. She did not know how to dance in the modern style. Jazz, hip-hop, and whatever the latest trends were beyond her, she would stick to her ballet. None of her students would ever become professional dancers. These were inner-city kids who did not have enough money nor opportunity to seriously learn the dance. The majority would not even make it to Bethany's en point class. The girls' families simply could not afford the shoes, and most would not take the charity of Bethany providing the footwear for their child. Still, she enjoyed teaching the classes. Bethany hoped that it added structure and self-confidence to the girls, two qualities that they desperately needed in life. Confidence was something she had always struggled with for herself. Bethany knew that she was considered beautiful. She had a long, lean dancer's body with blonde hair and blue eyes. Far from it being a boon, she found it to be an irritant at times. Women did not tend to want to be her friend. Men wanted far too much of her. Until they found out that she was different. She'd always been different. Bethany could not remember her childhood. Something as simple as remembering a birthday gift before the age of ten was beyond her. She had night terrors as a child. They were so bad that her parents had her start a regime of antidepressants, sedatives, and therapy. As a result, Bethany had always felt zoned out. She had a difficulty in formulating lasting relationships. She had not felt the same range of emotions as other people did. Thus, Bethany had never really known hate or love. Life was bland. She allowed her parents far too much influence in her life. That was why Bethany had finally decided to leave her former psychiatrist and try something new. She went to Dr. Ershman and had immediately liked her. It was sad when her psychiatrist was the closest thing to a friend that she had. Bethany wanted to understand why she was having the nightmares, always the same one. She wanted to understand why her parents thought she was mentally fragile, why they were so reluctant to start therapy with a new doctor. Ted and Constance Searson had voiced their concerns constantly over her mental health all her life. Bethany was tired of it. She wanted to be normal. At Dr. Ershman's suggestion, they were going to confront her biggest fear and try to push her mind to remember why she was so afraid of water. Dr. Ershman thought she was strong enough, capable of steering her own destiny. The thought gave her courage. Bethany smiled as she went through the practice routines with her pupils. They were her joy. Funny, smart, enthusiastic, and talented, each in their own way. They're happy and normal kids, enjoying a couple hours away from the world. She was pleased that she got to share that experience with them twice a week. Finally, class was over, and Bethany sent all of them on their way. She had a small dinner, changed, and went to the practice at the orchestra hall with her co-workers. Bethany played the violin. She could also play other instruments, but this was her professional position with the orchestra. Bethany. Reginald Wells gave her a smile. How are you today? Fine, thank you, replied Bethany. Good manners had her asking, and you, Reggie? Very well. He smiled a little wider, revealing his wisdom teeth. Reggie was able to display all his teeth when he pulled his lips back far enough. It was a little disconcerting. Perhaps if he gained some weight, he would not be able to give such skeletal grins. It was almost as disconcerting as all the attention he was paying her lately. Bethany managed a polite smile in return and fiddled with her sheet music. 
Hopefully, he would see that she was busy and leave her alone. I heard that John Hopper has the flu, Reggie leaned over, whispering. His bow nearly poked Bethany in the face. That means that Solo might be available for Thursday's performance. That is too bad about John, Bethany murmured. Seemed like the polite thing to say. Are you thinking about applying? asked Reggie. Bethany looked at him in surprise. For the solo? You're talented enough, Reggie complimented her. You would look lovely up there in front of the audience. I'm sure you would be chosen if you would apply. That is nice of you to say, responded Bethany. I had not thought about it. Are you going to apply? Oh, me? Reggie flushed with delight that she would even think that he should. I'm not as beautiful as you. I wouldn't look as nice up front. Bethany was not sure what she should say to that. She hoped John would get well very soon, so it would not even be an issue. Say, Bethany, Reggie leaned a little closer, what are you doing this Friday? We could have dinner. Bethany tried not to lean further away from him. If she did, she might fall off her chair. Reggie had no idea of personal space. I'm sorry, Reggie, I've made plans. Really? What about Saturday? He was persistent, as always. Bethany took a deep breath as she remembered what she and Dr. Ershman had talked about. She needed to set boundaries in her life, for her parents and for Reggie. Reggie, you and I are good friends. Sure, Reggie grinned his toothy smile. Bethany nodded. I would not want to jeopardize that friendship by becoming further involved. Reggie frowned and smiled as a thought occurred to him. He adjusted his glasses. I have always thought that friendship was a firm foundation for the beginning of a relationship. That did make sense. However, Bethany did not want to build a relationship with him. Reggie was not the sort of man she longed for. Bethany did not know if she would ever meet the sort of man that she hoped to spend her life with, but it certainly was not this odd fellow beside her. The conductor entered the room, and the entire orchestra stood up in deference to him. Reggie leaned over again. What do you say about Saturday? And he looked down at Reggie. He stood a full five inches shorter than her. I'm very sorry, Reggie. I have neglected to mention that I'm seeing someone. Really? Reggie looked at her with disappointment. Who? You don't know him, Bethany said a little desperately as they took their seats again. She was a poor liar. Oh, please, not like that Ramsley guy, groused Reggie, asking you to marry him, then dumping you for another woman just like that. Noah was in love with Elle, responded Bethany. I was pleased they were able to be together. She had been happy for the couple. They were wonderful together and had a love that she envied. Bethany wanted someone to love her the way that Noah loved his wife. It was deplorable, insisted Reggie. You are beautiful, talented, amazing. How anyone could let you go is beyond me. If I had you, I would treat you like a queen. It would be so convenient if only Reggie was someone she could like in return. Bethany bemoaned the fact that he was just not attractive, had annoying habits like neglecting to respect personal space boundaries, and was a cloying little man. Thank you, politely said Bethany. This was her problem. She read far too many romance books and wanted someone to walk off a cover to love her. Real life simply did not work that way. Who is he? Reggie asked, leaning in, almost taking out her eye with his bow. His violin wavered alarmingly off balance on his knee. Bethany tried not to jerk away, but carefully removed the bow back with a hand. Her mind drew a blank. Just someone I recently met. Then it's not a serious relationship. Reggie sighed in relief. What is he like? Do I know him? He is different. I like him very much. Bethany tried to think. You would not know him as he does not run in our circles. Considering he was entirely fictional, he certainly did not belong in their social world. Reggie looked like he was going to say something when the conductor tapped his music stand to get everyone's attention. Thank goodness, Bethany thought fervently. She had no idea how to answer Reggie's questions. If he had kept it up, Bethany might have started talking about her latest romance character that she was reading. Bethany was pretty certain there was no way she could be dating a Highland soldier from the 15th century. However, no one else was coming to mind to use as a template. 
She really needed to get out more often. The orchestra went through scales, practiced certain pieces, and a person was picked to be the second in case John was too under the weather to perform his solo on Thursday. Bethany was glad that they had not chosen her. Now she would not have to endure Reggie's congratulations. As it was, she quickly packed up her music and violin, hoping to get away from him before he began to ask more questions. "'Maybe we could have a double date sometime,' persisted Reggie. "'Maybe,' Bethany tried to be noncommittal. "'I will have to see what he says.' He was not going to say anything. He was not real. Bethany thought that maybe she should feel bad about misleading Reggie. However, he shot her another toothy grin as he left, and she remained behind, hoping to avoid having to talk to Reggie further. Bethany was going to have to find someone to date. She could not keep lying to him. It was not nice, and she was bound to get caught. She wondered if her mother had anyone in mind. Constant was always trying to set Bethany up with someone. Not that she was ever successful. The closest she had come was Noah Ramsley. Noah had been a good friend. If a relationship could have continued on friendship, Bethany felt that she might have been happy with Noah. Not mind-blowingly in love, like the romance novels, but content. They had gotten along, and he was very accommodating to her. Noah and Bethany had dated, tried out new things, and generally had a good time. However, he had been in love with someone else. Most of the time, Bethany was very happy for him. Sometimes she felt the twinge of disappointment that no one loved her the way that Noah loved Elle. Maybe she would not call her mother to ask her to set her up. Bethany could always keep up the fiction, and when Reggie became too close, she could just break up with Mr. Did Not Exist. What a sad thought. However, in the meanwhile, he would be Bethany's dream guy. If you enjoyed this chapter, please look for Chapter 3 of Love and Lies, Book 5 of the Ramsley Brothers series. Also hit that like button. This helps with the algorithms and is completely free to you and very helpful to my channel. Thank you and happy reading! Chapter 3 It did not take long to find out the building was deserted. Very little was left behind. Drew called it in. A forensics team would be down to look at the scene and collect whatever evidence they could. In the meanwhile, Drew looked for any clues of where the gang might have gone. He found nothing. The members and the heroine were in the wind. Gone and unlikely to be found any time soon. He sighed. They should have moved on them. Even having half the crew and twelve pallets of heroin would have been a win. At least they would have more to go on than what they did right now, which was nothing. Eight months of undercover work that might have been fruitless. Drew tried not to think about it. Instead, he collected his bike and started making rounds at some of the local establishments that the criminal element liked to frequent. He went to all sorts of places. Bars, clubs, seedy places. Drew looked and listened. He made a few discreet inquiries, but ended up empty-handed for his work. It was frustrating. Knuckles, Sam, Red, Hendricks, and Law all worked for a man they called the Goals. Goals arranged when shipments of heroin would come in. Drew was certain they were coming off a drop ship. Someone with a small pleasure boat would go out into the ocean, meet a much larger ship, get the barrels of heroin, turn around and bring it back to one of the local marinas, getting past the Coast Guard. It was not an enviable task. If they got caught, it would mean real prison time. However, the Coast Guard could not inspect every boat going through. Not only that, but if a small pleasure craft did not break any laws, they tended to be left alone. It made for an easy setup to distribute the drugs in bulk. Goals would know when a shipment came. He, or someone that he was in contact with, would transport the barrels of heroin to a site. Then Goals' team would secure the barrels, bringing them to an abandoned building, a rented warehouse, sometimes even a storage locker with poor security. Goals' team would weigh and split up the heroin into bricks. The drug was put onto wooden pallets. Sometimes they boxed it. Sometimes they just left it bagged, stacking them like bricks. One of the guys would rent a truck, and another would rent a forklift. The heroin was loaded and sent out to be repackaged and distributed further. At some point, it would end up in some addict's body. Twelve pallets had been a huge load. Usually, they only did one pallet at a time. Drew privately wondered if there was going to be a halt in operations for a while, and goals had stocked up. 
If that was the case, he might not get a lead on goals for a half year or more. All because one Maxwell Ramsley had stumbled on his undercover mission. It was ridiculous. Giving up, Drew went back to his apartment to dismiss rookie officer Cotter for the night. He found Max sleeping on his sofa, one foot on the floor, the other hanging over the end. He was not going to be very comfortable there, but Drew was not going to trade places. It was still his apartment the last time he checked. Cotter yawned as he headed out the door. The chair in the living area had not been very comfortable for the young man, but he had not dared to sleep in Drew's bed. It was a smart move. There were a couple of tabloids and other papers on the coffee table. Drew had a quick look. Sure enough, the police department's least favorite journalist, Sterling Denver, had penned a front-page story on the tabloid about how Max was missing, presumed to resume to his wild and lavish lifestyle from his youth, thus skipping out on his poor beleaguered wife and two kids. What a bunch of bull. Then again, Sterling was known for not always checking her facts. At least she had managed to get the missing part right. As Drew locked the door, a snore erupted from the couch. Are you kidding me? Drew stared at Max Ramsley, who snored again, loudly. There was a reason Drew lived alone. It was easier. He hated having roommates. He liked his privacy. He liked his space. He liked to have the place to himself. Drew could just stretch it on his salary as a detective, and so he did, even if it meant he was in the same building as his sister and Miguel. He had gotten in years ago before the rents had risen to astronomical. As a result, he had a studio apartment. A small kitchenette was against one wall, a little sitting area for a table, living room area for a couch, chair, coffee table, and television, then the king-size bed against the other wall. There was one shelf and one tall boy. The bathroom was small, but efficient. It was all the room one bachelor like himself needed. Drew rarely even had any overnight guests. He preferred to stay over at any of his previous girlfriend's places. It was easier and less complicated. Now he had Max Ramsley invading his space and being generally annoying. Another snore punctuated the air. Drew stood at the door and briefly thought about his options. He was not allowed to leave Max alone. If he did, and Max decided to contact someone in the outside world, Drew's career would be on the line. No one was going to come and relieve him until morning. Drew could not call someone else to take over and go to a motel. He would never live it down, not babysitting a witness because he snored. Drew rubbed a hand along his tired face. He could not unload the guy on Jana, either. Miguel would have a fit. Earplugs. He had to have earplugs somewhere in this apartment. He would try the old standby of making the guy roll over first. Drew went over to the couch and poked Max. You're snoring. Max rolled over toward the back of the couch and sighed, going straight back to slumberland if he had been awake for even that quick of an interval. Drew walked to the bathroom before another snore rent the air. He glared at the man on the couch and reverted to his original thought. Did he own any earplugs? If not, where could he get a pair at this time of night? Could he ask someone to deliver them? Could a person Uber that sort of thing? Drew looked through the drawers of his bathroom vanity. No earplugs. If they were not in here, Drew did not think that he owned any. Even through the shut door, he could hear Max rattle off another snore. It was going to be a long night. Drew crawled into bed and put a pillow over his head, vowing to get earplugs as soon as possible. Bethany slowly undid her robe and slid it from her shoulders. She folded it neatly, setting it on the chair. The shaking of her hands belied the anxiousness she felt. Remember, cautioned Holly, the two lifeguards are here to help. I'm just going to stand on the side and encourage you. If you feel overwhelmed, you can stop at any time. You are in control of this. Bethany nodded, shivering. She rubbed her arms. She hated the one-piece bathing suit she had picked out for this. It was the first one that she tried on. It was the only bathing suit she currently owned, and she had no desire to own another. Owning a bathing suit generally meant one when swimming, in large quantities of water. 
Bethany looked at the pool full of water and wished she was anywhere but here with a violence that surprised her. Despite having cleanliness habits that bordered on OCD, she had an aversion for water, which was probably rooted in the nightmare that she had. This side is the shallow end, Holly coaxed her. It's not very deep. The bathtub in her nightmares was not deep. Bethany closed her eyes and pushed away the terror. She was sick of not knowing what had happened, why her life was different from so many other people's. Ignoring the cramp of horror in her stomach, she hugged herself with a grip so hard she was hurting her arms where her hands clenched them. Bethany jutted her chin out and marched to the side of the pool where the steps led into the shallow water. Breathing in short, sickly gasps, she submerged one foot on the cement step. She could feel cold sweat coming out on her skin. You can wait until you're comfortable before taking the next step, advised Holly. Bethany closed her eyes and shook her head. She was never going to be comfortable with this. Mostly, she just wanted to get it over with. Going back, retreating, was not an option she was going to give herself. Bethany put her other foot into the water. She did not let herself grab the handrail. If she did, she would cling to it and never go in. Resolutely, she gathered her courage and quickly walked the rest of the steps until the water covered her knees, then her thighs. Bethany stubbed her toe on the bottom of the pool, stumbling, her eyes flying open as she realized there were no more steps. She shook so hard her teeth were clattering. Thank goodness she had not fallen. The female lifeguard was right beside her. The male lifeguard a respectful but close distance should anything happen. She focused on him. I will want him to dunk my head, stuttered Bethany. Bethany, I don't think that's a good idea. You should get used to the water for a while, warned Holly. You do not need to rush this. The psychiatrist did not understand. Bethany squeezed her eyes shut. She was never getting in another pool. If she did not do this now, try to trigger the memories now, she never would. Then Bethany would never get the answer she needed to understand what had happened to her. Think about the nightmare. What is similar? What is different? Talk to me, Holly said in her soothing voice. Her feet. Her feet and legs were wet when they should be dry, she thought. Only her head, hands, arms, and shoulders had gotten wet. The edge of the tub had hurt her stomach when he leaned her over it, pushing her head under the water. The water was not clear. There was a white film on it. His hand was not on her face. It was in her hair, pushing her under. The dream was wrong about that. His hand was not on her face. Bethany snapped her eyes open. It was a memory then. I will pay you ten thousand dollars. She looked at the male lifeguard intently. Dunk my head for five seconds, then let it go. Dunk it again for five seconds. He shook his head. Ma'am, I cannot do that. Fifty thousand, Bethany up the bid. I will do it for that, the female lifeguard said beside her. No, Bethany wanted to shout in frustration. It has to be him. Bethany, I think you should come out of the pool, Holly tried to intervene. We can come back another day after you've calmed down. One hundred thousand. She watched him desperately, taking wobbling steps towards him. That is it. Holly was entering the pool. This session is over. I am sorry, ma'am. The man backed up away from her. I just cannot do that. Bethany knew that she did not have the courage to put her face under the water herself. She began to cry in frustration, feeling like she was never going to find out the answers. Holly put a towel around Bethany's shoulders. Let's get out of the pool. Bethany let herself be led out. She ignored Holly's praises on how far she had come to her goal. She felt like she had accomplished nothing. Disappointment swamped her. Bethany sat on a bench and cried bitterly over the experience. Drew was starting to feel annoyed. It had been two days since the operation had gone south, both literally and figuratively. He had not been contacted about any further arrangements by the criminals peddling the heroin, nor had he learned any valuable information from his sources on the streets. 
It also did not help that people kept stopping him in the street and asking if he was Max Ramsley. Some people snapped photos of him with their phones. A few called it into the police trying to get the reward. It was getting to the point where Drew was getting some guff from the guys at the police department. Every time he went through the doors, they told him how many Drew sightings they had each day. It was ridiculous. What was worse, he had gotten a message on his voicemail from Sterling Denver, the tabloid journalist. She wanted to meet with him and discuss why he looked so much like Max Ramsley. That was never going to happen. How she had been able to track him down bothered Drew. If she could figure it out, then other people could. However, the possibility did not bother him as much as still having Max Ramsley living in his tiny apartment while the wet-behind-the-ears rookie Cotter pretended to look after him. Basically, they both watched cable and bonded while eating Drew's food. Drew looked at his empty fridge. Hey, rich boy, pony up some cash for groceries? I have a twenty, Max said as he pulled out his wallet. After that, it's credit or we'll have to hit the bank. Dude... Cotter shook his head. You're missing, remember? You can't go to the bank. Neither can we use your cards. Someone at the bank is bound to report it. Max frowned. I hadn't thought of that. Drew snatched the twenty before Max could think of taking it back. At the very least, he could get a few groceries on his way back tonight. In the meanwhile, he might have to borrow from Janet to keep the two guys on his couch from starving. He wondered if Miguel had told her or if he was being cowardly and waiting for Drew to do it. Probably waiting, Drew decided, since he had not heard anything from Jana. There she is. Max grinned and pointed to the television. That is my beautiful wife. It was on a national news channel. Drew inwardly groaned. It was one thing to be local, but to go national? What were they going to say when they magically found Max Ramsley? He decided it was not his problem. Green would have to take care of it. Mrs. Paget Ramsley tearfully pled for any news of her missing husband with quiet dignity. She was very pretty, and Drew could see how she might have caught Max's attention. Drew had a look at his half-brother and realized the man was absolutely besotted with his wife. Drew inwardly shrugged. People were weird like that sometimes. Did you see the latest? Cotter held up a tabloid to Drew. He took it. Max Ramsley feared dead. Wife celebrates. Max grinned confidently. They are so wrong this time. Drew was not so sure. She was probably getting the best sleep of her life for the past few days. They had better get things resolved soon, or she might never take Max back. The article went on to say how Mrs. Ramsley was about to become a wealthy woman with her husband's shares from Ramsley Pharmaceutical once she was found to be a widow. Drew shook his head in disbelief and tossed the paper back onto the coffee table. Tabloid journalist Sterling Denver was losing her touch if this was anything to go by. There was a sound of a key in the lock and the door to the apartment opening. Drew immediately turned, and Cotter raised his weapon as the man with the tattoos on his neck and arm entered the room. He stopped and looked at them in surprise. Yo, you gonna shoot me or something? he asked, looking at Cotter. Cotter, put your gun away. Drew directed and sighed. Just what he needed. What do you want, Molson? Molson shut the door after himself. Not to get shot would be a good start. He put his gun away already, so stop your whining. Drew folded his arms. Since when do you have a key? Since you moved here and lent me yours so I could bring stuff in? Molson moved to the kitchen, looking through the cupboards and fridge. I made a copy at the local hardware store before I gave it back. Don't you have any food here? They keep eating it. Drew had a sneaking suspicion that Molson had been helping himself to Drew's kitchen throughout the years now that he knew the guy had a key. It would explain the times when Drew had run out of groceries sooner than he thought he should. Why don't you bum food off of Jana? What? And get the why don't you do something useful with your life for a change lecture again? followed closely by the, you were setting a bad example for my kid's routine. Molson shook his head, grabbed a bowl, and poured some cereal into it. No thank you. There is no milk, Drew remarked mildly. Jana did tend to lecture Molson a lot. It was part of why Drew refused to. I know it, 
Molson ran the bowl under the faucet, just like how Ma used to make it. Drew shuddered. He remembered soggy, gross cereal in the mornings when they did not have milk as a kid. It happened more often than not. That is just wrong. Max spoke up from the couch. Can you even eat cereal like that? No, Drew responded with a disgusted face as Molson took a huge spoonful and crunched it. Molson shrugged and kept eating. He pointed the spoon at Max. There's a reward for him. Do not even think about it, growled Drew. Cop starting a ransom thing? Molson plopped himself into the armchair and slouched, munching away. Pay too low? That one looks a little green to be holding a gun. Cotter frowned at the insult Molson gave him. I've been with the force for five years now. Huh. Molson nodded, self-satisfied with Cutter's response. Rookie on the NARC team. Who are you? Max asked in fascination. Oh, nobody introduced me? Molson pretended to look offended. Really, bro? I thought you'd have told Mr. Ramsley, third of the legitimate Ramsley children, who we all were. Drew sighed. He was getting a headache. Molson did that to him. Molson Colburn, meet Max Ramsley. Max, meet Molson. We think David Ramsley might be his father as well. He's my little brother, so I guess that makes him yours, too. Max studied Molson with interest. I am. Molson crunched his cereal. I had a paternity test done. I'm from the old man. However, interesting enough, Jana ain't. What? Drew frowned at this revelation. How do you know this? Remember when Jenny was going through that scare with leukemia? They thought she might need a donor, said Molson. Jenny is Jan and Miguel's first daughter. She was okay, remembered Drew. It's not in her leukemia at all. At the time, I thought I'd be a little proactive and see if Pops really was related to us all. Molson shrugged as he scooped another spoonful of cereal. Turns out, he's not Jana's dad. Are you going to tell her? questioned Drew. Why? What difference does it make? asked Molson. Not like Mom's going to remember who Jana's real dad might be. What are those tattoos on your neck? Do they mean something? Max was getting more intrigued by this family the more he learned. Those are gang tattoos, Cotter said shortly. He was not pleased with Molson. Although how he belongs to two rival gangs at the same time, that is surprising. Molson had a cocky grin. I'm talented. If you bothered to study them some, you'd see there are five gang tattoos on my neck. Most of them gangs do not like each other none. Then how do you belong to them all at once? wondered Cotter, generally puzzled. Through this. Molson pointed the tattooed tear on his face, then the crosses on his forearm, and finally to the sixth tattoo on his neck. Are you a gang member, then? Max asked, his curiosity aroused. Your brother and sister are cops, yet you joined the gangs Drew is trying to put in jail? Doesn't that seem a little, I don't know, counterproductive? Irritating, annoying, disturbing, Drew said sharply. I can think of a few other words to describe it. Molson, do me a favor. Tell me you are not going to let any of your gang buddies know that Max is here, safe and sound in my apartment. His location needs to be kept secret. I'm hurt. Molson placed a hand over his heart in a long-suffering manner. My own flesh and blood don't trust me. You're right. I don't trust you, Drew scowled. Now see, that really did hurt. Molson looked at Drew, dropping the act. He grabbed his empty bowl and stood up. Don't you worry none. I'll do you a solid and forgot I ever saw him here. Molson clapped Drew on the shoulder as he passed him into the kitchen area, putting his bowl in the sink. Molson, I'm sorry sighed Drew. He hated fighting with his younger brother, but that was all they ever seemed to do. He knew that despite his brother's words, he had probably hurt Molson's feelings. Molson was just a master at covering up how he really felt on most occasions. Then again, when you lived with Wacko Margo, you had to figure out a way to hide your feelings. When you gonna go see Ma? Molson changed the subject as he walked to the door of the apartment. Never, if I can help it, Drew muttered. He had no desire to see her any time soon. I know she's a crappy person, Molson paused at the door, and she did give birth to you, you know? Drew decided not to answer. It was probably better for all concerned if he did not share his opinion of Margaret Colburn. 
Yeah, and you guys say I'm the disappointment. Molson shrugged and left the apartment, pulling the door firmly behind him. He is interesting, Max said from the couch. What does the tear under his eye mean? That he killed someone, replied Cotter. Really? Max stared at the young cop, surprised at the answer. Not necessarily, Drew defended his brother. It can also mean a loss. Not every tattoo means the same thing to the same people. It's a gang tattoo. Like the crosses mean closer to the god or time spent in prison, stated Cotter flatly. Molson has never been in prison. He's never been arrested. Drew checked regularly to be sure. He did not like his brother's choices and worried about him. It was one of Drew's outstanding worries that Molson would someday be dead on the streets or in prison because of his ties to gangs. What was the other tattoo? questioned Max, the one on his neck with the five gang tattoos. That one I don't know, Cotter looked at Drew. No one knows. Drew sighed. Molson had never told him what it meant. Molson's the only one I have ever seen with that tattoo. It means something surrounded by the five gang membership tattoos. Does he really belong to five gangs? Is that even possible? Max wanted to know. This was a possible half-brother to his family, a man with ties to gangs. With Molson, anything is possible, Drew said darkly. Are you going on the sting operation today? wondered Cotter. Drew nodded. He knew the rookie was disappointed not to be able to participate, but someone needed to watch Max. Drew was only going to be there as a lookout for the team at the marina as they scoped out a possible drug drop. Is this related to those guys from the building? asked Max. Maybe. We don't know yet. Max asked far too many questions in Drew's opinion. Drew was not inclined to give him answers since he was only a civilian and this was an ongoing investigation. I am going to get some food. Drew made his escape while he could. Three floors down, he knocked on Jana's door. Miguel answered. You haven't told her? Drew asked quietly. I advise you should, Miguel answered just as quietly. I can hear you whispering by the door. Jana called from the kitchen. Now come inside and let me know what it is about. Drew sighed again. Morning, Jana. How is the grocery situation? What? You don't know where the store is? Jana raised an eyebrow as she packed lunches for school. I have a couple of unwanted guests that I need to feed. I will replace whatever you give me. Drew poured himself some coffee and dropped into a chair. If they are unwanted, then maybe you should not feed them. Maybe they will go away, Jana said tartly as she put the lunches into school bags. I wish, Drew scowled. Hi, Uncle Drew, Jenny smiled at him. Did you see my picture? Drew leaned over to look at the little girl's artwork. That is a neat picture. Lots of color. Thank you, she grinned happily. Okay, kiddos, time for school. Miguel grabbed the backpacks and ushered the two girls out the door. He was making a strategic retreat. Drew envied him for it. Jana grabbed a coffee and sat down. Who are your visitors? A rookie cop who is on duty when I'm not home to guard a witness. We're pretending that he is missing so that my cover remains intact. Drew shrugged. Not that it's making any difference, since I have not been able to remain in contact with my assignment for the last couple of days. It is unusual to have a witness at a cop's place of residence, Jana remarked. Her voice and eyes said that he had better explain. Drew rolled his eyes. Green was in an odd sort of mood. I guess it tickled his funny bone to give the guy to me since he crashed my operation. Who was the guy? Jana sipped her coffee. Everyone knew Green had not been in the best frame of mind since he started his latest kick of trying to quit smoking. Max Ramsley, Drew reluctantly informed her. The Max Ramsley? Jana put down her mug. Dad's youngest kid from his wife? Drew blinked in surprise. You know. You think that I wouldn't check on Dad's other family just to see? Jana gave him a surprised look. Of course I know. I am a cop. I investigate people. Did Max know that he has half-siblings? Not a clue, shrugged Drew. Thinks this is great. I expect we'll all get invited to holidays if Max has any say in the matter. Jana laughed. I don't think his parents would like that. What little I have gathered, I don't think he's on speaking terms with Dad right now. 
Drew drained his coffee. Have you seen Mom lately? No, and I have no intention of seeing her, scowled Jana. Why? Molson came around this morning. Drew frowned. He asked if I intended to visit her any time soon. If he chooses to keep in contact with Margot, that is his problem, Jana said firmly. I've been thinking. I'm not so sure I want Molson around the kids any more. Drew looked at her sharply. As much as he did not like all the things Molson was involved in, he would not cut his brother out of his life. He is their uncle. I know. Believe me, I've thought about this a lot, and I'm not happy. It's not been an easy decision. Jana sighed and took a fortifying sip of coffee. He has gang connections. He's disrespectful on occasion. I do not want my kids influenced by him. The other day, Kara was asking about his tattoo, and he's explaining it all to her like she's an adult. She is five. I do not want any of my children thinking that it's okay to be in a gang or date a gangbanger just because their uncle is a member. You are just going to cut him off? Drew could not imagine it. He wondered how Molson would take it. Probably not well. You know if you do that, he'll likely never talk to you or Miguel again. I need to protect my kids. Jana looked at Drew steadily. What if Molson makes the wrong person angry? We all know there's gang fallout on family members at times. Drew did not like it. He understood her point, but he did not like it. He is our brother. Molson needs to get out of the gangs before he ends up in prison or dead, Jana said firmly. Maybe if I cut him off, he'll finally realize that what he's doing is wrong. Or he will be as stubborn as he always is and dig in further, Drew responded. Privately, he thought that Jana's lecturing Molson throughout the years had not helped the situation. A lot of times, if you told Molson not to do something, he did exactly what you did not want him to do. Then it is even more important that my kids have nothing to do with him. Jana got up and began to put breakfast away. Give me a list and I'll go grocery shopping for you. I will even deliver to your apartment since it is time I get to meet one of the real Ramsleys. Drew sighed and opened his wallet. He forked over some cash. We need everything. I'll drop by a bank today and get you the rest later. He got up and put his mug in the sink. Jana, I know that you do not want advice from me, but hold off on pushing Molson away. Do not do something you might regret. How can I regret protecting my kids? Jana asked him. By burning your relationship with your baby brother, said Drew grimly. Just wait a little while, okay? Think it through. I have been thinking it through. I have a son who is going to look up to his father, but we all know sons can rebel. Jana folded her arms. The last thing I want is my boy to get angry at his father or I and decide to join his Uncle Molson. If Molson will drop the gangs, then he can stay in our lives. If he won't... Drew was not going to be able to convince her to change her mind. What does Miguel have to say? He agrees with me, Jana stated firmly. I think you are making a mistake, Drew said gently. I think you're going to ruin your relationship with Molson. It's up to him to decide what he wants. If those gangs are more important to him than his family, then his priorities are mixed up. Jana frowned. Speaking of almost family, Drew grimaced slightly as he waded into the delicate subject. Be nice to Max. He's a bit naive, but he means well. When am I not nice? She said innocently. Drew decided not to answer that particular trap and made his escape. I need to get to work. Jana waved him away. Thank you for listening to Chapter 3 of Love and Lies, Book 5 of the Ramsey Brothers series. Look for Chapter 4. Just a reminder, hit the subscribe button so that you can find all of my videos, including upcoming Ramsley Brothers series audiobooks. This is free for you, and it helps my algorithms with the YouTube channel. Thank you, and happy listening! Chapter 4 Bethany stared at the shower. She did not want to go in. Her aversion to water had become worse after her stint in the pool. She avoided the shower for three days by using dry shampoo, copious amounts of wetted wipes, and washcloths. She had worn hats for pity's sake to cover the telltale signs of her hair. It was past time to go in. A quick shower, just turn it on to pre-wet, turn it off, lather, on to rinse, turn off, condition, on to rinse again, off and get out. 
Bethany had done it plenty of times, and it was better than trying to put her head under a sink. She shuddered at the thought of contouring herself under sink faucet. It was too close of a position to the memory that haunted her. Bethany was afraid she might drown herself, which was just silly. People could not drown themselves without purposely using certain measures. A human survival instinct was too strong. Bethany looked at herself in the mirror. She liked to be clean, to look perfect. Her father and her mother had instilled in her from a very young age that she should always look her best. School had reinforced that edict. She did not look grungy, but she felt it. She wished she could take some of the leftover pills that her previous psychiatrist had prescribed her. Bethany wanted to numb her fear right now. She also wanted to remember. The two needs warred with each other, and Bethany sighed, giving up. She left the bathroom and compromised by crawling into bed. She would shower tomorrow morning. Procrastinating was not going to help her, Bethany thought drowsily. Sleep claimed her. Where was it? Her childish feet slapped against the weathered boards as she ran in the hot sunshine. She knew she was not supposed to be out here without the boys, but they were doing something boring, so she had slipped away. It was not like she was going to try to steal the boat. She just wanted to find it and pretend she was a pirate, or a princess on a boat tour, or shipwrecked. Was this the boat, or the next one? She could not remember. Bethany searched the marina. There were so many boats. She did a little skip, a pirouette, then bounced forward. She was going to be an amazing ballet dancer. Maybe she would pretend to be a ballerina on vacation. Ballerinas could afford yachts, couldn't they? She jumped onto a boat, confident in her ability to judge the distance over the water from the dock to the deck. She began to explore even as she realized her mistake. It was the wrong boat. It was far too big, yet that did not stop her from looking. She stopped in the yucky, yellow-colored bathroom. The boys called it a head. She didn't know why. She was also stumped because this one had a bathtub. Sure, it was tiny, but it was there, and no boat that she knew of ever had a bathtub. Of course, she only knew of one other boat. Bethany shrugged. She was about to leave when she heard voices. Voices that she knew. She was not supposed to be here. Bethany crouched down, hiding beside the toilet. If they found her, she would get in a lot of trouble. She tried to shrink her little body down to nothing so they would not see her. The door opened. Bethany jerked awake in bed, her heart hammering. She grabbed her journal, furiously writing down the details of the dream so that she would not forget anything. Once the words were down, she read them over, adding or crossing out as her mind remembered the dream. Who did she know that had a boat? Bethany put the pen and book down, lying in her bed and staring at the ceiling. She searched her mind and came up empty. Tossing off the blankets, Bethany grabbed clothes and headed to the shower. This was going to happen. Bethany took a deep breath and turned on the spray. Maybe while she was under it, she might get another flashback, she told herself sternly. Bethany forced herself to take the shower, hating every moment of it. Afterward, she felt much better for being clean, but disappointed that no memories had surfaced. She knew it was not wise to force things. Dr. Ershman kept telling her that. However, Bethany wanted to know the truth about what had happened so long ago. Why had she constantly been made to go to a psychiatrist, to be medicated? Her mother had talked about her having constant nightmares as a child, that Bethany had become difficult and unruly. Her father said it would have been necessary. She just did not understand. It was near dawn and the sun was starting to slowly light up the world. Bethany grabbed her coat and keys. She called a cab and waited impatiently in the lobby for it to arrive. Where to, lady? The taxi driver asked her. The nearest marina, answered Bethany. She waited while he punched information into his phone, looking for an address. Soon enough, the cab was moving. Looking to run a boat? Pretty early in the morning for that, the cabbie remarked. Bethany looked out the window. If you could wait for me once we get there, I would appreciate it. Sure thing, he agreed, concentrating on his driving when it became clear that she was not in a talkative mood. It did not take long to get the marina. Bethany exited the taxi, looking over the boats. She would not know one boat from another. The point was not to find the one in her memories. Bethany had no expectation of that. No, it was to try to trigger the rest of the memory. 
when she was a child she had obviously been found yet what had the man in her dreams thought she had seen why did he want her to be quiet who was he she wandered down the walkway toward the boats and water bethany tried not to think of the water she chose a path to take Hiking her purse higher on her shoulder, she wondered if anyone would be about. Could she hop on one of the boats? Did she need permission if no one was around? Bethany did not see a single person. Somehow, her feet had taken her down one of the long wooden walkways. She felt sick at the sight of the water around her. For a moment, she considered backing away, going back to the cab. That would not get her any answers. Trembling, Bethany walked to the edge of the dock. She cleared her throat nervously and clutched her purse strap in a death grip. Hello? Drew knew money when he saw it. He also knew he must have done something that made the man upstairs unimpressed to have two totally clueless people crash his police assignments within the same week. While she was absolutely gorgeous, she was also unwelcome. Seriously, was this the new trend? He could not believe it. Shouldn't someone be guarding these people? Drew groaned. She was approaching the boat that he was hiding in. Could it get any worse? His supervisor was going to have his head. He switched on his radio. Who was responsible to make sure civilians did not wander into our stakeout? Monroe was on that detail. Did you see her? She is a looker. Colby whistled through the radio, like an actress. Hello? Is anyone there? A trembling feminine voice asked, Why me? Drew muttered and looked up. He did not go to church often enough. Jana would say that this was God's way of nudging him, telling Drew that something was not quite right in his life. Monroe was going to pay for the mistake. Drew was unfortunately going to have to do damage control. He stood up, coming out on the deck, smiling in a disarming manner at probably one of the most gorgeous women he had ever seen off a television set. She was tall, willowy, impeccably dressed with blonde hair and uncertain blue eyes. Can I help you? She stared at him in surprise. You look just like Max. Drew dropped the smile. He was getting sick of Max Ramsley and he barely knew the guy. Yes, he looked a lot like his brother. Correction, half-brother. Drew was not certain that was a compliment, her comparing him to Max. Lady, is there a reason you are here? Bethany did not know why he had gone from charming to disgruntled. For some reason, he did not like getting compared to Max. Then again, Max was not attractive in her opinion, and this guy definitely was. Her nervous heart had taken a little leap while it took her brain a moment to catch up to what she had been seeing. He was the cliché of tall, dark, and handsome, but with the tattoos on his arms and the scar splitting his eyebrow, he was dangerous-looking, too. Bethany shoved away the thought. I would like to come on your boat. It was not his boat. Drew had commandeered it as a good vantage point. He could tell her to get lost, go back to wherever upscale place she came from, or he could let her on the boat so that he knew exactly where she was at all times. Letting her go risked her running into the very criminals they were trying to trap. Drew sighed. Monroe owed him for this. Welcome aboard. She hesitated. In fact, it seemed like she was stalled, hanging onto her purse strap like she feared he might steal it from her. Lady, are you coming or not? Drew did not have time for her to waste. She was sticking out like a sore thumb, and he did not need for her to mess up the operation. Are you going to ask me why? she asked nervously, clutching her purse. I have not even introduced myself. Ma'am, I don't much care. Drew held out a hand to help her onto the deck at the boat. He flashed her his badge with the other hand. Please, get on the boat. What is going on? Bethany looked at him with some alarm. For a brief moment, he wondered if she was in on the criminal side, that they used her to check out the area before committing to a drop. Immediately, Drew dismissed the idea. She was too high class for that. Ma'am, there are police officers on all around the area. We are in the middle of an important activity, and I need you on the boat where you'll be safe. She reluctantly held out a hand, even as she instinctively looked around the marina for other people. Drew wasted no time in grabbing her hand, pulling her onto the boat. He could feel her stiffen in surprise as he hustled her into the wheelhouse. He pulled out his radio. Civilian is on my boat. Copy, came the reply. 
Drew looked over the marina, waiting. He still had a hand on the woman's arm. He could feel her trembling violently. Distracted, Drew looked over at her. She was pale, had her eyes closed, might be hyperventilating, and looked ready to faint. I think I need to get off the boat. Not an option, grimaced Drew. She wanted on, and now she wanted off? He knew women changed their minds a lot, but this was excessive. Here, sit down. Bethany led him direct her to a seat. Her teeth were chattering, and she put her head between her legs. I think I might throw up. Great. Drew looked around for a container. What was your name? Bethany, she replied. Here. He shoved a grocery bag into her hands. What is your name? asked Bethany. Andrew, he supplied. Most people call me Drew. Nice to meet you, Bethany said from between her knees. Colburn, did they just pass you? Colby asked through the police radio. Drew berated himself for getting distracted by the gorgeous female beside him. He scanned the windows. Target's approaching count five. What does that mean? Bethany asked worriedly. I've got five bad guys going into our trap. He spared her a glance. What is wrong with you? I do not like boats, she hugged herself. Drew was about to ask her why she would come on to this one then, but he was distracted when he saw one of the men split off from the group. Stay here. What? she asked in consternation. Drew ignored her as he left the boat, unholstering his gun. She was going to die. She was going to expire from not being able to breathe properly, and no one was going to save her because some cop who looked like Max Ramsley, but was handsomer, had just run away from her. Bethany huddled on the floor, her eyes tightly shut. It was safer than sitting in the chair, waiting to take a nosedive if she fainted. She tried not to cry. What if the criminals he was chasing came and found her on the boat? What was she going to do? Her eyes snapped open. She knew she was not going to be able to get from the boat to the dock. Crossing that span of water was as impossible as crossing the Grand Canyon right now. She simply could not do it. Hide. She could hide. Slowly, Bethany looked around. There had to be somewhere she could squeeze herself into that they would not find her. She uncurled herself, crawling, breath coming in gasps as she tried to find a good place to hide. Bethany reached up and opened a door. It was a cabin. She opened another door in the small hall and found a bathroom with a tiny shower in it. She pulled herself into the shower, shutting the curtain. Too late, Bethany realized that she had left her purse behind. Shaking and huddled on the shower floor, she was not going to go back for it. Bethany could not move if her life depended on her, which it very well might. Why, oh why, had she decided to go on a boat this morning? Bethany sobbed, hugging her knees to her chest. She was going to die on this stupid boat. They are going to find her dead in the shower because she left her purse out for any half-intelligent criminal to find. Suddenly, the shower curtain opened and Bethany screamed. Whoa! Drew backed up a pace, putting both hands palm up in the universal sign of surrender. It is just me. He waited for her to calm down, but she just kept shaking, sobbing, and laying on the shower stall floor. Drew crouched down beside her, reaching a cautious hand to rub her back. Hey, you are safe. We can get off the boat. Everything is going to be fine. He kept rubbing her back and saying what he hoped were soothing things to get her to calm down, telling her it was going to be okay. Promise? she asked in a pathetically tiny voice. Promise, Drew assured her. He was surprised when she almost crawled into his lap, wrapping her arms around him. She had said she did not like boats, but this was a little extreme. Why don't we get off the boat? Would you like that? he asked her. Bethany nodded shakily, pressing her face into his chest. Please. When had he dropped into Crazy Town? Drew wondered. And why him? She could have stumbled onto any of the other cops that were in hiding in the marina, but she chose him of all people. Drew carefully picked up Bethany and grimaced at the tiny doorway. It was going to be a struggle to get both of them through it at the same time. She was light in his arms, fitting like she belonged there. Whoa, he thought. Put a stop to those thoughts. The last thing Drew needed was a gorgeous, but not quite right in the head, rich lady. She seemed high maintenance on so many levels. First impressions were not good. He hoped she would not turn into one of those stalker types. 
One of the other officers had encountered one of those, and it had taken him five months to shake the woman when she became obsessed with him. Drew had enough on his plate with any weird woman added into the mix. He squeezed through the bathroom door and the tight hallway to the deck of the ship. It took a moment to decide how best to get from the deck of the boat to the dock without falling in the water. Bethany had him in a near headlock, and it was obvious she was in no condition to try to go from boat to dock. She was shaking so badly, Drew could hear her teeth clicking. You really don't like boats. He tried to make a little conversation. Hopefully he could distract her enough to get her back to normal and send her on her way. If he never saw this beautiful but crazy lady ever again, Drew would be okay with that. Drew made the jump a little awkwardly, but neither of them got wet. No, she whispered, I do not like the water either. Then why would you go on a boat? Drew frowned as he carried her along the marina. I needed to find out. Bethany kept her eyes closed and breathed in the scent of him. She did not know why, but Drew made her feel safe. Find out what? he questioned. Bethany sighed. I'm trying to remember something from my childhood. There's a memory, but it keeps slipping away. I want to know what it is. So you go on boats, which you hate, on water, which you hate, all to try to find a memory from your childhood. Yep, Drew thought. She was definitely from Crazy Town. Something like that. Bethany relaxed a little. You must really work out at a gym. Drew had not complained about carrying her around yet. Caught yourself a prize, Colburn? A male voice asked. Pretty big fish. A mermaid? Another amused voice inquired. Where's her tail? Shut up, Drew replied dryly. If Monroe were doing his job, she would not have made it onto my boat. Bethany looked to see a group of five men watching her with varying degrees of speculation. She blushed a little. They were on cement and a little way from the water. You can put me down now. Sure thing. Drew realized she was a little embarrassed from all the attention. Bethany seemed to have recovered from her earlier bout of anxiety. He set her on her feet. Better? Yes, thank you. Bethany gave him a small smile. She felt a little silly standing before all these men. She must seem like such a wimp to them to need to be carried just because she was near the water. Who is she? A younger man questioned. Bethany... Drew looked at her for an answer. Some detective he was. He didn't even know her last name. Searson, she smiled, pleased to make your acquaintance. A couple of eyebrows shot up. It was obvious they were not used to that turn of phrase. Colby, Jackson, Demon, Miguel, and Tony. Drew introduced them. Ma'am, smiled Colby, confident in his handsomeness. The others nodded to varying degrees. Are you all police officers? Bethany was curious. Yes, ma'am. Miguel gave Drew a significant look that Bethany could not interpret. Miss Searson, you'll need to go down to the station with us for a simple background check and statement. You were here during one of our operations, and we need to clear you. Is that really necessary? frowned Bethany. She looked at her watch. It was two hours until her first class. How long will that take? It is mandatory, Miguel assured her. Perhaps Detective Colburn can assist you with your statement. Drew gave Miguel a significant look in return. He was not pleased with Miguel's suggestion. The last thing he needed was to encourage this lady. Sure thing. Bethany looked at Drew in consternation as she realized something. I left my purse on the boat. She was deathly afraid of boats and water. Drew sighed. I will go get it. Drew privately acknowledged that he was going to get teased by the guys for this. He was already going to take a ribbing from carrying Bethany around like a damsel in distress. His radio buzzed as he walked back towards the boat. Colburn, who was that with you? A civilian. Drew spoke into his radio. Great. Now the boss was fully aware of Bethany Searson. Why is she in my crime scene area? demanded Green. But Roe did not keep her out of it, Drew responded tersely. It was not his fault, nor his responsibility, to keep civilians out of the area. It was in enough hot water for yesterday's performance. Drew did not need any more issues with his supervisor. Bring her in. Make sure she does not have any ties to this gang and then cut her loose. Yes, sir. Drew hopped onto the boat and looked for Bethany's purse. He found it easily and snooped through it. Her identification matched her name. 
She is only a couple years younger than him. Bethany had a good quality health insurance plan card. She also had a swipe card for entry into the city auditorium. There was a couple hundred dollars worth of cash in her wallet. Her purse contained the usual assortment of mints, lip gloss, tissues, and any other items women would carry around. Drew found her date planner and had a quick look. Not that he thought he might find today's entry reading Crash Police Sting Operation, but he might see something useful. Bethany had regular appointments with someone named Dr. Ershman. That did not surprise Drew. He knew a crazy lady when he saw one, and he suspected this was the shrink. She also had a class times written down. He wondered what she was studying. Practice and performance times, scheduled Sunday dinners with her parents, and the most interesting entry of all simply said, Pool. For a woman who was afraid of water and boats, she had gone to the pool. Drew wondered exactly what Bethany Searson's game was. Her cell phone was locked. He did not have the code nor a warrant, so he dumped all of her stuff back in her purse. Gucci. It did not look like a knockoff. It was frayed on the strap, but otherwise in great condition. Bethany's clothes had all looked smart and expensive. Rich and crazy. Drew took the bag and left the boat. It did not take him long to reconnect with the group who gave him no grief about the purse. They were probably all trying to be polite in front of the lady, which each were slightly flirting with except Miguel, who raised an expectant eyebrow when Drew returned. Drew appreciated the fact that he never had to call out Miguel on any inappropriate comments or behavior regarding women considering the man was married to Drew's sister, Jana. Then again, Jana was more than capable of keeping Miguel in line. She kept Drew and his brother Molson in line for years, practically raising them single-handed because their mother was a flake. Miss Searson, if you're ready to go, Drew asked her. It was not really a request. He handed her back the purse. Demon snickered. Drew gave him a sharp look, but all five guys were trying to look innocent. Great. He wondered what they were up to. Yes, Bethany answered him. It was nice to meet you all. Pleasure, Colby nodded with a wide smile. Drew scowled at him. Drew knew that many women had the habit of falling under Colby's charm. He did not need Bethany to do that. He needed her to fill out a report and be on her way out of his life forever. The rest of the men murmured that it was nice to meet her in return, and Drew gently took Bethany by the elbow, steering her away from the group. They seemed very nice, Bethany tried to smooth over the awkwardness. She was picking up on some odd vibes from Drew. He seemed very abrupt. Bethany had obviously interrupted his day, and he had been somewhat annoyed with her ever since. He might look like Max Ramsley, but he had none of his charm. Why were you on the boat, Bethany? Drew asked as they came to the parking lot. I told you, Bethany replied with a frown. I'm trying to recover a memory. You said you were afraid of water, he stated as he unlocked the truck. Drew had brought the truck so that he could carpool with Miguel and some of the guys to the marina. Now they were going to have to find their own rides back to the station. He held the door open for her. Drew expected a woman like Bethany would never open a door for herself. She was that class of lady. Yes, I'm terrified of water. Bethany gave him an odd look as she got into the vehicle. I've already told you this. He shut the door and got into the driver's seat. Drew looked at her to see her reaction. Then why do you have an appointment in your day planner that says pool? Bethany looked at him in shock. Pools generally have water in them. People who are scared of water tend to stay away from pools. Drew waited for her response. You went through my purse. She was stunned. It was the first time anyone had ever invaded her privacy like that. Yes. Drew started the truck. Care to explain about the pool? Bethany decided to revise her opinion of the man beside her. He was rude and surly. He was not handsome like Max Ramsley at all. Just because he rescued her on the boat, carried her, and caused little flutterings in her stomach, did not mean that she was attracted to him in the least. She turned her face away from him to look out the window. Not particularly. He pulled out the parking lot and into traffic, past her taxi, who was still waiting for her. Bethany almost said something, but one look at his face had her changing her mind. He did not look happy at all. Bethany, you need to tell me about the pool. You are involved in an investigation of a local gang. You stumbled onto our sting operation, and I need to confirm that you have nothing to do with the gang. Otherwise, I am going to have to arrest you. Drew gritted his teeth. 
did not care for her talking to him in that snooty little tone of hers, not particularly. It made him feel like some scum she had found on the bottom of her shoe. What would she think when she found out he was the illegitimate son of David Ramsley? Drew firmly told his inner voice to go away. First, she might not run in those circles of society, though he doubted it since she knew Max Ramsley. Second, he was just going to get her statement and send her on her way back to Crazy Town. He never had to see her again. He never again had to see her blue eyes look at him in gratitude like he had just saved her entire world and become her hero for carrying her from a stupid boat. Then I should have a lawyer. Bethany knew that much. If he was going to threaten to arrest her, whatever for, she really did not understand. But she knew she should get a lawyer. Maybe she could even get her father to sue and get this arrogant man dismissed from his job. Or you could tell me, and we could both save a lot of time. Drew waited at a red light. I don't think you would like waiting in jail with other people in a cell. She would not. Bethany knew that instinctively. She was half afraid of her own shadow some days. Bethany had no desire to share accommodations with people of criminal activity. She sighed. I had an appointment with Dr. Ershman at a local pool to try to trigger my reclusive memories. Dr. Ershman is your shrink? Drew asked to confirm his earlier suspicions. He had practice at spotting crazy. There was a reason his mother's nickname was Wacko Margo. Psychiatrist. Bethany clarified a little curtly. Whatever, same difference in his mind. Drew laid on the gas and cut down an alleyway to avoid traffic. How did it go? It was frustrating, softly admitted Bethany. I did not learn much. That is why I thought I would come to the marina and try again. What did you learn? Drew kept up with the questions. Bethany sighed. I learned the water had a white film on it. I learned his hand was not on my face. It was in the hair on the back of my head as he pushed my head under the water in the bathtub. Say again? Drew frowned fiercely as he parked the truck in the police lot. Did not like the imagery of what she had just described. Start from the beginning. I have been having nightmares since I was a child. They have gotten worse lately, explained Bethany. I dream that I am a child. I am at a marina and where there are lots of boats. I know the area, and I feel perfectly safe, even though I'm not supposed to be out there by myself. I'm searching for a particular boat, but I always get on the wrong one. I hear voices that I know. There are two men on the boat, and I know I will get in trouble if they find me, so I hide from them. Bethany's voice trailed away as she remembered, her face pale, and her hands trembled as she pushed an errant strand of hair out of her face. One of them finds you, Drew surmised from her previous comments. Yes, she swallowed hard. He is drowning me in this ugly little tub. The water has a white film on it. I can hear him telling me that I don't see anything. No, wait, that's wrong. Bethany bit her lip, closed her eyes, and tried to remember. It was teasing her at the edge of her mind. If she could only grab it. If she could only remember. Drew patiently waited. She was struggling with something. He wondered whether he should believe this story about a memory that she was trying to find. Then again, it was not his experience that normal people made up stories about getting drowned in a tub. Of course, he was not particularly certain of Bethany's sanity just yet. It's gone. Bethany sighed in disappointment as she opened her eyes. I cannot remember it properly. Why don't we go inside? Drew said gently. I will take your statement. Call your psychiatrist for verification and you can be on your way. Bethany nodded. Her eyebrows furrowed in a frown as she glanced at him. Do regressive memories count for testimony in a court trial? That would depend on a lot of things. The psychiatrist who assisted in exposing these memories would be under a lot of scrutiny since false memories have led to unjust convictions before. Drew watched her, wondering at her angle. Why do you want to know? It was a crime, wasn't it? He almost killed me. There was a tinge of fear in her eyes. There was determination, too. Drew sighed. You said it was a nightmare. A reoccurring dream. Without more to go on, no one can say that it is a memory. Who owns the boat that you were on in your memory? 
I do not know, Bethany whispered. You say the voices are familiar, but you don't know who they are, he stated. That's right. I feel if I could just figure out who they are, I would know the rest, she said in frustration. There is no motive for trying to drown you, Drew reasoned. Plus, you are obviously alive. Is there anything that can be done? Bethany asked, her eyes pleading with him. I need proof of crime to charge someone. Drew felt sympathy for her. He told himself firmly that that was all he felt. I'm sorry. Bethany slumped in the passenger seat and nodded. She had not really expected him to do anything. How could he when she could not know who was at fault or what really happened all those years ago? She fiddled with her purse strap and tried to ignore the ever-present frustration. Drew came around to her door, opening it for her. Look, if you think of any more details, you can always let me know, Drew offered, much against his better judgment. If it gets to a point where we can start an investigation, I'll be willing to help. Really? Bethany looked at him hopefully. Maybe he was not so bad after all. She put her hand into his and gracefully stepped out of the truck. I really appreciate that. Drew quickly dropped her hand. He was already regretting his impulsive offer to help. He nodded and gestured to the drab police building. Shall we? He escorted Bethany inside. It did not take long to fill in a statement form, have her sign it, and call the shrink to confirm her story. Bethany might be crazy, but according to the psychiatrist, she was telling the truth. Drew called her a taxi and sent Bethany on her way after she reminded him of his offer to help if she remembered any more of the dream that had been plaguing her. Drew agreed because he was a man of his word. Part of him hoped he would see her again. Most of him hoped that was the last of the Bethany Searson in his life. Drew did not need that sort of complication. She might be the most gorgeous woman he had ever seen. She might have made him feel ten feet tall, carrying her off that boat like a hero. But she was trouble. He did not fit into her world, and she did not fit into his. Drew watched her leave the police station and resolutely put her from his mind. When he went to join his boss and the rest of the narcotics team, he was greeted by the sight of them all hovering around Demon's phone. Want to share? Drew asked dryly as the group quickly split up, the guys looking guilty as ever. We already did, Colby grinned unrepentantly. It's all over the station. Drew had a look at the picture on D-Man's phone. It was of him carrying that blasted purse down the marina. I'm not so sure Gucci is really your style, Miguel commented with a snicker. Thanks, Drew said dryly. Maybe if Monroe could do his job, I wouldn't have had a civilian on my part of the operation. Where is Monroe, anyway? He's down for the count, Captain Green entered the room. Food poisoning. Nice purse, Colburn. Drew sighed and slumped into a chair. He was going to endure a lot of teasing during the next week or so until something funnier made the rounds in the police station. If you enjoyed Chapter 4 of Love and Lies, Book 5 of the Ramsley Brothers series, please look out for Chapter 5. Also, please click the like button. This is free for you to do, and it helps me with the algorithms to grow my YouTube channel. Thank you, and happy reading! Chapter 5 Bethany hefted her purse onto her shoulder, took a deep breath to gather her courage, and entered the police station. She walked up to the reception area and requested to see Detective Colburn. It had been a couple of days since she talked to Drew, and she had been able to garner more details from the nightmare. Bethany hoped that they might help in an investigation. A few moments later, Drew came out to see her. Miss Searson? Drew extended a hand in greeting. Bethany tried to ignore the fluttering in her stomach over the simple contact from shaking his hand. Detective Colburn, I was hoping to talk to you. This way. Drew led her back to his desk. It was not the most private place, with other people going in and out, but it would do. What can I help you with? Bethany sat in the chair he provided. She had the feeling it was his chair. He sat at the edge of the desk and patiently waited while she gathered her thoughts. I remembered more. Bethany unconsciously fiddled with her purse strap, tearing away little pieces of the strap with her perfect manicured hands. I know it's not much to go on. However, I wanted your opinion. Drew really hoped again that she was not going to be one of those crazy stalker types. When Colburn had gotten one, he had not lived it down for months. He was still the butt of a few jokes now and again. Drew made sure that his tone was gentle. What did you remember? 
the voices. Bethany looked at him with utter sincerity. I don't know who they are. They're familiar, but I cannot seem to recognize them. However, I realized that it was not the man who was trying to drown me, telling me not to remember. It was the other man. He was pleading for my life. He told him that I would not remember, that I would not say anything, that I would be a good girl, that he would make certain of it. I think that's why I'm still alive. Drew frowned. He saved you? Whoever this guy is? Yes, I'm certain of it. Yet you still do not remember who they are, questioned Drew. No, Bethany sighed in frustration. What were you not to remember? What did they not want you to see? Drew questioned her. I think it was drugs, she replied tentatively. Great. She was probably picking up on things that had happened the other day and weaving them into her story. It made her memories possibly unreliable and fabricated. Drew did not let that inkling of disbelief creep into his voice as he asked her, Why do you think that? I thought it was icing sugar. Bethany gave sort of a half-smile. I felt so silly saying anything before now, so I have not told anyone, not even Dr. Irshman. I thought there was icing sugar on the boat. It was on the seats and the floor, just a dusting of it. I remember I had touched some with my finger, and I... You what? Drew prodded gently. I licked it. Bethany swallowed and looked at her hands. She immediately stopped shredding the strap on her purse like she had just realized she had been doing that small action. I licked it, and I spit it out because it was not icing sugar. It tasted awful. She looked up at him with large eyes, wanting to know the truth. It was drugs, wasn't it? It could have been, Drew allowed. It was hard to say. They were going on the assumptions of a possible memory over twenty-five years ago. It could have been that someone had accidentally dropped a cleaning powder. It could all be a figment of her imagination. I think it was. Bethany sensed that he did not necessarily believe her. The man had pink gloves on. The kind you do dishes with? I think they spilled some sort of drug and were trying to clean it up, and I stumbled on the whole thing. Let's write this down. Drew grabbed a pad and pen. We will put down the details. Maybe if you remember more, we can add to it. Right now, it's not enough to start an investigation. Bethany trembled as she looked up at him. He was simply humoring her. She was certain of it. What if I knew the name of the boat? Then I might have something concrete to look into, Drew said. I think it was called the Sweet Bethany, she replied. Drew paused. It was too convenient in his opinion. Miss Searson, dreams can sometimes do funny things. Are you certain that it was the name of the boat? Bethany stood and adjusted her purse on her shoulder. I know it is not the most believable story. I know you're just trying to humor me, Detective Colburn. Yet I must live with this nightmare, night after night, waking up feeling like I am drowning. Surely you can understand that I just want to understand why and who did this to me. She held her head high and made to move past him. Drew grasped her wrist gently to stop her. I can understand that. Bethany looked down at him, and he could see the weariness in her eyes. She was scared and was uncertain if he would help. Please sit down. We'll write it all out, and I will look into the boat. Drew gestured to the chair she had just vacated. I will try to find out if anyone owned a boat called Sweet Bethany in the area around twenty-five or so years ago. You will? she asked hopefully. I give you my word, Drew assured her. It was the only concrete item in her story that he could track down. He would do that much. After he took her statement and gave more promises that he would investigate the boat, Drew escorted her out of the station. Colby met him on the way in. I see your girlfriend is back, smirked Colby. Not my girlfriend, Drew scowled at the guy. And you won't mind if I ask her out next time she comes in, Colby pressed, waiting to see Drew's reaction. Drew did not like the idea of Colby trying to charm Bethany Searson. She was a vulnerable woman who might have mental issues. He also knew that if he told Colby no, Drew would be the subject of a lot of ribbing this afternoon from the guys. Bad enough the purse picture was still making the rounds. Suit yourself. Colby grinned and whistled as he went back to his desk. Hey, Colburn, where's your purse? An officer asked as he walked by. Drew scowled. The joke was getting old. 
especially when at least three people in an hour were asking it. Colburn, I left it at home, okay? The frustrated outburst sounded loud in the station. Drew turned to see Green and his superior, Thames, looking at him in surprise. What was that about? demanded Green. I am sorry, sir. Drew clenched his teeth. Wonderful, just wonderful. It will not happen again, sir. No kidding, Green frowned. In my office. Yes, sir. Drew went directly to Green's office. He waited until Green shut the door and was seated before taking a seat for himself. Any update in your case? Green asked. Drew was just glad Green was going to ignore his comment earlier. Nothing. The only route I have left is for them to contact me. All I can do is sit and wait. I've decided to up the ante a little. We'll say that we've found the truck, Green let him know. Mrs. Ramsley has been very cooperative and will continue to do press releases for us. Hopefully the gang would call. Drew desperately wanted them to. He was not going to get a good night's sleep until Max was out of his apartment. Even the earplugs he had bought were not cutting it. I tell you, that woman is the best thing that ever happened to me. Max sighed as he got off the phone with Paget. They had been talking for nearly an hour. It had taken ten minutes of I love you and I miss you more junk for them to finally get off the phone. Drew was ready to throw up. He needed something masculine to happen because all this gooey love stuff was enough to make a man doubt his sanity. Drew switched on the television to the game. He grabbed two beers, giving one to Max, and settled on the couch. "'Have you ever been in love?' asked Max. Drew looked upward and silently asked God how long he was going to have to put up with this. "'No. You are missing out,' Max sighed as he put his feet up on the coffee table. "'So I've been told.' Drew did not want to have this conversation. They were not buddies. They were barely related. All Drew wanted to do was watch the game in peace. It was the best that Max could give him after having to listen him blather on to his wife for the past hour. It is the best, Max insisted happily. You don't really think so. Then one day you meet the one, and nothing is the same without her. Hmm. Drew made a noncommittal sound, hoping Max would shut up. I mean, you just see her, and it hits you. She is the one that you are going to spend the rest of your life with. Max smiled in satisfaction. From that moment onward, you are totally committed. Committed was right, Drew thought darkly. To an asylum. Drew did not think it was going to be like that for him. He was far too practical and cynical to do this falling in love junk. Certainly not at first sight. Max might be naive enough for that, but not Drew. He ignored the image of Bethany Searson his mind brought forward. It was all the crazy talk that made his brain think of her, nothing more. Probably just a reminder that he promised to look up the boat name, something he had not gotten around to just yet. He ignored Max and resolutely watched the game. I miss her, Max said suddenly. How can you miss her? Drew gave Max an incredulous look. You were on the phone with her for an hour. Max sighed. I know. It's just not the same. Drew's cell phone rang. It was an unlisted number. Hello? He put it to his ear in anticipation. It could be a survey or someone wanting to clean his ducks. Drew did not care. Anything to escape the guy beside him on the couch. He could go ten rounds with a telephone scammer right now if it got him some space from Max. Harley, it's Sam here, answered Sam. I'm setting up a meeting. When and where? asked Drew, feeling thankful. Finally, he was getting somewhere. Maybe he would be able to kick Max out of his apartment soon. You sound a little eager. Sam hesitated. Drew lowered his voice a little in volume for effect, giving Max a dark glance. My girlfriend is talking about love and commitment. I'd like to get away from her for a little while. Sam laughed. Time to jump the broad. No kidding, muttered Drew. Lakeside docks, two in the morning. We've got a boat to unload. Sam gave him the information. Goal says you've been upgraded to help. A thank you for taking care of our visitor the other day. Anything else I can do, you just let me know, promised Drew. Will do, Sam ended the call. 
Was that a call from the drug guys? Max asked curiously. Yes. Drew grinned. It was going to be a good day. All he had to do was set it up and they would have the drop boat. Then Max could go home and Drew could sleep like a regular human being again. Things were looking up. Bethany gave Martha a small smile as the housekeeper set down the last of the serving dishes for the Sunday luncheon. Bethany sat at her regular seat as her parents took their seats at the opulently set table. "'How have things been going this week?' Constance asked as she laid her napkin across her lap. It was the same question every week. "'How have things been? Was she dating anyone? How was her therapy going? Did she think she was making any progress?' Was Bethany still enjoying her position with the symphony? Did she really want to work with those children? Was she not worried she might gain a disease from them? Then would come the suggestions. There's a lovely young man, a son of one of her father's clients. You would make such a nice couple. Or, if you drop the dance classes, you might have some time to meet someone suitable. Because all a woman was good for was getting married, Bethany thought wryly. It was not that she did not want to get married and have a family. She did. However, Bethany wanted a relationship built on love and friendship, one where she could feel like the heroine of all those silly romance novels she had a bad habit of reading. Kind of like how Drew Colburn had made her feel when he carried her down the marina walkway. Bethany tried to ignore the flutterings the memory aroused. Drew was hero material. He was hard around the edges, handsome, strong, and a man on a mission. He made her heart beat a little too fast and her mouth dry. However, Bethany had the impression he was not exactly enthused by her. Her parents would hate him. Somehow, that made the idea of Drew even more attractive. Which was odd, because Bethany was not a teenager trying to rebel. She was in her thirties, for pity's sake. Then again, she had been lying like a teenager might lately. Reggie had been at her for details on who she was dating. Before she knew it, Bethany had supplied Drew's name. She had been mooning over him ever since he had carried her off that boat, so he had been on her mind when Reggie started hounding her for information about her new fellow. Making Drew her pretend boyfriend was silly and immature. Bethany regretted it instantly and resolved to pretend to dump him at the earliest opportunity. She would just have to tell Reggie that she was not interested in him. It was not going to be easy, but it was the truth. Bethany? Her mother gently prodded Bethany verbally to pay attention to the conversation. I had a therapy session at the pool, Bethany informed them suddenly. She did not need another reprimand for not paying attention. Her mother tended to wax long when she was lecturing. Bethany cut up her veal cutlet into tiny pieces. Dr. Ishman hoped that it would help trigger my memories. I don't think that I like this new doctor of yours. Her father, Ted, frowned. I cannot see how bringing up your childhood is going to help you. This was also a familiar theme. Her father not wishing Bethany to exert herself in any way emotionally. He was worried that she might harm herself further. I think it's working, Bethany remarked, keeping her tone as mild as possible. I went to the marina as well. Do you know anyone who might have owned a boat called Sweet Bethany? We used to own a yacht called Sweet Bethany, didn't we, Ted? Constance looked over at her husband. That was years ago. Ted coughed and took a big swallow of water. We sold it. There was no point in keeping it since you were afraid of the water. I was not always afraid. Bethany wondered if she was talking about her fear of water or just in general. She lived so much of her life in a protected cocoon. Drugged and wary, always told what she had to be careful. Max Ramsley told me I used to love the water at the beach. We went to the Ramsley Beach House on occasion. At least, that was what Max said. You used to love the water, Constant replied thoughtfully. I always wondered what happened to change that. We agreed. Ted pointed his fork at both of them. We agreed that you should let this go, Bethany. It will only harm you further trying to delve into memories that may or may not exist. There are so many studies about how this could be harmful to you, to your mental health. We have worked so hard to get you to the point of where you are today, and I do not see why you would want to jeopardize that. 
Bethany sighed and pushed her green beans around on her plate. Her parents always treated her like she was fragile and could shatter at any moment. I just want to know what happened. Is that really so bad? Sweetheart. Ted gave her a smile and spoke in a tone that made Bethany feel like she was ten years old again. It was years ago. Leave it alone. Bethany pressed her lips together at the admonishment. She did not know why her father gave such resistance to the idea of her recovering her childhood memories. She had learned one thing today. The boat was her father's. Something had happened on that boat. Unless it was like Drew had mentioned, that sometimes memories could get mixed up and she had substituted the name of her father's boat because that's what her mind knew. Bethany pushed the beans around and felt confused. She would have to call Dr. Irshman and discuss it with her. I was talking to Betty Milton and she mentioned her son Earl needs a date for the annual spring benefit. Constance smiled resolutely, trying to steer the conversation elsewhere. The Miltons? Really? Ted shook his head. I was talking to Mayor Bailey the other day, and his son, Trenton, is looking for a good woman. Trenton is a bit arrogant, don't you think? Constant gave Ted a significant look. I do not believe that he would suit our Bethany. And the Miltons would? Ted obviously thought they were a step down in the world. Ted, sighed Constance, we are running out of eligible gentlemen. Earl is a very nice man. He would treat our Bethany well. Bethany ate a green bean. They would go on debating the merits of whom to invite to date Bethany. Her mother would probably win. Bethany had never met Earl Milton, but if the grasping Betty Milton was anything to go by, the date was not going to go well. Bethany did not like green beans, she reflected. She ate them because it was expected of her. So many things were expected of her, and she went along with them, compliant and allowing things to happen just because her parents wished it. Part of Bethany knew it was the medication she had been on. Part of it was how she had been raised, like she could not make any but the most basic decisions for herself, that anything else would be too taxing for her. She wondered what her parents might say about Drew Colburn. They would quickly dismiss him out of hand over his profession and status in life. Bethany frowned. I met a police officer, a detective, actually. Ted and Constance stopped talking and looked at her with interest. Not good interest, either. He looks an awful lot like Maxwell Ramsley. In fact, they could be twins, they look so much alike. Bethany looked at her father. Did Mr. Ramsley have an affair? Ted cleared his throat uncomfortably. What a thing to ask. I'm sure it's just a coincidence. Constance tried to smooth the moment over. They say everyone has a look-alike out there. Why would you be talking to a detective? frowned Ted. He's going to help me look into some of my memories, Bethany said calmly. I met him at the marina. He has been very helpful. I'll bet he has, scowled Ted. He probably knows money when he sees it. Bethany, you need to stop this. Let it go. I do not want you seeing this detective ever again. He is just going to try to scam you. Do I make myself clear? He's trying to help. Bethany frowned at her father's resistance. You're not seeing him again. End of discussion. Ted put his napkin on his plate and stood. There is nothing to be going to the police about. You are wasting their time. The only thing this detective is thinking of is trying to get money out of a confused little rich girl. Bethany watched Ted leave the room. She set down her fork. She was not hungry anyways. I hear Earl has shares in oil companies. Constance smiled as she changed the subject. Bethany sighed and let her mother ramble on about Earl Milton's prospects. Soon enough, Constance would be setting Bethany up with the Miltons and their oil fortune. Bethany supposed it was better than a pretended relationship with a guy who seemed irritated by her very existence. Earl Milton was as boring as lint. He was slightly chubby, had a comb over for his balding crown, and was otherwise nondescript. Bethany was used to the men in her life being confident and slightly condescending. They usually liked to talk about themselves and steer the tone of the evening. All Bethany generally had to do was look pretty and smile while gracing their arm while the man of the moment took care of the entire evening. Earl did not know how. He deferred everything to her. He had no confidence. He smiled in an over-eager, puppyish way. Earl constantly steered the conversation to her. 
He ordered what she ordered for dinner. He agreed with everything she said. Bethany had the feeling that their roles were a little reversed. It was discomforting. It did not help that his mother was at the benefit, watching Earl and Bethany's every move. Betty Milton was like a hawk, waiting to see what sort of mouse Bethany was. No wonder Earl was weak. She should not think that way. Earl was perfectly nice. He was just far too nice. Bethany sighed. People were giving them pitying looks. It was hard to say who the pity was for. Bethany, for saddling herself with Earl and Betty, or Earl, for saddling himself with the known freak. Bethany knew what polite society called her behind her back. She was the one who was a little mentally deficient and odd. Everyone knew she was different. For years she had been on the fringes of high society, the girl who did not feel emotions, who was not quite the same, who did not have friends. Bethany had been tolerated because she was a Searson. "'Would you like another coffee?' Earl asked her readily. "'I'll summon the waiter if you wish.' "'No, thank you.' Bethany gave him a wan smile. I would rather not be awake all night. They have decaf, he supplied. I will get you one. Earl waved his hand around, and Bethany closed her eyes at the sight. Was this how it was going to be? Looking across the breakfast table at Earl Milton, fetching her coffee at the slightest provocation. She shuddered. Milton babies. Eager, chubby-faced cherubs all wanting to please someone. Bethany tried not to feel sick. It was not going to work out. She was not going to date Earl Milton. Usually, it was the guys dumping her, not the other way around. Bethany opened her eyes and allowed the waiter to pour her another cup of coffee as the silent auction continued. She was not going to drink it, but at least Earl felt better for having served her. She had an appointment with Dr. Ershman tomorrow. Maybe the psychiatrist would get a kick out of this. It was a little funny, Bethany supposed. "'Do you like that particular piece of art?' asked Earl. He craned his neck over the crowd as a man showcased a painting. "'I could put a bit in for you.' "'Thank you, but I really do not need anything.' Bethany smiled to soften her response. She worried that Earl really would purchase the item for her. He seemed pathetically eager to please. Bethany could not help but compare him to Drew. She did not think the detective would ever find himself at a boring art benefit. He probably did not go to charity events at all. He seemed like the type who went to bars and watched the game. She had never been to a bar. It was something she should put on her to-do list. Bethany had started a to-do list when she was dating Noah Ramsley. Noah had been a good friend. They had explored all sorts of new things, from curling, which neither of them was any good at, to her first hockey game. Bethany had enjoyed the new experiences. Eventually, she and Noah had just remained friends. Noah was now married to a lovely woman named Elle, and they had five boys. Noah had been in love with Elle the entire time that he had dated Bethany. Bethany had been glad to help him by breaking up and allowing him to chase the woman that he really wanted, even if it had made her feel a little sad that she was not the object of his affections. She was not the object of anyone's affections. Bethany wanted to be loved with a yearning like Noah had for Elle. Bethany sighed and wondered if Earl would be offended if she checked the score of the Yankees game. She had become a fan since dating Noah, something she suspected her mother would not be impressed with. Bethany had the feeling Earl would not care. He would probably try to become a fan, too, just because she was one. Earl? Bethany tilted her head and looked at him. What do you want to do? Earl cleared his throat nervously. What do you mean? What do you want to do? I am asking you, gently said Bethany. What do you want to do? Tonight? Tomorrow? But the rest of your life? If you could do anything, what would you like to do? Earl blinked and thought about it like it was a foreign concept. I'm not sure what you mean. You have money. You have your health. Bethany pointed out. Have you always wanted to do something? Go somewhere? be something you're only limited by yourself i suppose i might he took a breath and let it out what bethany leaned in curious about what was on earl's mind i would move out of my mother's house earl clapped a hand over his mouth 
Do not say anything. I should not have said that. Why not? Bethany asked encouragingly. If that is what you want, then you should do it. My mother has been so good to me. She's the best, and I would hate to disappoint her, Earl whispered. It's just that sometimes... Sometimes, Bethany urged him. I would like a little space. I think if I ever did manage to get married, mother would expect her to move in with us. Earl's eyes got wide. I'm not sure how that would go. Not well, Bethany advised. Do you want to move out tonight? What? Earl was shocked. You cannot be serious. Why not? She shrugged. You have money. You could rent a moving company. Pay them extra and I'm sure someone will do it tonight while your mother is at the benefit. All you need to do is find a place to live. Then I'm sure there are lots of places available on short notice for the right amount of money. Some of them might even be furnished. Oh no, I could not move out tonight. Earl shook his head resolutely. Earl, Bethany put her hand over his in a sign of support. I get the feeling that if you do not move out tonight, you never will. Earl looked at Bethany's hand covering his and took in a shaky breath. He looked into her eyes with wonder. Can I move in with you? Bethany snatched her hand back. On second thought, maybe you should stay with your mother. She takes very good care of you. Earl nodded, a little disappointed, but not really surprised. She does. Bethany looked around with boredom. I am going to visit the little lady's room. What you mean is you're going to leave while you can, Earl said morosely. Truthfully, Bethany just thought she would check the score of the game. However, if Earl was going to give Bethany an out, she would happily take it. Yes, Earl. Have a good night. Night. Earl sipped his coffee. He was used to getting dumped. Bethany gathered her purse and shawl, making her escape. If you enjoyed this chapter of Love and Lies, look for Chapter 6 on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe and hit the little bell so that you get those lovely notifications that more chapters are coming. Happy listening! Chapter 6 Drew parked the Harley and stowed his helmet. He made certain not to scratch his chest where the wire was. It was itchy beneath the tape. It was quiet down by the docks. This was more of an industrial area than the marina his team had staked out. Now there were detectives in discreet positions, waiting to see what boat came forward. They would then track the movements of that boat to find out the identity of the dropship. From there, more arrests would be made, and pressure would be put on the criminals to name their supplier. If it were international, like Green suspected, then the FBI would be called in and the department would have done its job well. Drew might even get a commendation for this. Hopefully he was done with the undercover work. It was not something he enjoyed, trying to lead a dual life. It was dangerous, and potentially put his family in danger as well. The last thing he wanted was something happening to his sister Jana and her kids. It was also part of why he was not in a relationship at the moment. Going undercover carried risks. He did not want to involve anyone in that. Drew shook away the thought and approached the pier. A small group of men were waiting. Harley... Sam said in greeting. Drew nodded to him. Red, Knuckles, and Law were there with Sam. Hendricks was missing, but Drew did not dare ask where the man was. Boat will be here any moment. We need to unload quick. Truck is right there around the corner. Sam pointed to it. Red and Knuckles will take the truck to the new location. Harley will follow them to help split up the product. We need to go out early tomorrow morning. Law oh, and I are going on the boat. There's a problem with a local that needs to be dealt with. What problem could anyone have with us? Drew made it sound like a small joke. He smiled and nudged Knuckles. Knuckles grinned. He thinks we should get a cup for keeping his mouth shut. Drew shook his head. Now, if he were willing to do some heavy lifting, that might be different. Drew wondered where Goals was in all of this. The man seemed to be content to make Sam manage everything. Drew hoped that when they arrested everyone tonight, that Sam would talk and give his boss up. It would be disappointing if he did not. They watched a boat coast up to the pier. There's our man, Sam nodded. Get the forklift, Knuckles. Knuckles left to bring out the rented piece of equipment. 
red dragged over a wooden pallet, dropping it down so they could put the barrels on it. The forklift already had chains on it, and Knuckles got as close to the edge of the pier as he dared. Sam and Drew jumped on the boat. They manhandled the barrels to the side of the deck, securing one at a time to the chains with come-along straps. The forklift raised the barrel up and to the dock over the pallet where Red and Law guided it down, releasing it from the straps. Twelve barrels later and the three pallets filled, they were done. The chains were unhooked from the forklift and the pallets were put on the back of the rented truck. It was a smooth enough operation. Knuckles and Red jumped into the truck. Sam and Law went on the boat, presumably to deal with the person who wanted to try to blackmail the criminal operation. Drew got on his Harley and was ready to go when a couple of men sprang from the shadows, guns drawn, yelling, Freeze! Police! He held up his hands in surrender. The plan that they had laid out at the station, Drew would get arrested along with the rest of the members of the gang. Each would be held in separate cells, preferably where they could not even see one another, so that they would not realize that Drew was missing once they were processed at the police station. Then, if they needed to resurrect Harley, Drew's cover story, for any reason, they would be able to say that Harley had gotten out on bail and skipped his court appearance. Drew let Monroe pull his arms behind his back and cuff him. He could see Red and Knuckles getting the same treatment at the truck. Monroe read him his rights while Colby, Tony, and Jacobson secured the boat, arresting Sam, Law, and the stranger who had been driving the boat. Miguel opened the back of the truck, hopping up and opening one of the barrels, shining a flashlight down in it. He pulled out a small test kit and tested the contents of the barrel. Monroe pushed Drew into the back of a cop car. He shut the door on Drew, leaving Drew to look out the window. Miguel shook his head slightly as he looked at Drew, and that was when Drew knew something was not right. Knuckles and Red were pushed into the back seat of the cruiser with Drew, Monroe shutting the door. Guess the law was right, Knuckles looked at Drew with contempt. We got us a rat. What are you talking about? Drew's stomach bottomed out as he bluffed. He frowned at Knuckles. You, Knuckles growled. Law checked you out. I don't know what you're talking about. Drew stated flatly. Whatever Law thinks is going on, he should have let me know so I can answer to it. Drew snorted. Sure thing, Detective Colburn. Drew sucked in a breath. His cover was blown. There was no point in denying it or trying to bluff his way through this. He was surprised that he was not a body floating in the river. How did he know? After we told him about you looking just like that missing dude, Max Ramsley, he looked you up. Red supplied dryly. It wasn't difficult. Why didn't you just kill me? Drew asked softly. He was still wearing the wire. Maybe you could salvage something out of this. What? Go to prison? For murdering a cop? Knuckles laughed. You got nothing on us, Colburn. We are going to walk. We have twelve barrels of heroin, scowled Drew. I don't call that nothing. Do you? Do you think that's what you have? snickered Red. Some detective you are. Drew looked at them uncertainly. Miguel had tested the white powder. Drew looked back at the cops who were standing near the back of the rental trucks, discussing something heatedly. This was not right. He remembered Miguel giving him a look and shaking his head a quick negative. Something was not right about the powder. Drew saw a smudge of the white powder on the right knee of his jeans. He leaned over, sniffing it. Drew gave it a quick lick. Icing sugar, Drew said shortly. Knuckles and Red just laughed. Drew slumped down in the back seat. He looked at Red. What about the guy who was trying to get a cut for his silence? What about him? Red grinned. Sam threatened him, stated Drew flatly. Did he? Red raised an eyebrow and looked at Knuckles. Did Sam threaten anyone, Knuckles? Can't say he did, chuckled Knuckles. Drew thought back to the wording of what Sam had used. He had said they would have to deal with the guy. No, no specific threats had been made. Certainly nothing that would hold up in a court of law. Drew leaned his head back and closed his eyes. His career was about to go down the toilet. He had been following these goons around for eight months. Finally thought he was in, and now he had nothing to show for all his efforts. Even the pictures Drew managed to snap on his phone at the abandoned building meant nothing. They did not prove that that was heroin versus icing sugar. No judge was going to convict on the pictures alone. 
he wondered how bad the fallout was going to be. The only silver lining he could see was the fact that he would now kick Max Ramsley out of his apartment. Drew ignored Knuckles and Red. Monroe got in the car. He gave them all an unhappy look before starting the engine and driving them to the police station. Monroe took Drew out of the car with two other officers to book Red and Knuckles. Drew was taken to Green's office and uncuffed. Green glared at Drew. Shut the door after yourself, Monroe. This was not going to go well, Drew reflected as Moreau quickly left. You want to tell me why I just wasted the department's resources on icing sugar? growled Green. Drew sighed. Law figured it out. He knew it was a cop and staged everything tonight. He expected the bust. How did he learn that you were a cop? Green demanded of Drew. He heard from the guys how much Max Ramsley and I look alike. Drew absently scratched at his chest. Then he lifted his shirt and pulled off the wire and tape, tossing them on Green's desk. Law did a search. My last name is hyphenated Colburn Ramsley. Obviously, it came up somewhere, and voila, Law knew everything. As a result, we've got nothing. We're going to take some samples from the barrels, but it looks like it is all just icing sugar. Green sat down. Drew almost sat, but Green barked, Did I say you could sit? No, sir. Drew straightened up. Eight months of undercover work blown in one night. Green shook his head in regret. Colburn, you can cut Ramsley loose. He can go home. We'll magically find him tomorrow and have a press conference. Colby is due for a little recognition. Drew swallowed down that bitter pill. It should have been his announcement. It should have been credible arrests and accommodation. Instead, it was a mess. You should see what tomorrow's press is going to be. Green shoved a tabloid at Drew. It was a proof. Has Max Ramsley lost his mind? Read the caption. Sightings of the missing man all over the city with new tattoos and a facial scar. Wife wonders if he has amnesia. Pleads for him to return home. It had all sorts of cell phone pictures of him, snapped by the eager public willing to sell a picture to the tabloids. Sterling Denver was outdoing herself in selling junk. Whatever. It does not signify, said Drew. You're off undercover. You're a liability there, grimaced Green. I'm putting you on two weeks of unpaid suspension. Boss, this was not my fault, protested Drew. How was I supposed to know that law was on to me? I can make it a month, Green said sharply. I have to go through the mayor tomorrow and make an accounting of this. Budget meetings are coming up. You are lucky I do not throw you back to foot patrol. Yes, sir. Drew squelched any urge to defend himself. It would not help when Green was in this mood. Get out of my office. Green pointed to the door. Yes, sir. Drew grabbed the wire and left. He turned the recording device over to Monroe. That bad? Monroe sympathized. I'm off for the next two weeks, shrugged Drew. He took a deep breath to steady his temper. Unpaid leave. Monroe whistled. Sorry, man. What are you going to do with the goon squad? Drew referred to the men that they had arrested tonight. Hold them for 24 hours, then let them go. Can't charge them with anything except maybe importing without a license. Monroe sighed. What a night. Press a little on Law, would you? He's the one who figured out I am a detective. I doubt he'll crack, but I would take it as a personal favor if you make his next few hours really annoying, requested Drew. Done and done, nodded Monroe. Thanks. Drew gave Monroe a pat on the back before he went to his desk. He really did not need anything, but Drew wanted to put his stuff away. Two weeks was a long time to be away. Plus, he should write up a report and file it before he left for the night. Drew sat down and looked at the report he had left out from Bethany Searson. He really should look up that boat before he left. Drew did not like leaving loose ends, so he would make certain to look into it. Not that he expected to find anything. Drew sighed again. He was disappointed in himself. He should have seen some sign that this was a setup. He had been too eager for the operation, and it had bitten him hard. Drew logged into his computer and started the tedious task of filling out a report. Bethany was confused. I thought you said we were making progress. We are. Dr. Ershman agreed cautiously. However, I am worried about the strong emotions you displayed while in the pool. 
I am also concerned that you chose to try to trigger the memories on your own at the marina. It worked, insisted Bethany. I keep remembering new details. Bethany, your progress needs to be done in a supervised setting. Otherwise, you could be introducing other elements and thinking that they are memories. There is a danger of creating false memories. Dr. Ershman set down a container with a pill in it. I think you need to slow down. We should also adjust your medications again. I do not want to slow down, Bethany said stubbornly. The whole point of this is to find out what happened. We both want to achieve that goal. Dr. Ershman grabbed a glass of water from the sideboard and set it down on the table with the pill in front of Bethany. I would like to put you in a sedative state. I will record the session and we can go over your memories. I will not make any suggestions, just let you lead the conversation. That way we can see if your memories truly match what you have recently discovered. I thought you said that this was too risky. Bethany frowned as she recalled the early conversation when Bethany had first started coming to the psychiatrist, that you did not feel the science was sound in such a practice. Normally I do not like to use this process, but you've been pushing your limits, Bethany. It is time to find out what is real and what is not in your memories, explained Dr. Ershman. Otherwise you will never know for certain. What is it? Bethany eyed the pill with some trepidation. She had worked so hard to clear her mind that she really did not want to take a pill to dull it. Just a lorazepam. It will help you relax. Dr. Ershman grabbed a pad and paper and pen. She sat down and watched Bethany expectantly. You do want to know what happened, right? Bethany looked at the little white pill. She desperately wanted to know. Taking a deep breath, Bethany picked it up with the water and swallowed it. Drew glared at the television with a vicious scowl. Colby had not only gotten some recognition, he had his name and face plastered all over the national news. According to the official report, Colby had found Max in the building that was supposed to be demolished. A rotting floor had collapsed and Max had supposedly been stuck there for days. It was a junk story, unbelievable, but the media was eating it up. Paget stood by Max's side as they thanked Detective Colby for going the extra mile and looking for him. Everyone was loving a happy ending. It sickened him. Drew shut off the television and tried Bethany's phone number again. He had called a few times, but she had not picked up. With a sigh, he grabbed his coat and keys for the truck. He needed to get out of this apartment before he went stir-crazy. Drew would think that he should be happy to have Max out of his place, yet for some reason it felt a little empty. Before long, Drew knocked on the door to Bethany's condo. There was something that had been bugging him about what she had said at the police station, and he needed to figure it out. Drew had looked up the boat Sweet Bethany. Sure enough, there had been a boat named that. It was owned by Ted Searson, father of Bethany Searson. Drew figured she probably had mixed memories, stealing from what was real with one memory and adding to it with another. The boat had never been involved in any known criminal activities, nor had her father Ted. However, Bethany had said she had few, if any, memories from her childhood. She did not remember things like learning how to ride a bicycle, the first day of school, getting money from the tooth fairy. These were all rites of passage memories that she did not have. Her parents had put her in therapy, and she had been heavily drugged since childhood. Drew had called her former doctors to confirm when psychiatric treatments started. It was shortly after her eighth birthday. Not long after the treatment started, Ted sold the boat. The timing of which made Drew a little suspicious. He wanted to go over Bethany's story again to see if he might have missed any details. Drew was going to take this very seriously now. It might not have been the drugs on the boat, but something had happened. Drew knew it in his gut, and since he was suspended, it was not like he did not have the time to do a little investigating. Drew told himself it was not because he wanted to see her again. He knocked a second time and waited. Drew could hear his movement inside, but it took another minute before the door opened. Hi. Hi. He frowned as he saw her. Bethany was wearing yoga pants and a sweatshirt. What surprised him was the food stains on the shirt. Her hair was greasy. She did not have any makeup on. For a woman who had been immaculate coming to the station just to fill out a report, it did not make sense. 
Drew immediately felt suspicious. She seemed sleepy. Can I help you? He looked at her in surprise. Bethany, do you know who I am? She stared at him in incomprehension. Her eyes and manner were entirely vacant. Her voice came out drowsily. I'm not sure. Detective Andrew Colburn, he reminded her. We talked at the police station a few times. Oh, she blinked in slow motion. It was like her mind was pushing through a fog just to think. What are you on? Drew pushed past her into the condo. It was spotless in the hall and living room. The kitchen smelled like something had been left out and rotting for a few days. He had a quick look and was surprised to see the door of the fridge wide open. The carton of milk on the counter had obviously turned sour. There were a bunch of prescription medications on the table. He counted at least eight bottles there. I'm at the door, Bethany said slowly. Why? Drew turned around. There she was, confused and staring into the hallway. A bad feeling settled into his gut. Drew grabbed a plastic bag and put all her medications into it, careful to use another bag to preserve fingerprints. He added what he found in the bedroom and bathroom, looking for anything else that was not prescription. What he found were thirty bottles of prescription medications, all prescribed within the last three months, most prescribed within the last week. It was crazy, the amount of pills that she had. He coaxed Bethany into the bedroom and helped her change into a clean shirt, jeans, socks, and shoes. She was cooperative, but entirely mentally vacant. She asked him once who he was. Then she told him she remembered that he was the guy who was not Max. She smiled brilliantly like she had discovered the answer to everything. Drew wondered what he was going to do with her. He could bring her to the hospital. It was obvious somewhere someone had just given her too many medications. Yet a suspicious warning bell sounded in his head. There were three different doctors on her medications. Over half the bottles had been prescribed by one doctor in particular, all within the past three days. After Bethany had been trying to understand what had happened to her regarding the drugs she thought she had seen years ago, a psychiatrist that was often on call to the hospital. What he needed was a second medical opinion, Drew decided. He pulled out his phone and called Mercy Hospital. Drew grimaced as he identified himself to the night nurse. Detective Andrew Colburn, I'm looking for the nurse who treated me about six months ago, he said. I did not catch her name, and she helped to save my life. She was short, maybe just over five feet tall, had dimples, looks impossibly young. Dark blonde hair? You mean Kelly, the nurse gushed. I remember. You're the guy who collapsed in the parking lot. That would be me, Drew bit back his irritation. I would like to thank her. Do you happen to have her phone number? We can't give that information out, the nurse said regretfully. Even if we could, Kelly is no longer working at Mercy Hospital. What happened? he asked in surprise. You got her fired, she hurried to explain. Well, not you, really. But Kelly disobeyed hospital policy by going to the parking lot to find you. She lost her job over it. That is terrible. Drew tried to think about how else he might get a second medical opinion. Thanks for letting me know. He hung up on the nurse's response and looked at Bethany, who was staring at a painting on the wall. "'When did you get tattooed, Max?' Kelly had said when she saw him at the hospital that day. That meant she knew Max Ramsley, which meant Max Ramsley knew Kelly. Drew grabbed his wallet to find Max's business card, but something small caught his eye. If he had not seen small cameras planted before and had not put a few in place himself— he never would have guessed that the video recorder was there. Drew immediately turned and shoved his wallet back into his pocket. There is no way to do this without alerting whoever was watching. Soon they would be on to him anyways. Drew used his phone to snap a photo of the camera. With a hand he urged Bethany to her feet. At the foyer he slipped a coat onto her, doing up the zipper like she was a child. He packed her overnight bag, making sure to get the drugs, her purse, and keys. Drew took a quick look through the apartment, snapping photos before he locked the door after them and coached her into his truck. It was not hard. He scowled at the feeling that she had no idea what was going on. It put a bad sensation into his stomach, 
and Drew wondered that any one without any morals could do to her in this state. Hopefully the audio on the camera weren't good enough to pick up Kelly's name. He needed to contact her, but now he felt paranoid. Someone had gone through great lengths to bug Bethany's apartment. His trained eye had spotted two other cameras, and he knew there had to be more. Whoever had put them in had done a bit of a sloppy job. Then again, with Bethany so drugged, they could have set a full-size old-school camcorder on the kitchen table, and she would have not understood what was happening. He paid a parking meter and pulled Bethany from the truck, bringing her bag. Drew had to get buzzed in. He chose to get the lobby staff to do it, showing off his badge. He did not bother to admire the posh interior of the downtown condo. He was more concerned about Bethany. Drew barely had to knock before a surprise Max Ramsley opened the door. Did you miss me? Max grinned as he saw Drew. Drew did not bother with the pleasantries. He knew that Max and Bethany were acquainted from their previous conversations. Have you ever seen her like this? Aye, Bethany. Max's smile faded as he watched Bethany carefully. It took her a moment to even notice him or his extended hand. She gracefully put her hand in Max's. Are there two of you? Excuse me? Max asked, starting to get worried. Bethany looked at Drew. Two Maxes. I am Drew, remember? Detective Andrew Colburn? Drew frowned at Bethany. He was distracted as he spotted two other men in the apartment. It was obvious they were related to Max. Did we come at a bad time? I need your help. What happened to her? Max was concerned. Beth, come here and have a seat at the table. Okay. She allowed herself to be led and seated by Drew. Who are you? Noah scowled at the new arrivals. What did you do to Beth? Nothing. I found her like this. Drew gave them a sharp glare. He's a cop. Max defended him. He saved my life. Remember, I was just telling you about that. What is going on? Drew directed the question to Max. He knew from his research who Michael and Noah Ramsley were. He did not have to ask. Michael and Noah? This is Andrew. Max made the introductions proudly. Our other brother. Noah just about spit out his teeth. He was so shocked. Our what? I was just telling them about my exciting day when you knocked, Max explained to Drew. He grinned at Noah and Michael. He's our other brother. Well, half-brother. Isn't it cool? No, exploded Noah. It is not cool. That would mean Dad had an affair. Max shrugged and nodded. Yep. This is crazy. Noah looked at Michael and paused in shock at his brother's expression. Suddenly, he burst out angrily. You knew. Michael rubbed a hand over his face and sighed. He gave a short nod. Drew was not a surprise to Michael, since he knew all about David's indiscretions. "'You knew, and you didn't tell us?' Max asked, a little offended. Noah looked ready to tear his hair out when Michael nodded again. "'Why?' Michael began a series of hand gestures and sign language. At least, that's what Drew thought it was. It was not traditional sign language that he understood thanks to a deaf neighbor growing up. "'He doesn't speak?' Max nodded and talked quietly to Drew as he watched Michael's explanation. He can, but he gets it mixed up. It's a condition from an operation that he had. He's not deaf, and he understands everything perfectly, so do not treat him like he's dumb. It was obvious to Drew that Max felt protected above their older brother because of his disability. Wasn't going to. What is he saying? That he had reasons for not telling us? Max shook his head in wonder, like trying to protect the two of us. From what? Drew questioned. From the disappointment of her father. Plus, according to Michael, some of our newfound relatives might not be the best of people. Max shrugged. I guess it's not like some of them would not try to take advantage of the situation. Just how many new siblings do we have? Michael looked at Max a little guiltily. You mean there's more than just him? Noah pointed. Well, I have got a sister and a brother, Drew said dryly. More than that? asked Max. Michael gave another short nod. How many? Noah wanted to know. Just how many other kids does Dad have? How many affairs did he have? This is going to devastate Mom. Michael immediately put a finger to his lips in a universal shush gesture. She has to know, Max said reasonably. It's not like we can hide this. Why not? Noah threw his hands in the air. Michael's been hiding it for how long? 
Michael grimaced. I managed to get Morgan to sleep despite all the noise. A woman came into the room. She paused in surprise, looking at Drew. Oh, wow, you do look so much alike. So I have been told, Drew said dryly. This is my wife, Paget. Max introduced her. Paget, this is Drew. This is the guy that saved my life. Thank you so much for doing that. Paget took his hand in greeting. If you ever need anything, please let us know. What I need is Kelly's phone number. Drew hauled out the bag of prescription drugs and set it on the table. She's a nurse that used to work at Mercy. I want a second opinion on all these medications that have been prescribed for Bethany, especially the ones that have been issued in the last three days. I understand that you know her? That's a lot of pills, Paget said faintly as Noah picked a few of the containers out of the bag and started looking at them. Max searched through his phone, coming up with the contact information. Here. A cell phone trilled, and Bethany automatically reached in her coat pocket, pulling it out. She clicked off the alarm. She grabbed a bag of drugs in confusion. I don't know which ones I'm supposed to take. None of them. Drew pulled the bag away from her. No, Bethany protested. She furrowed her brows together. The alarm went off. It is time to take my pills. They were on the kitchen table, but now they're not. I don't know where I am. Where am I? Bethany? Drew pulled out a chair and sat in front of her. You don't need to take any pills. I have to. Bethany began to be agitated. She bit her lip as her body trembled. I need to take my pills on time. Why? he asked softly. What happens if you do not take them? She shook her head and looked around her, lost. I don't know. Something bad? Something bad is going to happen if you don't take your pills? Drew asked gently, trying to draw out more details from her. Bethany nodded. She began to sob. I cannot remember. I'm so scared, but I cannot remember. What is going to happen? He questioned her, but she just shook her head and kept crying. Noah gave Drew a look of warning as he crouched beside her, putting a hand on her knee. It's okay, Beth. We're right here, and nothing bad is going to happen. I promise. Paget set down three white tablets and a glass of water. Here, Bethany. There are your pills. You should take them now. Bethany gratefully scooped them up and swallowed as Paget flashed the concerned group of men the container of Tic Tacs that she had substituted. What is going on? Max frowned in concern. That is what I hope to find out. Drew used Max's proffered phone and put the call on speaker as he dialed Kelly's number. It rang twice before a child picked up. You have reached Kelly Ramsley's phone. How can I direct your call? Caden, we need to speak to Kelly, said Max. It's Max Ramsley. Hey, Max. I'll get her, replied Caden. Mom! Phone! A moment later, they could hear Kelly. Hello? Kelly, this is Andrew Colburn. Drew identified himself. Hey! I always wondered what happened. Kelly said excitedly. Are you okay? Did you recover fully from the stabbing? I'm fine, Drew said shortly, ignoring the surprised looks he received from the others in the room. I'm a detective with the local police department. I wanted to ask you a couple of questions since you are a nurse and should have some expertise on medications. Okay, she consented. I'm not a doctor, but I will help if I can. Great. Drew asked her if she knew the doctors that had prescribed the medications and what her opinion was of them. The one doctor I don't know. He must be in private practice or at another hospital. The other two doctors consult at Mercy Hospital, confirmed Kelly. To be totally honest, I think Dr. Mendez is a drug pusher. He really does not do any therapies, nor does he appear to be overly concerned about his patients. Dr. Holly Ershman is a good doctor. She cares about her patients and puts in the extra effort. She has a good reputation. Drew had sorted out the containers of medications. She is major prescriber of patient I am investigating. In fact, she prescribed nine different medications in just the past three days for this one person. That does not sound like her. Kelly sounded surprised. Can you receive picture texts? He asked. I'd like to show you what has been prescribed and get your take on what it is supposed to do for the patient. Okay, Kelly agreed. Drew began to send her pictures of each container, starting with the most recent prescriptions and their dosages. I divided them up based on their optimal results, Noah said of the groupings he had made. 
Most of these are sedative in nature. The patient is on all of that? Kelly's tone conveyed her disbelief. At those doses? Yes. Those are all in the last three days. Six weeks ago, she was prescribed. Drew continued with the medications, taking pictures and sending them. Then Dr. Mendez prescribed. He finished with the first doctor's prescriptions and waited to see what Kelly would say. This makes absolutely no sense, she said, confused. What do you mean, Tinkerbell? Drew absently used the nickname he had given her at the hospital when he first met her. The first doctor was giving your patient a small regulated dose of anti-anxiety medications, some mood blockers, some antidepressants. Not exactly something to be worried about, but maybe not the best combination of drugs, as they could be known to make people a little unemotional, advised Kelly. Dr. Mendez upped the doses of certain drugs and lowered the other ones. I would say your patient was fully functioning under his care, but still might not have the capacity of feeling. They would feel numb. It suggests the patient might have some psychiatric issues, like memory trauma with those types of meds. With those types of medications, the patient was likely trying to avoid the traumatic memories, and the drugs would suppress long-term memories, advised Noah. At Drew's surprised look, he explained, I head up the scientific research division at Ramsey Pharmaceuticals. What about Dr. Ershman? Drew asked Kelly, who's particularly interested in the most recent medications. And that is where it gets weird. She sounded confused through the phone line. At first, Dr. Ershman clears away all the old drugs. She starts a vitamin routine and a drug that is known to enhance memory. I've seen it used in dementia or Alzheimer's patients with good results. On someone younger, it would be used to try to stimulate old or buried memories, probably. With all the old drugs gone, the patient should have a clear head, and their emotions should be more prominent. That's a good thing, right? questioned Max. He looked at Bethany in apprehension. She was just sitting and staring at nothing. Maybe, but then it's like a complete turnaround with a prescription from the last three days, a thoughtful Kelly said. I would have to look a couple of them up, but most of these are used in what nurses like to call the zombie cocktail. It's used to make very difficult psych ward patients pliable and easy to handle. At these doses, I would guess your patient was on suicide watch or was extremely violent. What hospital is she in? She's not, said Drew. What do you mean she's not in a hospital? Kelly was astonished. There's no way that anyone should be on the zombie cocktail outside of a clinical setting. Not only is it dangerous medically, they need to be monitored for drug reactions but it's dangerous physically. Patients could chop off an arm and not realize they're bleeding to death or drive a car and kill someone. It is reckless not to have them committed and on this plethora of medications. Please tell me she's at least in private care with 24-hour nursing. I found her alone in her apartment, Drew admitted. Noah cursed and took Bethany's hand. Are they trying to kill her? Kelly was astounded. Privately, Drew wondered if someone was trying to do just that. If they were, it would be connected to her trying to regain her memories. Something happened on that boat, and Drew intended to find out what. Tinkerbell, how long will it take for the drugs to get out of her system? Is it safe for her to go cold turkey? How long do you think she's been on them? questioned Kelly. I saw her three days ago, and she was fine, answered Drew. She's not on anything like this. She was alert. Then she should not have any serious reactions to going without medications. Kelly hesitated. Again, I am not a doctor. If anything seems off or she starts having a reaction, you should get her to a hospital right away. It will probably be a full day or two before she returns to normal. Drew thanked Kelly for her time and expertise before ending the call. You want to tell us how you know Beth and what is really going on here? Noah demanded. Drew glowered at Noah, who was crouched beside Bethany, still holding one of her hands. He did not like it. It should not matter. He barely knew her. Yet he did not like it one bit. She has asked me to investigate a matter for her. Drew was not going to tell this snotty rich man much. I'm a detective. When I could not get a hold of her by phone, I dropped by her apartment and found her like this, all drugged up. Why didn't you just bring her to the hospital? asked Max. Why come here? I think Bethany's life is in danger, sighed Drew. A hospital is a very public setting where it could be difficult to ensure her safety. 
Also, I knew you might have the contact information for Kelly. I wanted a medical opinion on all these prescriptions. Who would want to hurt Beth? Noah questioned angrily. I have an idea. Drew grimaced. It was all connected to the boat, in his opinion. Maybe she should go rest. Mrs. Ramsley, do you have a room where Bethany could lie down? Then I would like to talk to all of you. I need to know more about her childhood, her friends and family, anything that you think might be relevant. Paget moved forward to take Bethany's hand. Beth, would you like to come lay down? Bethany looked at her in confusion. Do I know you? Noah gently turned Bethany's face to look at him. Hey, Beth, you remember me? She gave him a small smile. Hi, Noah. Hi. He smiled back. I'm going to pick you up, and we are going to tuck you into bed for a little nap, okay? Bethany nodded. I am tired. Okay. Noah stood up, picking up Bethany. He followed Paget to a bedroom. Drew did not like it at all. He had gotten used to picking her up and rescuing her out of the scrapes. It did not sit well with him that Noah was taking over. Max put a hand on Drew's shoulder. It hits hard, doesn't it? I have no idea what you're talking about, muttered Drew. He did know what Max was referring to. He just stubbornly did not want to admit it. There was no way he was falling for Bethany Searson. No way at all. Noah and Beth used to date. Max let go of that little bombshell, watching Drew to gauge his reaction. They were engaged for a few hours before they broke it off. Who broke it off? Drew did his best to show no reaction at all. He kept his breathing even and his face impassive. He was beginning to hate this Noah guy. It was too strong of a reaction, which meant Bethany was starting to get under his skin. Not good. She did. However, it was because he was in love with someone else. He's happily married now with kids, Max informed him. Happily married, but carrying his former fiancée into a bedroom. Drew gritted his teeth and looked sharply at Max. Does he have any reason to want Bethany dead? What? No! Max was incredulous. You're joking, right? Right now, everyone is a suspect, Drew informed him. I believe this was an attempted murder. Michael made a motion and looked inquiringly at them. How do you know for certain? Max asked Michael. It could have been a mix-up with the doctor over prescribing meds. There were cameras in her apartment. Drew watched their reactions. There was nothing but surprise and a little revulsion. Someone has been watching her. Someone has been trying to kill Beth, Max breathed in surprise. Why? That is what I'm going to find out. Once I know why, then I will know who. Drew scowled. Tell me everything you know about her and a boat called Sweet Bethany. If you enjoyed Chapter 6 of Love and Lies, look for Chapter 7. Please consider sharing this video to your other social media. This helps the algorithms and thus helps me grow my channel. I really appreciate it when you do little things like this. Happy listening! Chapter 7 What do you mean they came and got her? demanded Drew. It was her dad, explained Max. It's not like I could just say no, you cannot have your daughter. He had a doctor along and what looked like some security people. I had the feeling that if I said no, they would have just busted in and taken her anyway. Drew cursed. He ran a hand through his hair and looked up at the ceiling of Dr. Mendez's office. He had been waiting to speak to the psychiatrist. How had they known where Drew had taken Bethany? Could someone have tipped them off? Drew had thought the Ramsley brothers were interested in protecting her. If he had not, he would never have left her in Max's care while he went to investigate further. Do you have any idea what they were driving? Plate numbers? I've got one better than that. Max said with some satisfaction. I put Paget's old phone in Beth's overnight bag. It has GPS tracking on it from when we lived in a not-so-great neighborhood. That way, if she lost the phone or it got stolen, we could find it back. I'm tracking it on a laptop right now. You're smarter than you look, Max. Drew raced out of the office, taking the stairs. He ignored the startled looks of people as he ran past them. Where's it going? Since we look almost the same, you do realize you're insulting yourself as well, chuckled Max. Directions, Max? Drew said curtly as he entered the parking garage. He transferred the call to his helmet and started his motorcycle. They're going east on 5th, 
crossing King Street right now, Max directed. Fifth and King, got it. Drew peeled out of the garage. They had a head start and were on the other side of town. He hoped that he could reach them in time. If you think you know where they might be going, tell me immediately. Max continued to give him directions, but Drew was snarled in traffic. There was some sort of accident or major traffic incident, and it did not seem to matter what street or alley he turned down. The city was blocked. Even as he broke numerous laws, dodging between vehicles and going on the sidewalk sometimes, it was a huge traffic jam. I think they're going to Mr. Searson's office. Max rattled off the address. It did not help. Drew could not reach them. Hold on a moment. I'm putting you on a conference call. Just be quiet and do not hang up. The phone rang, and an agitated Miguel answered. Yeah? I need uniforms at the 1900 block of King, said Drew. We have a possible abduction. No can do, replied Miguel. There is no one in that area. Get them there, commanded Drew as he tried to navigate the street. Horns were blowing as people were not impressed that he was not waiting his turn. He blew a red light without even blinking. Almost everyone is at Horton and Adelaide. There is a train wreck. Car zero, train one, if anyone is keeping score. Why people try to get across the track when a train is barreling at them is beyond me. Some cars were derailed and there's a fire. Miguel shouted at someone to stay back. It is chaos. There is no one to spare. Drew could now see smoke as he turned a corner. He stopped the bike and flipped the visor on his helmet. Is there any way to get across the tracks? Not that I know of. The rail guys are blocking what the train is not. Maybe if you go as far as Pickering? It's going to be hours of mess, responded Miguel. I'm surprised the station has not called you to come in and join us to direct traffic. I've been on the phone, growled Drew. Plus, he was on suspension. Right now, even if Green called and begged, Drew was not going to report for duty. He had Bethany to think of. Hey, Drew, interrupted Max. The car stopped. They have arrived at the office. Who is that? Is that Max? wondered Miguel, curiously of the other voice on the conference call. Later. Drew hung up on Miguel. He dialed another number. Pick up. Pick up. Yo, said a deep voice. Molson, I need you to do something for me. Now, with no questions asked. Drew flipped his visor down, turned the bike, and sped down the street between the waiting cars. You still at the shop? This sounds interesting, Molson replied lazily. I'm just closing. There's a girl in trouble. Max is going to send you her picture and the address where she is. Drew sped up along a narrow street. I need you to go there and find her. Do whatever it takes to stall the people with her until I get there. How bad of trouble? asked Molson, intrigued. Drew hesitated. I think they might kill her. What? Max asked in concern. You didn't say that when you suspected Mr. Searson of possibly killing her. I don't know for certain, Drew replied. He had a bad feeling about this. Drew thought Ted Searson was the most likely suspect in his daughter's attempted murder. He cut across a parking lot. Give him the address. Let me get my coat, said Molson. Molson, cautioned Drew as he wondered if that was code for grabbing a weapon. Sometimes his brother spoke in the worst sort of slang, and Drew did not always understand. I don't need you trying to be a hero. I just need you to be your usual aggravating self and stall them until I get there. I am the cop. I will deal with it. Sure thing, bro, he agreed easily. 1900 block of King, 1908 unit 7A. She's downright beautiful. It should be in Searson's office. I'm going to draw you a quick map of the building and send it to you, said Max. What, you get so special they gave you your own tech support person? Like Garcia in Criminal Minds? Molson questioned flippantly. Get a move on, growled Drew. He did not particularly like that Molson had commented on Bethany's looks. He hated that his options had been limited to using Molson at all. Molson does not seem to be taking this very seriously, Max voiced his reservations. Can you trust him? I've got no one else right now, Drew admitted. All personnel would be at the train accident. Says how desperate you must be, the lazy voice commented. Are you going?
Drew clenched his teeth. Hey, I'm on it, Molson assured him. I will let you know how it goes. They could hear the call disconnect. Drew turned at Pickering, hoping to get past the snarl of cars. I'm not feeling confident of your boy, said Max. Should I go? It's a thirty-minute drive for me. No. Drew spotted the train barriers. They were down. The lights were flashing. But it was only the railroad crew there. With his motorcycle, he would be able to squeeze through. I am twenty or less away. Plus, with all the traffic issues, a car would never make it. Then we have no choice but to rely on your brother. Max's tone conveyed that he did not like it. Drew did not like it either. But there was not a thing he could do about it. He hit the throttle on the bike and drove as fast as he dared. Drew tried to ignore the feeling of helplessness and anger that was roused in him. Bethany was not a threat to anyone. She was vulnerable and sweet, and a little confused, maybe. Bethany was the type of woman that made a man want to protect her. He was doing a lousy job of that. Molson pressed the police badge up to the window as he knocked. The cleaning lady looked at him, pulling the earbuds out of her ears and shutting off her vacuum. She looked at him suspiciously. He was glad he had taken the time to turn up the collar of his coat to hide the tattoos on his neck. Molson tried to look like he was on official police business. Police, I need access to the building. She sauntered over, popping a bubble of gum, and looked at the badge. It was real. Molson had pickpocketed it from Miguel six years ago. This was the first time he had ever used it. He hoped she was not looking too closely at it because he did not exactly match the picture on the ID. With a nod, she unlocked the door. What is going on? Ma'am, I need you to not say anything, but there is a bomb threat that was called into this building. I am going to clear out the floors. You should go wait in your car until we've searched the place. Molson lied as he kept the door open and five guys, all dressed in black, entered with him. He purposely dropped his accent and polished his speech a little to sound more professional. Oh, she slapped her hands over her bubblegum chewing mouth, her eyes getting really big. Mr. Searson and some people just went up to his office. What floor would they be on? Molson already knew, but he played along. The top one. It's full of executive offices. She fumbled with her key card, taking it off a ring of keys. Here, you need to swipe this to enter. The code is 1112. So helpful. Molson stopped himself from smiling just in time. Thank you, ma'am. Now go out to your car where you will be safe. She nodded and scurried out of the building. I am going to call my girlfriend. She is never going to believe this. Molson shrugged as he watched her leave. It would keep her busy while they looked for Bethany Searson. Man, we should do this for a living one of the guys said as he looked around the deserted foyer. It only should be a bank or someplace more valuable. Molson reluctantly shook his head and led the way to the elevator. At the top floor, he used the key card and passcode supplied. They grinned at each other as the door opened. Molson motioned them to spread out to search the floor. He followed Max's map to Ted Searson's office. As he neared, Molson could hear voices. What? You start the party without me? Molson looked slightly affronted as he casually entered the office. The occupants gazed at him, startled. He recognized Ted Searson from the photo that Max had thoughtfully provided. He also knew Bethany from the same source. There was a woman there perched on the couch with Bethany that he did not know. There was also David Ramsley sitting on the edge of the desk, obviously holding court. Who are you? Ted stood up in alarm. "'None of your business. Sit down,' Molson ordered him as he crouched in front of Bethany. "'What did they do to you, girl?' Bethany was reclining against the couch, her eyes barely open, mouth slack as she labored to breathe. Molson used a small flashlight to check her eyes, then took her pulse. "'I told you she needs a hospital,' the woman glared at David. "'I do not understand what is happening. Did she take some previously prescribed pills?' Over-the-counter medications? How should I know? David said mildly as he watched Molson check Bethany. Andrew must have sent you. Now, I know you just didn't say that. Molson looked around and spied the bag of prescription medications. 
He grabbed it, reading through some of the labels quickly. Because if you did, that means you know all about Andrew. Which means you know about me. I gotta say, I'm upset you didn't send no Christmas cards or nothing. Why would I? David said nonchalantly. You are not mine. I got a DNA test that says otherwise. Molson shook the bag of drugs at the woman on the couch. You, Dr. You? The one with the name all over these bottles? When did you get my DNA? demanded David. Yes, Dr. Ershman said shakily, trying to back away from the bag of pills he had shoved under her nose. What did you give her? Molson questioned non too gently. Today? Nothing. Two days ago, I gave her a lorazepam to calm her down to help in a therapy session. She replied defensively, nothing else. Nothing to make her like this. I asked you a question, boy. David stood, glowering down at them. You think you're the only one who can get things done? Molson gave David a derisive look, then tossed the bag of pills to one of his friends. He picked up Bethany, cradling her against him. Come on, sugar, I am going to get you feeling better. Wait, cried Ted, you can't just take her. Really? laughed Molson. In case you didn't notice, Ted, your daughter is suffering from an overdose. If she don't get this junk out of her, she's going to die. No, Ted looked lost. She's not supposed to die. Shut up, Ted, growled David. Lady, you coming? Molson raised an eyebrow at Dr. Ershman. Excuse me? Holly questioned suspiciously to him. She looked very afraid. Wow, okay, let me lay this out to you decided Molson. For some reason, they got you all caught up in their scheme. Maybe it sounded good at first. Maybe there's money involved. Whatever. Point is, after Bethany makes a full recovery and points the finger at you for prescribing all those pills, who do you think's gonna take the fall? Them? scoffed Molson. Ted and David here got lawyers and cash to keep themselves out of jail. They will just say it was all you. You are gonna rot in prison. Unless you roll on them first before Miss Sunshine here gets well. You testify, or you can take your chances with these two. They ain't looking out for your interests. In fact, I will lay odds that they might just do to you what they did to dear Sugar here. Molson headed out the door. This is unacceptable. David strode out after him only to be blocked by one of Molson's companions. Just who do you think you are? Molson's friend just smiled. Someone who can't be bought, Molson replied as he headed to the elevator. His companions joined him. You won't let her die, Ted asked anxiously as he trailed them in the hallway. Molson did not answer. One of his friends hit the elevator buttons. As the doors closed, Holly slipped into the elevator with them. She cleared her throat nervously. Snitches get stitches, someone remarked. Not this one, Molson said sharply. Doc? If I want to get Sugar here into a hospital not owned by David Ramsey's family, where do I go? Mercy is the closest, she protested. Not an option. Molson did not trust that something would not happen to Bethany there. General is the next closest, said Holly. That's where people go to die, one of the men said dismissively. It was known as the Poor People's Hospital, an inner-city building that was old, decaying, understaffed, and undersupplied. Next? asked Molson. The other hospitals are too far away, she insisted. If it is an overdose, then she'll die before she gets treated on time unless we go to Mercy. Molson did not like the options. You got wheels? Excuse me? Wheels. A car. You got a car, Molson repeated with some frustration as they exited the building. Not like we can take sugar here on the subway. Yes, Holly dug into her purse for her keys, trying to keep up with the group of men. I'm going to let the cleaning lady know she can go back to work. Call it a false alarm or something. One of the guys commented as he slipped from the group. What are you doing? Drew demanded. Drew had parked the bike on the sidewalk and had come directly to Molson as they were coming out of the building. I thought I told you to stall, not grab her. You're welcome, Molson replied dryly. He was surprised that Drew immediately reached out to transfer Bethany into his own arms. Molson smirked. You got a thing for her? He gave Molson a dark look, ignoring the comment. He looked with alarm at the nearly unconscious Bethany. What happened? Have you called an ambulance? No. Molson shook his head. His friends had melted away as soon as they saw Drew. 
They knew he was a cop and did not want to stick around. Molson did not blame them in the least. We were about to take Doc's car to Mercy. It'll be faster. Doc? Drew questioned. Doc Urshman here? Molson nodded in Holly's direction. Thought you might want to talk to her. Drew gave a short nod. They followed Holly to her car. Drew was surprised when Molson not only helped put Bethany in the back seat, but jumped in the front passenger seat. Thought I might see how this all plays out. Molson winked at Holly. Hey, Drew, you know our old man is involved in all this? Drew frowned. What do you mean? It was all cozy up there. The Doc, Sugar, Sugar's dad, and Mr. Moneybags, Ramsley himself. Molson shrugged. He must have a stake in all this. Stop calling her Sugar. Drew glared at Molson, who ignored him. When we get to the hospital, I'm going to take both your statements. I expect nothing less, Molson commented. Honey, you gonna lay on some gas? It'd be better if we get to the hospital before she dies. I'm well aware that we need to get to the hospital as quickly as possible, Holly made a turn. However, I cannot exactly break any traffic laws. You got a cop in the back seat, Molson rolled his eyes. If we get tagged by some other cops, he'll explain at the hospital. Now punch it. Holly looked in her rearview mirror at Drew. If you see an opening, take it. Do not get into an accident, but do not worry about traffic laws either. Drew said grimly, I should have driven. You? Molson huffed with a smile. I can pass you any day of the week. Only because you're reckless, Drew grimaced. He checked to make sure Bethany was breathing. Do you know what she is on? No, Holly replied. I think she was given something before I came to the office. All I gave her was a simple lorazepam a couple of days ago. She should not be like this. We tried a regressive therapy technique. It involves relaxing the patient and walking them through their emotions. She did really well. Afterwards, her father took her home since Bethany was still too relaxed on the medications. Then today, I got a phone call to meet Mr. Searson at his office. He wanted to discuss Bethany's treatment and said she'd been depressed lately. He convinced me to come. When I arrived, Holly continued as she made a turn. I found Bethany like this. Mr. Searson was there and another man. I assumed he is a colleague of Mr. Searson's. What about all the drugs you prescribed to her over the past four days? asked Drew. I have not prescribed her anything for over a month, frowned Holly. Cut to the truth, lady, Drew said shortly. I saw the bottles with your name on them. There's nearly a dozen prescriptions all within the last four days. No, insisted Holly. I did not prescribe them. I got a theory, Molson looked back at Drew. Not sure I should say it in front of her. Say it, growled Drew, holding Bethany a little tighter. No, I ain't got no proof or nothing, cautioned Molson. My thinking is that sugar's been set up. Accidental overdose. I'm betting there was a piece up in that office. Her daddy gets so upset by sugar's death, he kills the doc, then himself. Everyone calls it a tragedy and says we need better laws for the overprescribing meds. At least, that's what everybody's going to think by the time the papers get through with it. My guess is Pop was there to do the actual killing. Pop goes totally free. No one knew he was there. They were going to kill her? Holly shook her head. Her father loves her. Mr. Searson would not do that. David Ramsley don't love her. He don't love nobody but himself, Molson replied dryly. He ain't got the same moral codes as everyone else. I seen that look in his eyes and some gangbangers. It's the same. There's no proof, Drew said shortly. Why would David Ramsley kill them all and cover it up like a murder-suicide? Never said there was proof, Molson looked back at Drew, all serious. But it ties everything up right neat. Now, why would they want Sugar dead? Drew thought back to Bethany's dream. She said there had been two men, one trying to drown her, one trying to save her. I think you got an idea, Molson nodded at Drew. I see the wheels turning in your head. You think this is connected to the regressed memories she has been trying to recover, questioned Holly as it started to make sense to her, to whatever she saw on the boat. Again, I need proof, Drew grimaced. He had motive if the drug angle was correct. He had suspects. He had a crime. 
but he did not have a single piece of evidence other than the flimsy memories of a woman. We're here. Holly pressed the brakes and put the car in park in front of the emergency room door. They rushed to get Bethany out of the car. Drew carried her into the hospital. Make sure Dr. Urshman does not go anywhere, Drew said to Molson as he brought Bethany to the triage center. I need her statement. In fact, call Miguel. He can interview both of you. I'm on it, Molson said, pulling out his cell phone. Drew approached the nurse at the desk. I need help. Possible overdose. It did not take long to get a gurney and Bethany admitted. Drew flashed his badge and was able to remain by her side for the whole process. As he watched the medical staff take care of her, he sent up silent prayers for her recovery. It should not matter so much, but it did. He had to admit that Max might be right about connecting to someone. It did not mean that she was the one or that he was going to pursue her in any way. She was far too high class for him. Drew knew that he did not stand a chance in her world, and she would probably never adapt to his. Better to just figure out who was trying to kill her, keep her safe, and then send her on her way. Drew would do his best to forget about her once this was all over. Finally, she was out of danger and wheeled to a private room. Drew followed. He called Max and assured him that Bethany was okay and that the doctors were confident that she would recover. He called Miguel and about three hours later was able to get him to take Molson and Dr. Urshman's statements. The train incident was under control, with only a few roads still blocked, freeing up some of the emergency crews in the area. Miguel took Drew's statement as well, having to do it at the hospital, since Drew was not going to leave Bethany unguarded. I can bring Ted Searson and David Ramsley in for questioning. Without evidence, we're going to have a hard time making anything stick, Miguel said quietly as they sat in Bethany's room. I know, sighed Drew. Someone is trying to kill her, and my gut says the dad's complicit while David Ramsley is pulling the strings. Dr. Urshman swears she did not prescribe the meds. She cannot prove that she did not. Maybe Ted Searson will crack under questioning. More than likely, he'll just lawyer up, stated Miguel. This all has to do with the childhood memory on a boat? It's near as I can figure, nodded Drew. Now we have to wait for her to wake up and tell us what she knows. However, she was pretty drugged out. I doubt she'll remember much of what just happened. Miguel looked at Bethany. Private room. Pretty pricey. She's out of my league. I know. Drew agreed. He did not need Miguel's gentle reminder of that fact. Miguel stood and put a hand on Drew's shoulder. You need anything, you let me know. Don't fall too deep. Drew nodded. It was doomed before it even began. He tried to ignore the squeeze on his heart that had finally relaxed once the doctor said that Bethany would recover. Let's just figure this out so she's safe and I can get her out of my life. I'll pull them in for questioning. The shrink, too. She might have something further to say when she sees the inside of a jail cell. Miguel exited the room. Drew hoped so. He needed to get Bethany Searson out of his life. A knock on the door drew his attention. Molson tossed him a set of keys. Thought you might need those. Drew caught the keys and gave them a quick look. They were for his truck. Thanks. It's parked out in the lot. All paid for and proper, so don't worry about no ticket. Molson leaned against the wall. I'm borrowing your motorcycle till later. Drew breathed in a calming breath. He supposed Molson deserved this bike for a little while since he had been instrumental in saving Bethany's life. No dents. No illegal activity, no tickets, no speeding. Sure thing, Molson managed to sound just a touch offended. Can I put a bumper sticker on it? No. Drew gave Molson a dirty look. Molson smirked. I was sugar. Her name is Bethany, Drew chided. The doctors say she will be fine. She woke up once but was disorientated. By tomorrow, the drugs will be out of her system and she'll likely be good to go. Molson nodded. You gonna make a move on her when she's done with this nearly getting killed business? Drew had an unamused laugh. Not likely. She's far too classy for me. Why don't you let her decide that? At least give Sugar a chance to choose if you are really what she wants. She might be silly enough to go for you. Molson left the room on that cryptic remark. Drew leaned back in his uncomfortable chair. There were days where he wanted to throttle his younger brother. 
Actually, those were most days, he reflected. No, he would help her, then do his best to forget about her. Drew must have dozed off at some point. He blamed it on not getting enough sleep when Max was still in his apartment. He wished he had not slept, though. It was sloppy of him, no matter his sleep-deprived state. He was supposed to be keeping an eye on Bethany, since he had chosen to become her self-appointed guardian. Drew opened his eyes and listened. Bethany moved restlessly in the bed. She had been the noise that had awakened him. Bethany murmured something in her sleep, thrashing against the blankets. Hey. Drew stood up and carefully gave her arm a little shake. Bethany, you are okay. She jerked awake, terrified. Beth. Drew kept his voice soft as he wiped a tear from her face. It is all right. You were in the hospital. The hospital? Bethany looked up at him in confusion, slowly relaxing at his touch. That's right, he nodded. You're going to be fine. I was dreaming, Bethany said sleepily. She took hold of his hand, clasping it to her cheek. What were you dreaming? asked Drew. I was trying to find Michael's boat. I wanted to play on it, she murmured drowsily. I was not supposed to be on his boat. Drew watched her drift back into sleep. He held onto her hand a little while longer before releasing it and heading into the hall just outside her door. Drew pulled out his cell phone and called Miguel. Does Michael Ramsley have a boat? Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed Chapter 7, look for Chapter 8. Also, Love and Lies is on Amazon in the Kindle section and in Kindle Unlimited. Very soon, the audiobook will be made available as well. Happy listening! Chapter 8 Where do you think you are going? Drew asked as he entered the room. Bethany was putting on her running shoes, fully dressed. She relaxed as she saw him. I am leaving the hospital. I am going home. No, you are not. Drew crossed his arms. Bethany, your apartment was bugged. Whoever is threatening your life has access to your apartment, despite the security systems in the building. I'm going home to pick up some clothing and necessities. Bethany stood, eyeing him uncertainly. I was wondering if you would escort me. I'm not sure where I should stay, either. I don't feel safe. You can stay with friends, suggested Drew. Normally, he would stay with family, but Ted Searson was not a good choice. We've brought your dad and David Ramsley in for questioning based on Dr. Ershman's statement. Miguel is going to need to take a statement from you as well. Drew neglected to mention that he was officially suspended, so he could not take any statements. He did not feel like sharing that bit of information. I really don't remember anything. Bethany shrugged as she stared at her shoe. She was not sure how she felt about Drew arresting her father. I went to my weekly appointment with Dr. Ershman. We were trying a new therapy with a simple sedative. When I took it... What happened when you took the drug? Drew gently pressed. I felt the old feelings of tiredness return. Bethany hugged herself. I think my father came over. He said he was worried about me. He told me Dr. Ershman had prescribed a new regime of medications for me. He said they were very concerned over my mental health. What is it? Drew asked softly when Bethany paused. He carefully put a hand on her shoulder. He did not want to startle her. Bethany swallowed. She looked up at him with tears in her eyes. He said that they were worried I might harm myself. If I did not take my medications on time, I would be committed to psychiatric ward in the hospital, and I would never be able to come out. He told me to be a good girl. A tear made its way down her cheek. Why would he do that? Why would he threaten to commit me? Drew came forward and wiped away the tear. He could not help the action. He felt drawn like a magnet to her. He is afraid. He knows that you know something that could potentially hurt him. Bethany frowned, her memory teasing her. She concentrated hard, a ball of dread forming in her stomach. Bethany could barely say the words. It was him. Stop drowning her. You'll kill her. What else can we do, Ted? She's going to tell everyone about what she saw here. I can keep her quiet. She will not say a word. I can make certain of it. Can you be sure? Give her to me. What do you mean? Drew was concerned by the odd tone of her voice. 
She looked at Drew with tears in her eyes as the memories clicked together in her mind. It was him. My father and David Ramsley on the boat. They were both there with the bricks of white drugs. It was David Ramsley that kept putting my head under water in the bathtub. It was my father who signed me up for psychiatrics and drugs to numb my memories. How do you know? Drew asked. If this were true, that would be motive for why Ted Searson had tried to kill her or have her committed. She was getting closer to retaining her memories, making Ted Searson and David Ramsley afraid. I remember. Bethany hugged herself, looking at him with stricken eyes. I remember everything. That meant that they could potentially prosecute on the case. They certainly could press for attempted murder charges. Drew also knew that both men were rich and well-connected. They would probably make bail. Even if they did not, Bethany's life was still in danger. I'm going to take you to the police station. I want to get your full statement. After that, we'll get some of your items from your apartment if the forensics team is done looking at everything. If not, you'll just have to borrow or purchase some things. Where can I stay? whispered Bethany. I'm not really safe, am I? She was friends with the Ramsleys. However, she was accusing their father of some pretty heavy stuff, so Drew did not know how they would handle that. David Ramsley was a force to be reckoned with, and Drew did not know just how far the old man would go. She would endanger anyone she was with. You will stay with me, he found himself saying. He mentally winced. Close proximity to Bethany was not going to help him get past her once she was out of his life. And she would leave. As soon as the case was closed and she was safe again, she would be on her way, never looking back at an illegitimate cop who was not worthy of her. Plus, this was entirely against protocol. Green would have his head for giving Bethany Searson special treatment if he ever found out. Thank you. Bethany gave him a tremulous smile. I feel safe with you. She also had a way of looking at him like he was some storybook hero. That had to stop. You're welcome, he said gruffly. Let's get to the police station so you can talk to Miguel. Bethany nodded. They gathered what little she had brought with her, signed discharge papers, and Drew escorted her from the hospital. It did not take long to get to the police station. From there, Drew would be able to find out if her apartment had been cleared by forensics, and she could return to pick up a few items. He brought Bethany to his desk, giving her his chair as he went to find Miguel. Colburn, my office! Green bellowed across the room. Drew winced. He obediently went into Green's office, shutting the door behind him. "'What is David Ramsley doing in my jail?' demanded Green. "'I have all sorts of people breathing down my neck.' "'He could be involved in the attempted murder of his friend Ted Searson's daughter,' Drew said. He did not even bother to try to take a seat. Green was not in a good mood at all. "'I have been told in no uncertain terms to cut him loose,' Green growled. "'The mayor is involved now. "'I know that nothing is likely to stick to Ramsley.' Drew leaned forward, putting his hands on Green's desk. However, we can still hold him for twenty-four. Do you know who is about to come into my office? Green pointed to the chairs. Sit down. Drew frowned as he took a seat. Who? The FBI. Green dragged a deep breath in and popped a couple of pieces of gum designed to help him stop smoking. He looked at his empty coffee cup longingly. We've apparently stepped on their toes. More specifically, you have. What? Drew questioned, frowning. What did I do? I will let Agent Law explain it. Green groused. He's due here any second. Law? Drew growled. Law as in the guy we arrested at the boat drop? Law who let the gang in on the fact that I am a detective? Law came in during the middle of Drew's angry outburst. He shut the door after himself and looked at Drew with a small amount of amusement. Yes, me. Drew sat back in his seat and refused to give in to the tirade that he wanted to. He clenched his teeth and waited. Law grabbed a chair and sat down without permission. He tossed a file on Green's desk. I'm sorry about throwing you under the bus, Colburn. It built my reputation with the gang members and assisted me in furthering my investigation. We're very close to putting on the squeeze to those at the top tier of the operation. Thanks, Drew muttered. Law had used Drew's downfall to further his career. Drew was not particularly enthused by that. 
Am I still on suspension now that he confessed to screwing over my cover? Law raised an eyebrow. You're lucky you still have a job. You have just put some of my main suspects in jail. I'll need a copy of all your reports. If you're talking about David Ramsley and Ted Searson, they attempted to kill someone, Drew explained with a tinge of sarcasm. This is huge, Green looked up from the file he was perusing. If this is true, they need an enormous business to launder that amount of money through. They are billionaires, Law said dryly. They own some of the biggest chains of businesses in the country. You're saying the cargo ship carries only drugs. They bribed their way through customs of the countries they hail from. Green pointed to the file that Law had supplied. Yes. Then it makes a number of drops to smaller privately owned yachts and pleasure crafts around the American coastlines. The drugs are repackaged and redistributed as you have already determined with your small investigation that Colburn oversaw. This is international, Laws confirmed. That is impressive. Green flipped through the pages of documents. Now it's an FBI case. Drew slumped in his chair. That's right. Law looked at Green. I need you to release them. No. Drew straightened up. I am not releasing Searson. There's nothing to hold Ramsley on, which is unfortunate because I think he's up to his eyeballs in this. However, with Bethany's testimony, we have a case against Ted Searson. You do not get to choose who stays and who is released, Green reminded Drew forcefully. You are on suspension. Boss, he tried to kill his own daughter, persisted Drew. Who's taking her statement? You know you're not allowed to. Green narrowed his eyes. Miguel, answered Drew. He knew that he was not allowed to do any police work while on suspension. It would result in cases being thrown out on technicalities. Fine, give me the statement. I'll have a look at it. Green motioned to the door. If I think it will hold up in court, I'll keep Sears in custody. Otherwise, I'm going to have to let him go. Hopefully the FBI will be able to string together a better case for prosecution than you have so far. Drew firmly clamped his mouth shut that he would not say something snide in return. He rose from his chair and left to get the statement from Miguel. He tried to remind himself that Green was under a lot of pressure. It did not make Drew feel any more charitable towards the man. Miguel took one look at Drew's thunderous face and whistled. What now? You do not want to know. Drew firmly jerked back on his anger. He did not want to be mad in front of Bethany. Are you finished with Bethany's statement? Is everything okay? Bethany looked at him with concern. Drew sighed. I'll let you know what I can later. She nodded. Miguel held up the finished report for Drew. All done. Thanks, bro. Drew grabbed the file and headed back to Green's office. He knocked before entering. Drew handed the file over to Green. He decided to stay standing. Green looked it over with a cursory glance. She was drugged. Yes. Drew confirmed Green's statement. That her testimony will not hold water. A good attorney will rip it to shreds. Green tossed the file on his desk. Both Searson and Ramsley will be released. That is nuts. Drew had a few other choice words, but went with the PG ones. They tried to kill her. You have got no proof of anything, Colburn. Green shot back at him. She was drugged, so she cannot say exactly what happened. No witnesses. Nothing to back up your theory. What about the cameras in the apartment? asked Drew. What cameras? demanded Green. Drew took out his cell phone and flipped to the pictures that he took of Bethany's condo. He shoved the phone across the desk. These. Green looked at them. When were these taken? Drew hesitated. You were off duty! Green said in disgust. It could be anyone's apartment. Prosecution could say that you tampered with evidence. No warrant. I did not tamper with anything. They were there in her condo. Drew took back his phone. She let me in. How deep are you in with this girl? Green eyed him shrewdly. That is not an issue, Drew said resolutely, maintaining Green's gaze. She was drugged, nearly overdosed on prescription meds. I have hospital records stating that it could have been lethal if she had not been treated. I have the psychiatrist stating that she did not give the medication that Bethany was overdosed on, and that Bethany was released, sedated, into Ted Searson's care shortly before the overdose. How does that tie in with Ramsley? Green questioned. He was there with Bethany, Ted Searson, and the psychiatrist in Ted's office, Drew said. There is an impartial witness. 
That's not enough to keep Ramsley, Law inserted into their conversation. No, it is not, Drew acknowledged, especially since his impartial witness was his brother, another son of David Ramsley and a gang member. Unless Searson confessed that Ramsley was involved, they had nothing on David. It's enough to hold and charge Searson. It could be the shrink, mused Green. Someone is lying about the prescription medications. I'm going to check out the pharmacies where the medications were filled. Maybe I can find something, said Drew. You're not going to do anything, Green growled at him. You are on suspension. Colby can check the pharmacies. I'm giving the case to him. I'll hold Searson for now, but I'm letting Ramsley go. If you breathe a single word about Agent Law's operation, I'll not just send you back to Foot Patrol, I will dismiss you. Do I make myself clear? Green pointed at Drew for emphasis. Yes, sir, Drew bit out. I mean that. If I hear one whiff that you have informed the Ramsley family of David Ramsley's impending arrest, I will fire you, Green reiterated. I want you to drop this. You're related to Ramsley. That is a whole can of worms that should bite the department in the rear should any of this get out. From now on, you leave him alone. Am I clear? Yes, sir, Drew repeated. There was nothing else to say. Green was a hard boss, but he usually was fair. Drew did not know what Green's problem was right now. However, he would not lose his job over this, which meant he would not be able to say a word about this to Bethany. The one good thing is that Searson would remain in jail for the time being. I appreciate your cooperation in this, Law said smoothly. He picked up his original file and stood, offering a hand to Green. Green stood and shook Law's hand. Good luck. Law nodded and extended his hand to Drew. No hard feelings, I hope. Drew took Law's hand in a punishing grip. Why would there be any hard feelings? Law just smiled and extracted his hand. Drew watched him leave. Am I dismissed for the day, sir? Yes, Green said sourly. I have no idea how I'm going to explain this to the mayor. Drew did not care. It was not his problem. His problem was what to say to Bethany. He grabbed a report that Miguel had made before exiting the office. Drew gave it back to Miguel. Colby is taking over the case. Drew grabbed a chair and wheeled it over, sinking down into it. He needs to check with the pharmacies to see who picked up the prescriptions from Dr. Ershman that she swears she did not write. It is a long shot. Hopefully they had some cameras and we can get some good look at the perp. Miguel grimaced, tossing the report on his desk. Why Colby? Drew snorted. I am on suspension, and you are too close to me being my brother-in-law. Right now, Green is favoring Colby. Don't ask me why. What do you mean that you're on suspension? asked Bethany. I had a mix-up in a case, grimaced Drew. It fell in part, thanks in part, to an FBI agent, and thanks in part to me being too eager that I did not see the warning signs. Good news is, Drew does not repeat his mistakes. Miguel tapped the file with a finger. I will give this to Colby and note the angle on the pharmacy. Hopefully we can find out if the psychiatrist is telling the truth. Ask Colby to keep us informed, requested Drew. Will do, nodded Miguel. Green says we can hold Searson for now. Ramsley is going to be let go, scowled Drew. What? According to Dr. Ershman, he was there in the office. Doesn't that make him an accomplice? Bethany asked in surprise. There is not enough proof to charge Ramsley with anything. Drew did not like it any better than she did. Are they done at the apartment? Yes, nodded Miguel. The bugs are gone and no prints at all by the time we got there. That means the cleanup was professional even if the camera work was not. Drew remarked sourly. What happens? Bethany questioned as the thought crossed her mind that she might not be safe with David Ramsley going to be released. Do I just wait for them to try again? No, I will keep you safe, promised Drew. How? I thought they would both go to jail and I would be safe. Bethany started to fray the strap on her purse again. Guys with that much money tend to get around things, Miguel said with a shrug. Even with them in jail, I would be worried about your safety until you testified against them at trial. Are you saying they might hire someone? Bethany was astonished. My father and Mr. Ramsley hiring a... What'd you call it? A hitman? That is not going to happen. Drew put a hand over hers, stopping her from shredding the poor purse. 
Right now, David Ramsley is walking away from jail. He knows we cannot touch him. That means that you are not a threat. If you are not a threat, David is not going to come after you. At least, he hoped that was the case. Drew looked at Miguel. Is Green still in his office? Yeah, why? questioned Miguel. Because I'm probably about to get booted down to foot patrol. Drew stood up. Most likely, he was about to get fired. Look after her a moment. Sure. What are you going to try to do? asked Miguel. I'm going to see if I can get Ted Searson to roll on Ramsley. Drew quickly went down to holding and checked with Fenton if he could arrange to speak to Searson. Fenton owed him one, and Drew decided to cash in on the favor. Within minutes, it was all set up. Searson was seated at a table in the interrogation room, his hands handcuffed to a loop in the steel table. Drew entered the room and leaned on the table, making eye contact with the older man. Mr. Searson, this is off the record, Drew said calmly. You do not need your lawyer, and I am not going to record anything. Then what is this about? Ted Searson was not looking so good. He was sweating a little and nervous. Has anyone told you that you look just like Max Ramsley? A few times, remarked Drew. I don't want to speak about Max. You know you are David's son, right? Is this what this is about? Ted asked anxiously. He will not give you any money. He does not care about his kids. As far as I'm concerned, he only donated the DNA. I don't want anything from him. Drew crossed his arms and looked down on Ted. Then why am I here? asked Ted. Your daughter, Drew stated, watching Ted's reactions. Is she all right? Ted asked anxiously. She'll make a full recovery, answered Drew. Physically, Bethany would. Mentally, getting over the fact that her own father would have let her die? That was something else. Ted sighed in relief. Do you think she is safe? Drew asked quietly, but with a strong voice, implying that he did not believe she would be. Ted swallowed convulsively. I believe that someone tried to kill her. Drew watched Ted's reaction. The man had a poor poker face. I think that someone will keep trying until they succeed. No. Ted shook his head quickly. She is my daughter. No one is going to hurt her. I don't believe you. Drew pulled out the chair and sat down. He laced his fingers together loosely. I don't think you believe that either. Ted shook his head to the negative. Mr. Searson, Bethany is in danger, Drew quietly insisted. Your daughter's life is in danger. She saw something on that boat, the sweet Bethany, years ago. Now her memories are coming back, and your partner thought it would be better to eliminate Bethany before she spilled the beans and put both of you into prison. Isn't that right? Ted stared at his hands. He is not going to stop until she is dead, Mr. Searson. You have the power to stop him. How? Ted looked up. There were tears in his eyes. You tell us everything, from the beginning. We put him in prison where he belongs, and Bethany will be safe, answered Drew. He is too powerful. Ted slumped in defeat. Drew stood abruptly, slamming both hands down on the table, causing Ted to jump. Drew kept his voice low but forceful. Then she dies. No, please, Ted began to cry in earnest. Drew leaned over until he was in Ted's face. It is up to you to testify against him and save her, or hide like the coward you are and let her die. Drew pushed away from the table and walked out of the room. He hoped he had done enough. He leaned against the wall in the corridor to collect his thoughts. That was a little brutal, Fenton said mildly. Drew shrugged. They're going to release Ramsley at any moment. If Ted doesn't speak before he is out, we'll never make any progress on this case. He gave it a fine chance. Fenton looked at Searson through the one-way window. I would give it about sixty-forty odds, he talks. The way my luck has been going... I would not bet on it, Drew said darkly. Hopefully he asks to call his lawyer to broker a deal. You should return him to his cell before I get you in any hot water. Thanks for letting me try. No problem. I'll let you know if he decides to blab. Fenton grabbed his keys to unlock Ted's cuffs. Thanks. Drew left Fenton to get Ted back to his cell. Hopefully that would happen before anyone noticed he was missing. 
Otherwise, Fenton was going to have to come clean, and Drew would no longer be one of the boys in blue. Drew had a week and a half to keep Bethany safe before he was scheduled to return to work. If he had to, he could extend it with vacation time that was owed to him. Hopefully, Law would make arrests in that time frame. If not, Drew was not sure what he would do. Right now, his priority was to keep Bethany safe. Drew came back to Miguel and Bethany. How did you go? Miguel asked. Drew shrugged. Wait and see. Hopefully Ted Searson will confess and give us David Ramsley. If he stays silent, it is either him or Dr. Ershman who will likely get charged with attempted murder. Do you think Dr. Ershman was part of it? Bethany asked quietly. She liked her psychiatrist. She had trusted her completely. I don't know. Colby will investigate further, and he will find out. He is a good cop. It hurt Drew to admit that to Bethany, but it was the truth. It would also make her feel better that the investigation was in good hands. Drew just hoped that Colby did not hit on her too much. What do we do now? wondered Bethany. Should I see my father? Ask him what really happened? Let Detective Colby decide, advised Miguel. It is his case. I can let him know that you offered. I just want answers, Bethany sighed. She was tired. Drew held out a hand, recognizing her energy was flagging. It was no wonder, since she had just gotten out of the hospital. Let's get some of your things. Then you can have a nap when we get to my place. Bethany nodded, taking his hand. Miguel looked at Drew in surprise, but Drew ignored him, steering Bethany through the police station, one hand on her back. Let that make the rumor rounds. Drew did not care. In fact, he thought it would be good. Then maybe Colby would not get any ideas about Bethany. If you enjoyed Chapter 8 of Love and Lies, Book 5 of the Ramsley Brothers series, look for Chapter 9. And remember to hit that like button. This is free for you to do and really helps with the algorithms to grow my channel. Thank you so much and happy listening! Chapter 9 It's not very big, but it works, Drew said as he opened the door to his apartment. He let Bethany go first. If I had known I was having company, I would have cleaned. Mentally, he gave a wince at the current state it was in. Dishes were in the sink. He knew his fridge was nearly empty. His bathroom had not fared well with three guys using the place. Drew did not like cleaning much. However, he disliked Bethany seeing his place like this even less. Drew remembered her rich condo and how expensive everything had looked. His garage sale find furniture was not exactly measuring up. The couch had not even come from a garage sale. It had been sitting out, abandoned for garbage day when Drew had spotted it and dragged it home. Thank goodness it did not smell like raccoon pee anymore. Everything is in one room. Bethany looked around curiously, setting her overnight bag on the small table. Everything except the bathroom, yes. Drew put her luggage case beside the bed. I will clear a couple of drawers and change the sheets. Where am I going to sleep? frowned Bethany. There's no guest room. I will take the couch, said Drew. It was going to be uncomfortable. He was not looking forward to it. Drew quickly cleared some space in the tall boy dresser so that she would have somewhere to put her stuff. It was a good thing he did not have much of a wardrobe. Drew managed to condense four drawers into two. The fifth drawer was empty anyways. There was more than enough room in the small closet beside his shelf as well. I am smaller. I should sleep on the couch. Bethany eyed it with a small measure of caution. There was a pretty and colorful afghan over the sofa, yet that did not hide the fact that some stuffing was coming through on one end. That is not how I treat ladies in this apartment, Drew said calmly. He grabbed the only other set of sheets that he owned thanks to Jana. At the time, he thought it was an odd thing to need two sets of sheets when you could just throw them through on laundry day. Now he blessed his sister's foresight as he stripped his bed. Do you have company here often? Bethany said lightly as she looked out the window. Her condo had floor-to-ceiling glass with a view of the river. He had two small and outdated windows that looked onto a narrow alley, the view being the brick building beside them. At least there was no other windows peering back at them. I prefer not to. I've always seen this as my own personal sanctuary. Drew stuffed a pillow into a pillowcase. And I am invading it. Bethany fiddled with her purse strap. 
No. Drew paused as he pulled the sheet over the bed. I invited you here. You're more than welcome to stay until you feel safe enough to return home. My father pays the bills on the condo, frowned Bethany. What happens if he does not pay them? Can he pay them from jail? I'm sure the bills will keep getting paid, replied Drew. At least they would until the FBI came in and froze the accounts during their investigation. However, just to be on the safe side, if you want anything specifically from the condo, we could pick it up or have it put in storage. I know you probably think I'm spoiled. Bethany had a self-depreciating smile. He pays all my bills. I have some excess money from my position with the orchestra that I generally give to charities. He is in a position to be able to be generous with you. It must be nice. Drew shrugged. It was not for him to judge. It was. She frowned as she thought about the fact that her father had been willing to stand by and let her die. I cannot rely on him any more. I'm going to have to figure out how to get by on my income from the orchestra. That can wait for another day. Drew put the covers on the bed. You're tired. While you're napping, I can get a little cleaning done. You can put your stuff away later if you want. She was fatigued, Bethany admitted. She picked up her overnight bag. I will just get changed. Drew nodded and decided to get the dishes done. They could air dry while she slept. Then he would just have to do the bathroom as quietly as he could so that she could sleep. That was all he would be able to manage without disturbing her. Bethany stepped into the small bathroom. There was no bathtub, just a single shower stall. Everything was small and utilitarian. She looked at her pale reflection in the mirror. She had rings under her eyes from the past few days. With a good sleep, they should disappear. At least she hoped so. Bethany changed into her pajamas. She had managed to shower at the hospital with assistance. She was too tired to protest when the nurse had ushered her into the bathroom. Now she was glad that she had taken it. This way, Bethany would not look entirely disgusting to Drew. Not that she should care what he thought of her. All he was doing was keeping her safe. It was part of his job, she told herself. He probably just saw her as an assignment. Just because she found him attractive and liked him did not mean that he felt the same way towards her. It was all temporary. Bethany gathered her things. She had a rueful glance at the novel she elected to grab and stuff into her overnight bag. Bethany had not finished it yet. It was a romance. She had to admit she was addicted to them. Heroic guys were always her favorite. Drew was certainly the heroic type. The way he had taken off after the criminals when she was on the boat. It was his job but he had not hesitated at all. Bethany believed him when he said he would protect her. Drew was the type of guy who would go all out. He was also tender and kind. He was more than understanding when she had her breakdown on the boat. Drew had been skeptical of her memories, but he still investigated. He had still come and saved her life. Bethany admitted she was probably romanticizing him a little. She was in danger of wishfully thinking he might be her hero, and that was not the case. He did have a temper. He was rough around the edges. He lacked charm. Drew made her feel an attraction that she had not felt with any other man. Her parents would not like him. Then again, her father was not such a paragon of virtue. Her brother Edward was in Taiwan. They weren't particularly close. Edward had always disliked that Bethany allowed her parents so much control over her life. Edward had asked her how she could stand to not live her own life. Before he left, he had told her that she should do what made her happy, not what other people had expected of her. She had been heavily medicated, Bethany reflected ruefully. That was why she did as her parents had always expected. It was hard to make decisions when you were constantly being told that you are not capable of making them that you are not mentally strong enough. Bethany looked at her reflection in the mirror. It was past time she started making her own decisions and live with the consequences, good or bad. She rummaged through her overnight bag. Exchanging the cumbersome pajama top for a dark camisole, she looked in the mirror again. Better. She was decently covered, and if Drew was looking, at least he would not see that ugly, shapeless pajama top with its long sleeves and buttons. Maybe, if they were in close proximity long enough, he might become attracted to her. Bethany would deal with those consequences, good and bad, if it happened. 
There was a knock on the door. Beth, did you fall asleep? She stuffed her pajama top into her bag and opened the door. Bethany could not help but blush. So much for being sexy. Now Bethany just felt embarrassed. She looked at the floor. No, sorry. Hey, Drew said as he leaned against the wall. I just wanted to make sure you were okay. It's been a long day for you. Bethany nodded and made her way past him. Drew had turned down the covers on the bed for her. It was so sweet. Do you want anything to eat or drink? Drew tried not to hover. It was not easy in the small apartment. No, thank you, I will be fine. Bethany gave him a small smile. She showed him her book. I will probably just read a little and then go to sleep. Okay. Drew backed away, hands in his pockets. I'm going to clean the bathroom. If you need anything, let me know. Bethany nodded. She waited until he left before crawling into bed. She propped open the book, but could not concentrate as she listened to him trying to be quiet. Drew closed the door to the bathroom softly behind him. He leaned against it, muttering, Because that wasn't awkward. With a sigh, he grabbed the cleaning stuff under the sink and set to work. It was too bad she saw the apartment so gross. Once he cleaned it, Drew knew it would still not be up to her standards, but the place was old and he could only do so much. He wondered why he was so concerned over her opinion of his apartment. It was not like he was trying to impress her or anything. Crud. Drew leaned back and looked at himself in the mirror. He was trying to impress her. He cared about her opinion of his place. Double crud. Drew grimaced. Somehow, Bethany was worming her way into his life. She was attractive. She made him want to protect her from everything. She had a habit of looking at him like he was some sort of hero. It was addictive. Drew knew that was also a bad idea. Once this was all over, she would be out the door and back to her regular life without a backward glance. He tamped down on any feelings he might have for Bethany. She could not regard him as anything more than a cop willing to protect her during some uncertainty in her life. She was just using him. He had offered to be used. That was the stupidest part. Normally, cops did not do that. They did not open their own homes to protect ordinary citizens. Drew was so screwed. Here he was cleaning for her, scrubbing the sink, the toilet, and what was that on the floor? Ew. He pulled a face. Really? Seriously? Could Cotter and Ramsley not aim? Drew sighed and got to work. Drew's phone rang. He grabbed it quickly, darting a glance at the bed. Bethany was sleeping and he did not want her to wake up. Drew ducked into the hallway a moment. Colburn here. He answered automatically, leaving the door to the apartment open an inch. The last thing he wanted was to get locked out and have to wait Bethany to let him in. He would look really competent if that happened. I have laundry. Do you want yours done? His sister asked. Drew frowned suspiciously. Since when do you offer laundry service? You're always telling me to do my own if I ask you. I decided to be nice, replied Jana. I don't buy it. Drew knew his sister. She taught him how to do his own laundry when he was a teen and had never done a single load for him again. You are my baby brother. I love you, Jana said sweetly. You are my big sis and I love you. However, Molson's the baby, not me, responded Drew. What do you really want? Okay, I want information, sighed Jana, and Drew smiled as he could imagine her rolling her eyes. What sort of information? questioned Drew. I want to know all about the girl in your apartment. Jana was distracted a moment by Jenny. Put that away, honey. I do not want your sister to get into it. Who says I have anyone in my apartment? Drew had not told anyone besides Miguel that he was taking Bethany home. Miguel was still on shift, so he should not have spilled the beans just yet. Mrs. Needles, your neighbor, commented Jana. She spies on you. Drew looked down the hallway. Sure enough, Mrs. Needles' door was open an inch, and the little elderly lady was peering out. The police department should hire her for surveillance. You get Mrs. Needles to call you whenever I have visitors? Only the female ones, replied Jana. Let's face it, you don't often have visitors. Miguel called you, didn't he? Drew leaned against the wall. He had seen his brother-in-law's surprise when he had put his hand on Bethany's back to escort her out of the police station. 
What information could you possibly want when you already have had the rundown from him? First, I wanted to know if it was really her, Jana said smugly. Now I know it is her. Drew sighed loudly. Second, I want to know just how involved you are with her. It sounds like the two of you are in deep. I want to know if you know what you are doing. Jana softened her tone. Miguel is worried. That makes me worried. Jana, I know your heart is in the right place, but that is still not worth my laundry. Drew tried to smile. He did not like worrying his sister. She worried enough being the wife and sister of cops. Besides, you know me. I never get in deep. Drew hoped he was not lying. He did not lie to his sister either. Jana had a way of homing in on the truth, so there was no point. You have never taken a case home before either, Jana pointed out. True, Drew said easily. I want to meet her, stated Jana. That was not a good idea. Drew hesitated. He tried to find an excuse quickly so she would not... Drew? Crud. Drew closed his eyes. Jana would know he was trying to put her off, which meant that she would know that he did not want her to meet Bethany, because then Jana might see through him and his protestations of not being involved emotionally. She is tired. She's been through a lot. If you talk to Miguel, you would know that someone made an attempt on her life, and she's still working through that. I will throw in groceries, Jana bribed him. You know I'm going to come up there anyways. We live in the same building. You can't avoid this, Drew. The door to the apartment opened and a curious Bethany looked out at him. Even just getting up from a nap, she was beautiful. Drew's breath caught in his throat as he took in her sleepy gaze. Who is that? My sister, Drew answered. She's bringing groceries tomorrow afternoon. What is your guest going to eat tonight? You guys could come for dinner, offered Jana. That is nice. We will see you tomorrow. Drew ended the call. He was not going to subject Bethany to Jana just yet. She still looked tired. What would you prefer for takeout? Chinese? Pizza? Subs? My treat. Bethany had never had takeout. Her mother had drilled into her that to keep a womanly figure, one did not eat takeout meals. They were considered too fatty and greasy, without proper nutritional standards, according to Constance Searson. Bethany looked at Drew hopefully. Can we get all three? Hungry? Drew smiled, and it took Bethany a moment to register that he was even talking. Her mind still focused on how handsome he was when he smiled. It made her heart skip a couple of beats. They went back inside the apartment, and Drew pulled out the takeout menus of some local places. He and Bethany discussed the merits of each. Mostly, she deferred to his opinion except when it came to pineapple. I do not care what you say, Bethany said stubbornly. Pineapple should never be cooked. It is good, especially on pizza. Drew was amused by her. It's called an Hawaiian. You can have what you want, but I am not eating it, Bethany replied. I have had pineapple ham once. It was disgusting. Not the same, insisted Drew. This is a lot of food. Bethany looked at their list in concern. Whatever we don't eat, we can freeze and have later, Drew said easily as he called in the last order. Can I make a confession? Bethany asked tentatively. Sure, Drew watched her curiously. I am not that hungry. She bit her lip. Then why did we just order all this food? Frowned Drew. I've never had takeout. I didn't know what to get. Bethany shrugged, a little embarrassed. You do know that there is Mexican, Indian, Italian, and a whole slew of other takeout options, right? Drew leaned against the counter. She was so innocent and sheltered. For some reason, it made her even more desirable. Really? Bethany looked at him in interest. We are not ordering them all tonight, he said firmly. Bethany smiled. I was not expecting to. Shall we watch some television while we wait for the food? Drew asked. You can pick. As long as it's not opera, I do not think I could handle that. Could we watch the game? She offered. Bethany, you do not need to watch the game if you don't want to. Drew did not want her to feel like she had to be the perfect guest. We can watch whatever you would like. Good. Then we are watching the Yankees play the Blue Jays, Bethany said confidently as she went to the couch and grabbed the remote. She knew the schedule. 
Drew looked at her with new appreciation as he sat down beside her. Bethany had pulled her legs up, elbows on her knees, while she sorted through the channels. She had a smile of satisfaction as she found the baseball game. If he was not in love with her already, Drew thought he might have just fallen. Crud. Jana was going to be able to sniff that out in two seconds flat. She was an amazing investigator. He was going to have to pull himself together when she came tomorrow. The buzzer went off. Drew, thankful for the distraction, went to verify who was there. He left Bethany locked inside the apartment, choosing to go to the lobby to pick up the food. It was easier to make certain that Bethany remained secure and safe. He waited for all three orders, then hauled the mess of food upstairs. Not having an elevator was a pain, but the building's lone elevator had been broken since long before Drew had started renting here. For some reason, he had an apartment on the fourth floor. Jana and Miguel were on the first floor, which was a good thing, considering they had three kids. It did not take long to divide the spoils and argue the pizza again. Drew liked nudging Bethany verbally just to see what she might say. Eventually, he convinced her to at least try the pizza. She took two bites, chewed, and handed the slice back. Drew laughed at her expression. Cooked pineapple was not her thing. Chinese food was. They both gorged themselves, watching the game. At some point in the eighth inning, Bethany was slumped against him, sleeping. Drew wrapped an arm around her and watched the rest of the game. He found himself liking her even more. Not just a physical attraction, it was learning about her and liking that he was finding about the facets of her personality. It helped that she smelled really good. Something with coconut in it. At the end of the game, he shut off the television. Carefully picking her up, Drew managed to get her back into bed without waking Bethany. He pulled the blankets up over her, stole the extra pillow, and headed back to the couch. Jana arrived, as expected, the next afternoon. She handed the baby to Drew. While you look after your nephew and do our laundry, I will chit-chat with Bethany. Drew automatically took Miguel Jr. The two-month-old blinked up at him. Hi, Jana. Nice to see you. Would you like to meet Bethany Searson? Bethany, this is my bossy sister, Jana. She's married to Miguel. Stop being cheeky, Jana reprimanded him. She snuck a look at Bethany, who was watching Drew with the baby. Yep, the girl had it bad. Bethany had that. I am holding my breath because he is so handsome and he knows how to hold a baby properly, so that totally makes him relationship-slash-family-man material look. Jana used her children mercilessly to see what a woman was interested in when it came to her brother. Most of Drew's previous relationships had just been temporary physical relationships. Drew was too handsome for his own good. He also did not have the best disposition. However, he was great with kids. Even the most stubborn woman's heart melted when they saw Drew with a baby. If Drew was in as deep as Miguel suspected, Jana was going to make certain Bethany Searson was the right girl for her brother. Your mom is in a mood, Drew told the baby, who gurgled up at him. He totally agrees with me. He has gas. Jana rolled her eyes and held out a key. Go away. Groceries? Drew raised an eyebrow. After we ladies make a list, Jana said sweetly. Drew took the key to her apartment. You owe me. No, I don't. Jana smiled and watched him leave. She closed the door. Hi, Bethany said a little uncertainly, still stunned at the ease in which Drew had looked after the baby. Somehow, his attractiveness had gone up a notch. Bethany did not even know that was possible. She was just as beautiful as Miguel had mentioned, Jana thought. It was a good thing Miguel's taste ran to dark-haired, short woman with bossy attitudes. One woman in particular. Otherwise, Jana might have felt a little jealous. Hi, let's have coffee while you tell me about yourself. What would you like to know? Bethany asked cautiously. She did not generally have heart-to-heart -heart talks with women. Bethany really did not have any friends. Not that she had not longed for some. It just had not happened. She was reserved. It was hard to be friendly when she was not self-confident. She supposed she probably came off as a bit of a snob sometimes as well, simply because she was too shy to mingle with others. How about your friends, your family, you in general? Jana smiled and started a fresh pot of coffee. Let me start. 
I am a cop. I've been married to Miguel for eight years. Drew introduced us since he and Miguel were friends first. We have two girls, Jenny, who is six, and Kara, who is five. And you've already seen baby Miguel Jr. Besides Drew, we have a younger brother named Molson. I am the oldest. Jana pulled out a couple of mugs out of the cupboard. She was at home in Drew's kitchen. Your turn. Let's see. Bethany thought about it. I am the daughter of Ted and Constance Searson. I have an older brother, Edward, who is in Taiwan. I am a member of the city orchestra, and I teach ballet. Jana grabbed a plastic container out of her purse. She had made squares and had brought some. Setting them on the table, she looked at Bethany's attire. Jana might not know the brands, but Bethany was wearing designer stuff. She had perfect makeup and hair. She looked like a model. Jana was frumpy in her mom's sweats with no makeup and not even brushed hair in a ponytail. Bethany did not fit into their world. Jana wondered how long she might last. It all depended on how much she loved Drew. Why is your brother in Taiwan? Jana asked. He was dating a person that father and mother did not approve of. Edward chose to pursue his dreams overseas without their interference, Bethany explained. She remembered the arguments. Edward was a spoiled son. In the years he had been gone, he had finally grown up. The relationship did not last, but he's found his place in the world and married someone else. Would your parents approve of Drew? Jana asked casually as she sipped her coffee. Bethany gave a small smile. First, we're not dating. He is being kind enough to ensure my safety. Second, no, they would not approve of Drew. However, since my father may have attempted to kill me, I would say his opinion matters very little right now. What is your mom's opinion? Jana questioned. The fact that Bethany was willing to talk about a possible relationship with Drew meant that the thought had crossed her mind. Bethany recalled her date with Earl Milton. I think at this point, Mother just wants grandchildren. Edward does not have any children? No. Bethany shrugged. Nor do I think he will. He's too much of a free spirit. I do not think he would want the responsibility. Edward's artistic dreams had been a point of contention. He was determined to follow his craft. Ted Searson had been just as determined to have a son who followed in his footsteps. The result had been arguments and a final split in the family. Jana did not have to ask Bethany if she wanted children. She saw it in her face when Bethany had watched Drew with baby Miguel. "'What are your parents like?' asked Bethany. "'Our dad wants nothing to do with us, which is fine, because we want nothing to do with him,' grimaced Jana. "'Our mom is something different.' Drew and I prefer not to have any contact with her. Molson still sees her, although I'm not sure why. Is she difficult to deal with? Bethany was curious. She is mentally off the wall. Jana rolled her eyes. Wacko Margot should never have been in charge of children. One day she might be cool, let us get out of school and take us to a water park or to the zoo. The next day she was taking a hammer to the wall because she could hear voices of the roaches taunting her. It was a really interesting childhood. Bethany blinked. Oh. Thankfully, two out of three of us have grown up to be responsible, mature adults, shrugged Jana. I'm not sure I have too much hope for Molson anymore. That is too bad. Bethany decided to ask Drew about his brother later. You do know that it's not protocol for a police officer to take a victim of a crime into his home, right? Jana asked, raising an eyebrow. Drew could get into trouble for this. He could? I had no idea, frowned Bethany. He did not say anything. He wouldn't, Jana replied as she chewed on a square. Bethany hesitated, then took one as well. Jana was secretly glad to see her enjoy the treat. Drew is not like that. He has been very kind to me. Bethany recalled him letting her order whatever she wanted and picking out what to watch on television last night. She tried not to blush as she recalled that he had carried her to bed last night. I would not want him to get in any trouble. I suppose I will have to find someplace else to stay. Jana saw the slight blush. She had also seen the pillow on the couch. There was no way that Drew was sleeping comfortably on the couch, yet he was suffering through it, giving Bethany the huge bed. That meant he saw Bethany as someone to treat well. 
Drew was not rushing the girl. Gianna liked that. She also liked that the two of them had feelings for each other and did not realize it yet. Do you like to cook? She asked Bethany. Thank you for listening to Chapter 9 of Love and Lies, Book 5 of the Ramsley Brothers series. If you enjoyed this chapter, please look for Chapter 10. Also, you can find my books on Amazon. They are on the Unlimited Kindle program, also on Kindle, paperback, and soon to Audible. Happy listening! Chapter 10 Colby here. Colby answered the phone. It's Drew. Drew gently rocked Minnie Miguel in his car seat as he talked on the phone and waited for the loads of laundry to be done. Any updates? Colby sighed. I checked out the pharmacy. It was an old mom-and-pop operation. No cameras. Drew closed his eyes in disappointment. He had been hoping they would get lucky and find Ted Searson getting prescriptions filled for his daughter. Didn't say that, Colby informed him. I do have cameras. Problem is, I just combed through days of recordings just to find out that they have missed about an hour. The owners claim it was a glitch, but I'm guessing that's when somebody filled out those prescriptions. That means Dr. Ershman is likely telling the truth. Drew tried not to let his anger build. It was working during the missing recording time. An employee, revealed Colby. One pharmacy technician, Jolene Carmody. I flirted and plied on the charm, but she's a tough cookie. Told me to get a warrant before she'll give up her records on who picked up the meds. What did Green say to getting a judge to get the warrant? Drew hoped their boss was in a better mood than when he had seen him last time. He gave the go-ahead. Now I'm waiting on the paperwork, Colby responded. You're the man, Colby. Drew was relieved. Finally, maybe they could get this thing squared away and nail Ted Searson. You know it, Colby replied. I'll let you know how it goes when I've got the warrant. Thanks. Drew ended the call. He quickly dialed Fenton's number. Hey, Fenton, is Ted Searson showing any signs of cracking? Drew, always a pleasure, Fenton said wryly. I'm at the kids' game. Nice. Terry going to score? Drew knew Terry was in soccer. He also knew Fenton had dreams of his kid going to play professional someday. Considering Terry was only eight, he had a long way to go. I hope so. Fenton yelled out something not very nice to the referee. Guy is blind. I know it is family time, and you do not like talking shop during family time, but Fenton, I gotta know. Is Searson going to roll on his pal Ramsley? Questioned Drew. Fenton sighed. You're not going to let me just enjoy the game, are you? Nope, Drew happily replied. Fine growled Fenton. That was not offside! Ted Searson, Drew reminded him. He lawyered up pretty big. Will not talk to anyone without his attorney present. I think Ramsley used the same guy, so I'm betting Searson is not going to confess or accuse anyone particular of anything anytime soon, Fenton informed him. Crud, sighed Drew. That's one way of putting it. Look, I have to go, Fenton yelled again at the refs. Drew decided that he would never be that sort of dad if he ever had kids. Thanks, Fenton. The call disconnected, and Drew looked down at his nephew. What do you think? Minnie, Miguel, just cooed at him. You are about as much help as your dad, commented Drew. While Miguel was one of his best friends, it was still fun to pick on him. Drew looked over at the pile of papers left out on a folding table. Right on top was another tabloid article by Sterling Denver. FBI arrest David Ramsley. He picked up the pages and perused the article. David Ramsley, head of the prestigious Ramsley clan, has been arrested by the FBI today in a long-reaching case involving drug smuggling, money laundering, and embezzlement. Also arrested were Robert Ramsley, brother of David, and Ted Searson, a longtime friend of the family. Ted Searson was facing charges of attempted murder of his daughter Bethany Searson, noted member of the city orchestra, but the FBI have pulled rank and taken custody of Searson. Drew growled. Fenton had not told him that. Then again, maybe he did not know it yet if it only happened today and Fenton was off. This meant that any chances of getting Ted to confess to David's part of the attempted murder scheme had gone, since they would have zero access to Searson. 
The only good news seemed to be that David was on his way to prison anyways. Drew hoped Law had built a good case. He would hate for the old man to get out. Drew looked at the photos and took a deep breath. He clenched his teeth. There was Max, a repeat photo of him at his wedding a few years ago. There was also a picture of Drew with Bethany, taken right as they were leaving the hospital, his hand on her back as he escorted her to his truck. Not Max Ramsley after all. All those recent sightings during Max Ramsley's disappearance were wrong. This is Andrew Colburn Ramsley, son of David Ramsley and Margaret Colburn, with Bethany Searson recently released from hospital after her own father tried to kill her. David had an affair on wife Rachel. Margaret Colburn tells all the dirty family secrets, a hidden love, illegitimate children, and how her son Drew is deeply in love with Beth, who was once briefly engaged to Noah Ramsley, his half-brother. Drew skimmed over his mother's tirade of how David would have left Rachel for her if he only had been able to. Sterling Denver managed to spin the story quite well, probably with his mother's full cooperation. There were childhood photos of Jana, Drew, and Molson splashed across the page. He felt a rush of anger at the intrusion into their lives. None of them had asked for this. If anything, they did not want to be associated with the Ramsleys. They did just fine on their own without the Ramsleys and their wealth. The tabloid laid out Jana's marriage to Miguel, the names and ages of their three children, how Jana, Miguel, and Drew were all police officers. It also briefly dipped into Molson, who was working at a local auto shop. It was a chop shop, only no one had been able to find anything illegal going on there. Drew had no doubts there was illegal activity at the small shop. When he had questioned Molson about it, his brother had just given him a knowing smile and told him it was better if he did not know. Drew wanted to curse. He wanted to yell at Sterling Denver and ask her how she would like it if she had her entire backstory told to the world at large. Margaret insists son Drew is in love with Beth. It looks like she's right as the police detective is now living with society's darling girl. After years of dating the finest bachelors, it looks like poor little rich girl is going for a bad boy, complete with a Harley and a former career as an undercover officer, ferreting out the city's worst criminals by living amongst them. The relationship has been quietly under wraps for a while, but city orchestra member Reginald Wells and friend of Beth knew the couple's status. He claims they have been dating for at least a month. Will this fairy tale have a happy ending? Someone needed to give Sterling Denver a taste of her own medicine. Drew tossed the paper into Janet's laundry basket. He would take it back upstairs. Unfortunately, Bethany would have to know about this. Dating for a month? They had not even known each other that long. Drew could not deny that he had feelings for her. That part was true. However, there was no way that the tabloid reporter could be aware of that. How she found out that Bethany was staying with Drew was a surprise. Sterling should be on the police force with her investigative abilities. Someone was bound to show Green the papers. That meant that he would soon know that Bethany was in Drew's apartment. It was not going to go over well. Then again, Drew was not working. He was off the case, right? Drew could do whatever he wanted with his time off. At least, that was what Drew was going to say in his defense when Green booted Drew back to foot patrol. Baby Miguel gave a cry, annoyed at being ignored. Drew gave the car seat a nudge so it would rock again. We are in a fine mess, little buddy. Drew lugged the baby and his laundry back to his apartment. He had already dropped off Jana's laundry in her apartment since it was close to the building's laundry room. Jana was showing Bethany something in the kitchen. Drew left the basket of laundry on the kitchen table. He would deal with it later. He propped Miguel Jr. on the table as well. The baby was sleeping in the car seat. You didn't have him in the car seat the whole time, did you? questioned Jana. No, Drew responded patiently. I took him out and we talked about how his mama liked to boss us around while the dryers were doing their thing. What are you two up to? Jana is teaching me how to make chili. Bethany said lightly. Drew loved Jana's chili. He had no idea how to make it because she would never share the recipe. Drew looked at his sister in surprise. You are teaching her how to make your chili, but you won't share the recipe with me. I like her, Jana said sweetly. 
Jana had never taught any of his other girlfriends how to make chili. Then again, Bethany was not his girlfriend. Of course, Jana had not much liked any of the other girls he had introduced her to. It's nice of Jana to teach me, Bethany said happily. I enjoy cooking, and she offered to teach me a few things. A woman who enjoyed cooking and cheered for the Yankees. They did not make many of them that way any more. That is nice of her. Where did you find the ingredients? I thought we were pretty empty on food. We borrowed from my place. Jana smiled smugly. Drew wondered what she was up to. He did not think for one minute that this was being done out of the kindness of her heart. In response to her happy smile, Drew offered her the tabloid paper, turned already to the inside article. Is that a picture of my wedding? Jana hissed. Yep. Drew did not think Margaret had any more recent photos, so this was probably the best that Sterling Denver had been able to come up with. Jana actually growled. For the first time since seeing the article, Drew was tempted to smile. What is going on? Bethany turned down the chili and leaned over Jana's shoulder to have a look. The threatening smile left quickly. Drew handed Bethany a reputable paper to give her the details. He did not really want her to look at the tabloid with all its seedy glory. The FBI has arrested David Ramsley and Ted Searson for drug smuggling and a few other charges. Bethany took the paper, a frown puckering her brows as she read. This is... Jana glared at the paper. Why would she give an interview with a tabloid reporter? She is our mother, Drew said dryly. Knowing wacko Margot, she probably enjoyed the attention. Molson should have kept her in line, huffed Jana. He should never have let her talk to a reporter. He probably was not there. He does pretend to work on occasion, sighed Drew. Not even sure if he was still living with her or not. Wait. Bethany looked at them. This validates everything I've been saying. About the boat, sweet Bethany? About my memories? Yes, it does. Drew was sorry he had ever doubted her. You were right all along. I was not crazy. Bethany blinked back tears. Every time he told me it was all in my mind, it was not. Every time he made me feel silly and stupid, it was because he was covering their tracks. He made me feel like a child who did not know anything at all. He had me drugged and undergoing therapy for years to protect himself. Bethany threw down the paper, hugging herself. I am so angry at him. Jana nodded. The girl did possess a backbone after all. Bethany would need it if she decided to be with Drew. I like her. Don't screw this up, Drew. Drew looked a little uncertainly at the sweet woman in front of him who was blazing angry right now. This was a new side of Bethany. Thanks for the confidence boost, Jana. Can I punch something? wondered Bethany with a frown. I feel like punching something. Sure, Jana said easily. Punch my brother. Drew gave his sister a dirty look. There is an exercise room downstairs. It has a punching bag. Bethany nodded. You will have to teach me how. You want to learn how to punch? Drew asked, trying to mask his amusement. I want to learn everything when it comes to self-defense. I also want to beat the stuffing out of something for the way my father has been treating me all these years, Bethany said firmly. She was adorable when she pouted. Then let's beat the stuffing out of a punching bag. Drew held out a hand and did not even look at Jana as he led Bethany out of the apartment. He did not care what his sister thought of his actions. A couple of hours later, Drew and Bethany returned to the apartment. The chili was warm on the stove. There was a receipt and a note on the table. You owe me. Keep her. Drew crumpled it up quickly. What did it say? Bethany asked as she picked up the tabloid. She was tired after working through her anger. Drew had been very helpful in showing her how to properly throw a punch so that she would not hurt herself. That I owe her money for the food? Drew shrugged. She likes you. I like her. Bethany looked at him for a moment. She said you could get into trouble for letting me stay here with you. Let me worry about that, Drew said firmly. Are you certain? questioned Bethany. Yes. Drew grabbed a couple of bowls and started setting the table. Now, more importantly, what do you like to drink with your chili? Bethany smiled. I'm not sure since I've never had chili. Seriously? Drew paused in surprise. You've never had chili? No. Bethany returned her attention to the paper. 
It was not considered cordon bleu cooking. The chef at home never made it. You employed a chef? Drew asked in astonishment as he grabbed a couple of glasses and cutlery. My parents did. I learned to cook in college, Bethany murmured. She blushed as she read the article. Oh, my. Yeah, Drew said darkly. Sterling Silver has outdone herself like always. Who? Bethany turned a slightly darker shade of pink as she looked up. The writer. What is it? Drew wondered what was bothering her so much. Bethany hesitated. I have a confession to make. I never thought Reggie would say something like this. You know the guy? Drew searched his mind to remember what the quote was that Sterling had used. He is a fellow violinist at the orchestra. Bethany looked down at the paper, embarrassed. He kept asking me out, and I was trying to be polite. Drew carefully took the paper away from her. He patiently waited for her to look at him and continue. Bethany took a deep breath and raised her gaze to his. I might have led him to believe that you were my boyfriend? Really? Drew raised an eyebrow. For some reason, the simple statement made him very happy. Not that he was going to show that. I know it is juvenile, lamented Bethany. As soon as the words were out, I regretted them. I should have just told Reggie that I do not find him attractive, and I would prefer that he turned his charms somewhere else. However, once it was done, I just let him believe it. Any reason you chose me? Drew's ego felt a little boost. Maybe she did find him attractive after all. You were the first name that came to mind. She blushed a little deeper and felt like her face was on fire. I apologize. I had no right to do so. Any time you need a fictional boyfriend, let me know, Drew offered. He kind of liked that he had been the first to come to her mind in that sort of situation. I'm going to take a shower, Bethany mumbled. She had the feeling Drew was a little amused at her expense. While it probably was funny, right now she was too embarrassed. Bethany made her escape. Even though she hated taking showers, right now it was preferable than talking to her fictional boyfriend, Drew. Drew lay on the couch, one arm over his head, the other on his chest. A spring was poking him in the back, but he did not bother moving. Bethany was sleeping in the bed. They both had enjoyed supper and a night of chatting while watching the Yankees win. He tried not to let a goofy smile settle on his face. She liked him. She was not ready to admit it, but she liked him. If Drew did not watch it, he was going to end up like Max, besotted with her and Goofy. Somehow, his half-brother had been right. Once love hit you, bam, game over. They hardly knew each other, had met only such a short time ago. Yet Drew knew that no one would ever match up to Bethany in his life. He liked her. He wanted her. He loved her. It would never work. She would leave. That didn't mean that he was not going to enjoy wherever she chose to take this. Drew firmly believed in treating her like a lady. He would not take advantage of the situation, but he would happily let her stay if she wanted, share in her company as long as she was willing to. He stared up at the ceiling, unable to sleep. He felt restless. A distressed sound from the bed pulled his attention toward Bethany. Drew stilled as he tried to listen. There it was again. Bethany thrashed against the covers. Drew flipped off the afghan and padded over to the bed. Beth? She was making little choking noises. He flipped on the lamp and shook her shoulder. Bethany? Bethany woke with a gasp. She trembled and looked at him. Drew? I am right here. Drew sat on the edge of the bed, pushing her hair out of her face. It was just a dream. Bethany sighed and wiped a tear away. I thought once I knew what had happened that the nightmares would go away. You have been dreaming them for years, Drew said reasonably. It might take a while for them to stop. Will you stay? Bethany asked tentatively. I'm not going anywhere, promised Drew. No, Bethany sighed, a little embarrassed, but determined. She pulled back the blankets. I mean, will you stay the night with me? You make me feel safe. Please? Do you want the light left on? he asked. Off is fine. Bethany had a relieved smile, not afraid of the dark. Drew shut off the lamp and carefully crawled into bed with her, drawing the covers up over both of them. 
there was only one pillow but bethany snuggled up to him using him as a headrest so it was not a problem he rubbed her back as she settled in yep game over for sure drew tried not to think about how much it was going to hurt when she left if you enjoyed this chapter of love and lies book five of the ramsley brothers series perhaps you'll enjoy chapter eleven look for it here on youtube also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel to find great tips about writing, more audiobooks, and fun sneak peeks into future writings. Happy listening! Chapter 11 Paget welcomed Bethany and Drew. Drew had gotten the phone call from Max earlier in the day that the Ramsleys were gathering to discuss the case the FBI had against David Ramsley and Ted Searson. They wanted his opinion from a cop's viewpoint on the unfolding situation. Drew had reluctantly agreed to attend. He had thought about turning them down, however Bethany wanted to attend since her father was also involved. She needed to know what was happening to Ted Searson. Drew decided to accompany her to keep her safe. "'Why are they here?' asked Noah as Drew and Beth came into the house. Michael asked for them to come, Anne said as she approached the large dining table. She waved at Michael to sit down and took the chair next to his. We agreed I would be your voice for this evening. Michael frowned in concern, looping an arm around his wife's shoulders holding her close. It was obvious that Anne was very pregnant and very tired. Everyone take a seat. Max pulled out a chair for Paget and sat himself. The kids are all downstairs or in bed. Caden and Cece are watching the older ones. They all gathered at the table. First, Michael and I want to thank you all for coming. Anne took a deep breath, starting the meeting. As everyone here knows, David has been arrested. He should not be here, pointed out Noah. Drew's investigation is the reason Dad is in jail. Dad broke the law, Max said dryly. That's the reason he's in jail. What happened to innocent until proven guilty? Questioned and irritated Noah. He ignored Elle's restraining hand on his arm. He's our dad. I do not believe he was running drugs. What need would he have to be in the illegal drug trade? He's also the guy who has a bad habit of manipulating, blackmailing, and bending the FDA rules when it suits him, Max reminded him. They took me off the case, Drew cut in. As one of David's sons, my superiors felt it was a conflict of interest. Why is Bethany here? questioned L. Ted Searson and Robert Ramsley have been arrested as well. Anne said, trying to direct the discussion. It's only fair that Bethany knows what is going on since her father is involved as well. The Searsons and Ramsleys have been family friends for a long time. We also need Drew's expertise as a police officer to answer questions. Uncle Robert has been arrested? Max asked, surprised at the revelation. Dylan nodded as he held his wife Kelly's hand. Yes, I am hoping there has been some mistake. Jake and Everett are flying in tomorrow to help me deal with this. Hopefully, we can bail Dad out soon. For those of you who do not know, the envelope in the middle of the table contains all the information about the other children that David had outside his marriage that we know of, continued Anne. We know he blackmailed Noah and tried to blackmail Michael. We know but cannot prove that David has bribed judges and possibly members of the FDA. She pushed the small stack of files further onto the table. When Michael was investigating David, he found discrepancies in the accounting of Ramsley Pharmaceuticals going back three decades. He handed the files to a team of accountants. They determined there was cash going in and out of the company that cannot be accounted for. He was laundering money, Drew said grimly. It fit with what he knew from Law's FBI investigation. It was true, then. David was finally going to prison, and Bethany would be safe. Anne nodded. We think so. No one knew it at the time, but now that the possibility of drug smuggling has come to light, it is probable. What does this mean? asked Paget. It means that we're left with a lot of questions. Anne rubbed her swollen stomach. Drew, is there any statute of limitations for this case? Drew sighed. When do the company accounts start to mirror business again? They do not, responded Anne. They still have discrepancies. Then he's still laundering money, which means the crime is current. Drew leaned forward earnestly. Look, the FBI is involved. That means they will have access to the company's finances, and will know all about the financial discrepancies. 
If they match them to win the drug operation they have been investigating, did the drops, then it's a dumb case. Michael nodded wearily. He made a motion with his hand. Which leads us to our other questions. Anne took his hand in hers. We know that they are going to see the finances. We know that they will likely want to fully investigate Ramsley Pharma and maybe, with Robert's arrest, will investigate Ramsley Insurance Corporation. Company accounts, David and Robert's accounts, are likely to be frozen during the investigation. That means our shares in the company are frozen, Noah stated flatly. Michael nodded. It means that you'll have no income during the investigation, Noah, Anne said sympathetically. Neither will Dylan or Michael or I. We can get by on my pay from the hospital plus our savings, remarked Elle. You and Michael have savings you can use? Yes. However, that brings us to another area of concern, sighed Anne. We need to find out if any of the assets that we were given in trust by David and Robert, or in Bethany's case, her father, can be seized. Trust funds, shares, properties. If any of those were obtained with money gotten from illicit means, but were passed down from father to sons, can they be seized? We're not sure of the law in this case. We need to get legal representation to find out how far this can go and what we can do to protect ourselves. I thought Michael was a lawyer, Drew questioned Max. His specialty is contracts and mergers, not this, Max clarified softly. What you're saying, Anne, is that we could lose everything financially. Actually, you would be in the best position of us all. Other than your shares in the condo, all your other assets you have earned outside of Ramsley Pharma. Anne shrugged. We just do not know. We need to get this addressed as soon as possible. I have a question. Noah stared at the files. Are we going to bail the old man out? The hearing is in two days. I vote no, responded Max. Maybe being in prison will wake him up, make him a better person. Michael gave an involuntary snort of derision. Other than some books that do not add up and the testimony of Bethany allegedly seeing them commit a crime over twenty years ago, what do they really have? wondered Elle. I saw it. I remember it, Bethany stated firmly. Really? Are you certain? wondered Elle. Last I heard you were on a lot of drugs. What you think you remember might not be true. What is that supposed to mean? scowled Drew. He did not like Elle's insinuation. They tried to kill her. Hey! Kelly stood up to get their attention. Kid in the room! They all stopped, turning their heads to see Amy hovering by the doorway in her jammies, Teddy Bear in her arms, and the dog FedEx beside her. Michael gestured, and she came running to him. Honey, you're supposed to be in bed, said Anne as Michael picked up their daughter. I couldn't sleep, she replied. She looked at the group with wide eyes. Why is Auntie Elle mad? She's not mad. Anne closed her eyes and rubbed her forehead. She was exhausted. Sometimes she just speaks loudly without meaning to. Michael made motions that had Anne shaking her head. No, I am not going to rest. We are going to see this through. He frowned at her statement, obviously concerned for her. Right now, we need to find out what the legal and financial repercussions of the investigation are going to be, Dylan said reasonably. Until we do that, we cannot determine our next steps. The doorbell rang. I will get it. Noah got up. Moments later, a swarm of FBI personnel came in. Everyone remain seated, one of them said. Michael Ramsley? Michael slowly stood and handed Amy over to Paget. What is this all about? Anne questioned fearfully. We have a warrant to search the premises. We have a warrant to search and seize a boat owned by Michael Ramsley. The FBI agent put some papers on the table. We have a warrant for the rest of Michael Ramsley. Another agent flashed a set of cuffs, hooking one onto Michael's wrist, grabbing the other. Michael David Ramsley, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say or do can be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to an attorney. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be provided for you. Do you understand your rights? You cannot arrest him, Anne protested, the bottom falling out of her world. Do you understand your rights, Mr. Ramsley? The agent repeated the question. Michael gave a short nod. Michael, we are going to figure this out, Max said reassuringly. We will take care of this, I promise. No, a panicked Anne stood, holding the table for support. You do not understand. You can't, he can't go. He doesn't speak. You cannot take him. Ma'am, you should sit down, the agent said as he eyed her swollen girth. 
He nodded to the other FBI agent, who began to walk Michael to the door. There are children in the bedrooms and downstairs, Paget said, tightly holding on to a confused Amy. Maybe they should be brought up to the dining room to be here with us while you do your search? Anne let out a hiss and grabbed her abdomen. A desperately worried Michael tried to turn back to her, but the two agents forcibly hustled him out of the room. FedEx began to bark, and Max quickly grabbed her collar. Kelly immediately stood, pushing past any FBI personnel in her way. I am a nurse. Let me through. The FBI agent in charge nodded his head. Are you okay? Kelly rushed to Anne's side to help her sit down. I think it was just a stitch from sitting too long, Anne said miserably as she began to cry. Kelly hugged her. I wish I had never said anything, Bethany whispered, distraught as she watched strangers searching Anne and Michael's home. They grabbed the files that were sitting on the table. This is all my fault. No, do not think that. Drew reached for Bethany's hand, but was surprised when she hugged him, crying on him. He smoothed back her hair, embracing her. You did not ask for this to happen. If I had not been pushing to find out my memories, then my father would never have made that attempt on my life, sobbed Bethany. No one would have looked into the sweet Bethany, and they would not know. Beth, Drew rubbed her back. The FBI was investigating long before you started that day. It's not your fault at all. He looked up to see Noah glaring at him. It had been an absolute mess. Everyone had been questioned separately. The whole house had been searched through. Anne was made to open their private safe and endure the FBI packing up personal items, such as Michael's journals. A team would look through everything for any signs of guilt. Everyone was deeply upset at Michael's arrest. No one believed that he had committed any crime. Drew did not know the man well, but he felt he was not the type to smuggle drugs. He hoped that his own investigation into Michael's boat had not helped the FBI come to the conclusion that Michael was guilty of something. Drew did not want to help Law in any way. The man had seen Drew and taken it upon himself to question Drew personally. Drew had not been very cooperative. He did not need reminders from Law that he was not supposed to be investigating David Ramsley. Truth was, Drew had gone to ensure that Bethany would be okay. Protecting her was the only reason he had been at the meeting. Hours later, they were finally released. Drew had taken the exhausted Bethany home. He assured her again that it was not her fault. It was not his either, not that she questioned that. She was nearly asleep by the time he pulled into his parking lot space. Drew decided to just carry her up to the apartment. Bethany did not protest. I keep thinking about what Miguel said, she murmured as she leaned her head on his shoulder. What did Miguel say? Drew managed to get his keys and unlock the apartment door. The people with money can get around things, Bethany replied. That is generally true. With enough money and connections, people can manage things that the average person can't. Drew had to agree a little cynically. He had seen it happen. Not often, but it had happened. Do you think that I will ever be safe from him? wondered Bethany. Drew gently set her on her feet. He cupped her face with his hands. Nothing is going to happen to you. I'm not going to let it. Besides, David Ramsley has the FBI to deal with. I don't think he is worried about you any more. Do you think I'm safe, then? asked Bethany. He hesitated a moment. Drew was not ready to have her walk out of his life yet. Then again, would he ever be ready to let her go? Professionally, I would say you're probably okay to leave and be on your own. Like I said, David Ramsley has the FBI to worry about. Is there a chance that he might still come after me? She continued to press. Possibly, but unlikely, Drew reluctantly said. You said professionally. Bethany watched him carefully. What about your personal opinion? I would worry, he admitted. Drew tried to ignore the fact that he wanted her to stay even as he said the words. David Ramsley does not seem like the type to let things go. He is spiteful and mean. If you're not someplace safe, I would worry over you. Can I keep staying here? With you? Bethany brought her hands up along his shoulders. Beth, cautioned Drew, I will let you stay as long as you want, but at some point you've got to go back to your world. You do not belong here. What if I want to belong here? She asked quietly. Drew leaned his forehead against hers. He did not want to hurt her. 
You and I both know that is not true. We just feel safe here with everything that has been happening. I wish everyone would stop telling me what I should or should not do, what I should or should not want, Bethany said angrily. I think I should be able to decide for myself. Drew pulled back a little to look at her face. Then tell me what you want. Bethany took a breath for courage. You. I want to have a future with you. It won't work, he said dully. How do you know? She rose up on her toes and pressed her lips to his. How do you know unless we try? Drew gave in to the temptation to kiss her just once. It was like a slice of heaven. He broke off the kiss. People from your social status do not date or marry people from my social status. Where did you learn that? Bethany said breathlessly. From my parents, Drew said dryly. You have to know that my father is David Ramsley. He had an affair with my mother while he was married. Did you know that Michael married his secretary? Bethany questioned him. Max and Paget are not really an exception, but no one else are. She's a dietitian and the daughter of immigrant parents who run a restaurant. He loves her madly. Her social status does not matter. I would really rather not talk about your ex-fiancé. Drew grimaced. He had no liking for Noah Ramsley, and Drew knew the feeling was mutual. He wondered if Noah was still protected of Bethany and simply thought Drew was not worthy of her. Noah was probably right. Bethany smiled, her fingers playing with the collar of his shirt. Can I win that argument? We are not keeping score. Drew pulled her closer. But if we were, I would be winning. She sobered, losing her smile. Do you love me? Could you love me, perhaps, if you gave yourself the chance to? Max was right, Drew thought without rancor. When you knew that she was the one, there was nobody else. I already do. She gave him a tremulous smile, her heart in her eyes. Then I am staying. Good. Drew kissed her again. He did not want to fight her. He did not want to let her go. He vowed to himself to do everything possible to keep Bethany happy so that she would stay. If you enjoyed Chapter 11 of Love and Lies, Book 5 of the Ramsley Brothers series, look for the epilogue coming up next. You can also find these books in ebook form, paperback, or audiobook on Amazon. Please share and like this video. Happy reading! Epilogue Drew woke up to someone in his kitchen. He drew in an irritated breath and rubbed his eyes. Bethany was sleeping soundly beside him. He pulled back the covers and got out of bed, walking over to the small kitchenette area to grab some freshly made coffee. Well, at least the two of you are fully clothed, Molson commented as he cracked an egg on the side of a pan. Looks like you convinced Sugar to stay with you. Again, did I ever say you were welcome here? Drew looked at his brother in mild curiosity. He and Bethany had spent most of the night talking before finally falling asleep. They had been plotting out a future together. Drew had never been cautiously happier. Not that he was going to tell his little brother that. Since I'm cooking you breakfast, I think it might be okay. Olson shrugged, taking a sip of his own mug of coffee. If she don't wake up, you could even bring her breakfast in bed and say it was all you're doing. I think she would notice the third mug. Drew leaned against the counter. He watched Molson getting all domestic, cooking breakfast. I want to thank you for your help that day that we brought Bethany to the hospital. She could have died. Molson shrugged. She didn't. It's all good. No, it is not. Drew was serious. Thank you. I mean it. Does that mean I can borrow the bike for longer? Molson shot him a crooked smile. You can keep the bike, offered Drew. It was a pittance for what Molson had done. Bethany meant more to Drew than his Harley. Nah. Molson looked back at Bethany sleeping soundly in bed. Sugar there is going to like that bike. I think you and her are going to go for some fun rides on it. I'd hate to take that away from you both. She is not going to want to ride the bike. Drew shook his head. She is too classy for that. And her name is Bethany. Molson grinned. She's a high society girl with a bad dude boyfriend. Well... Bad in her opinion, because she ain't got nothing to compare you to. She's gonna want to ride the bike. 
He thinks so? Drew frowned as he looked at Bethany. I know so. Molson pushed food around the pan. She gonna love that bike. Until she gets pregnant. Speaking of, you should get to a store sometime. Drew looked at Molson in amazement. You have been filching condoms from me? Once in a while. An emergency. What's left of yours are out of date, by the way, since you stopped buying them a while ago. Molson served some food on a plate. Unless you want little ones run around sooner rather than later, you need to get some. Then again, that might just be the way to keep sugar with you. I cannot believe you. Drew accepted the plate of food from his brother. How long have you been stealing my stuff? Did you take that Yankee shirt I used to have, or did I really lose it in the laundry room? I can't believe. You're such a crappy detective, you never noticed anything missing in your own apartment. Molson stuck a pair of sunny-side-up eggs between two toasts and crunched on them. I take it back, you little kleptomaniac, groused Drew. You can't borrow the bike. Molson laughed. Too late. Hey, Drew shushed him. Let her sleep. You gonna make sugar there, my new sister-in-law? Molson asked with a sly glance at Drew. If I was you, I'd put a ring on her real quick before she changes her mind. The notion had crossed my mind, Drew admitted. She has got you wound up in knots. Molson looked at her. She's beautiful. Yes, she is. Drew glanced at his brother. Leave her alone. You think I got a shot with her? Grinned Molson. He enjoyed pushing his brother's buttons. No, Drew said sharply. You should see your face. He smiled without remorse, all jealous over a little sugar. Drew scowled. Maybe he should get a ring sooner rather than later. If guys were going to be sniffing around Bethany, Drew wanted something to claim her as his. Not that Molson was any competition, but he had seen the way Colby and the others had looked at her. My name is Bethany. Bethany called sleepily from the bed. She stretched out an arm, reaching for Drew's pillow. Not until he puts a ring on you. Molson happily ate his toast, teasing his brother. Until then, you're sugar to me. Beth? Drew asked, half serious, half joking. Will you marry me and wear my ring so this fool brother of mine will shut up? She smiled dreamily. Yes. Drew could not help the answering smile on his face. He loved her. He was going to buy her a ring. Bethany it is. Molson set his cup in the sink. He decided to leave before the two of them got all gooey and stuff. Good to meet you. You too, Bethany sat up and smiled at him. Next time, knock, Drew reminded Molson. Sure thing, lovebirds. Molson let himself out. He finished the last of his toast and took the stairs. As he was nearing the ground floor, his cell phone rang. Yo! It was an unlisted number, but Molson answered it anyways. He enjoyed razzing telemarketers. I wanted to thank you, the voice said. Molson stumbled to a stop on the steps, grabbing the railing. He gripped the phone a little harder before asking cautiously, What for? For what you said to the psychiatrist. David Ramsley continued, telling her to inform on us to save herself. You're not gonna hurt her or nothing, are you? Molson looked around the empty stairwell. No, there's no point. Dr. Ershman cannot touch me. David chuckled. Neither can Bethany. It was her father that was so worried about her. Now neither Ted nor his daughter can touch me. I suppose you can tell your brother his heart's desire is safe. What do you mean by Ted can't touch you? Molson activated the voice recorder on his phone. He hoped that it would make a clear recording from the call. Ted died in jail earlier today. So tragic, gloated David. You killed him, Molson stated flatly. He had an allergic reaction. It was unfortunate. Molson seriously doubted it was such a simple allergic reaction. Not when David had been the head of a pharmaceutical company and had a myriad of drugs at his disposal. What's all this got to do with what I told Doc Ershman? When I told her to roll on you before she found herself in a difficult situation? I am just a poor, old, befuddled man, riddled with a touch of dementia. David sighed dramatically. 
I had no idea what was happening right under my nose. It was easy to cooperate with the feds. What are you talking about? Molson frowned. All these years, he was the one who had been running drugs, and I am sorry to say, I became a very cooperative witness. David's smile could be felt through the phone. Then again, family loyalties are not what they used to be. You informed on someone else. Molson gritted his teeth. You threw someone under the bus. And I thank you for the idea. It was all you. David gloried in the revelation. It took some doing to lay the groundwork in case I was arrested. But it turned out quite satisfactory. I am out of jail because of you. Tell me, is he guilty or innocent? The sucker you have put in jail in your place, demanded Molson. He did not like that David was trying to manipulate him into feeling guilty. Everyone is guilty of something. He defied me. That was enough, sneered David. Who is it? Molson questioned angrily. You can read about it in the papers and know that it was all your doing, David said smugly. Once again, thank you, son. I appreciate your contribution to my freedom. David hung up. Molson shut off the voice recording feature. He jogged out of the apartment building, threw the rain to a kiosk that sold papers. It was on the front page of the tabloids, the newspapers, and magazines. Molson grabbed a newspaper and began reading. Michael Ramsley arrested by the FBI on drug smuggling charges. David Ramsley set free. Will testify against son. Michael was innocent. Molson was certain of that. You going to pay for that? the kiosk attendant asked. Sure thing. Molson grabbed a bill out of his pocket. He did not know if it was a five or a twenty, and he did not care. He dropped it on the counter and walked away, holding his newspaper. It was his fault that David was free, and Michael was behind bars. The question was, what was Molson going to do about it? If you enjoyed this chapter of Love and Lies Book 5 of the Ramsley Brothers series, stay tuned for Stranded with a Billionaire. Sterling Denver did whatever it took to get the story. The famous tabloid writer had a reputation to uphold as one of the sharpest in the industry. Jake Ramsley was on a private flight back to the city to try and help sort out the mess in the Ramsley insurance after his father's arrest. He did not believe for a moment that his father was guilty and intended to get to the bottom of things. Sterling knew that Jake was going to come back to the city. She used her resources and her cash to bribe her way onto his private plane as a stewardess. Now she had him all to herself for the six-hour flight. Sterling was about to get an exclusive interview from one of America's most eligible bachelors while his family life imploded. Her career had never looked better. Then, turbulence hit them, both in their temperaments and in the air. The plane crashed, and Sterling found herself stranded with the billionaire. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to the channel and hitting the little bell above so that you will get future videos directly to your notifications. Have a great day and happy listening!